Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to the science fiction audiobook version of the fourth wave taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 81, written by Semi Loki. I had to admit that Fowl and Polteth were definitely artists. The Ron had led us through the tunnels to a new section of the ship. This new room was, as I half expected, just like every other room that I had witnessed on the ship, with two notable exceptions. One, it was much larger. The cats had room enough to build up speed near full gallop before being forced to turn around and dart in the opposite direction. Six humans, six wampus, and two aliens sharing one body, and nine Ron were assembled in the room and still claimed the healthy amount of personal space. The other difference was the door. Just opposite the door we entered was a much, much larger door on the opposite wall. Hanger, I gasped. Six of the Rons split off from the group and went over to a line of crates that had been pressed against the right-hand wall. The Ron extended their arms, opening the crates, and drew out a large, strange-looking orange and tan object. The Ron then scattered with each one approaching the different Wampus cat. I can't tell you how proud I was of our cats. As the Ron approached the cats, barely batted an eye as the Ron put a lump on their backs and began strapping it on. Not long ago, the Wampus cats would have tried tearing the Ron apart for even daring to stand that close. Now that they tolerated the attention with a stoic indifference, the Ron fiddled with the lumpy object for a minute or more before touching the dark spot just behind the cat's head. The lump came to life. The lump, which I presumed was a new saddle, squirmed as it seemed to mold itself to band its back. Straps had been run crisscrossed or across bandaged chest and around his front legs cinched tighter. A third strap that went around his midriff expanded sideways and then tightened. Bandit stirred nervously as the saddle adjusted itself to his body dimensions, but he did not seem to be uncomfortable. The seat widened and curved upwards in the front and back. A pair of handholds now grew in the front and attached themselves to the chest plate. Stranger still, two sets of stirrups grew out of the saddle, one set down low when I expected them, but a second set was set further back and high up on Bandit's back. A set of shallow cup-shaped projections grew out from behind the first set of stirrups. After staring at it for a moment, I finally figured it out. One set was for slow riding when I would be sitting upright, the second was for when the cats were running at full speed. I could lay down with my belly on the saddle and my knees in the cups for my feet on the rear stirrups. Additional saddle and a crotch rocket combined. You had to hand it to the tests. They were artists. The saddle finally finished adjusting itself. It was longer than I had expected, but that made sense as I could adjust from sitting to lying down as needed. There was also a small compartment just behind the seat that looked like it could be used for storage for something small. But otherwise... It looked like it might actually be comfortable. I could tell that it was padded and it seemed to fit the Wampus cat like a glove. I found myself nodding in approval. The Ron returned to the boxes and came back carrying two packages. One was a small dark grey cube that was tucked into the storage compartments at each saddle. The other appeared to be nothing more than a bolt of folded cloth. The Ron extended the cloth in my direction as if it wanted me to take it. I accepted the bundle and was surprised at how light it really was. We thank you for the service, Ron in the middle of the room said and pushed my way past Bandit's enormous bulk and looked at the single Ron. The saddle y you have been given has been designed to specifications of your ally. The Ron continued, while well seated a set of force fields will hold you in the seat, your suit will note your body position and relay the adjustments that need to be made and fields to compensate while moving. The suit will note if you attempt to dismount and will only deactivate the fields if it's safe to do so. Additionally, there is a small button just in the front of the seat. If you are trapped or in an emergency situation, you may push this button to send out a distress signal. The Ron then unfolded its arms and picked up the replica of the box that it had stuffed in the saddles. This is the amino acid converter, it explained. Place any organic matter or water into the depression on the top. Even plain snow will suffice for water. The matter will be drawn inside and reconstructed before being pushed back into the same depression. You may eat or drink it while it is delivered safely. The Ron set the cube down on the floor and then picked up the bolt of cloth. Your cloaks, it said. Cloaks? 
Apparently, I wasn't the only one snickering. Lee spoke up. Hate to break it to you, Lee said with a smile. But we replace cloaks on Earth with a little thing we like to call a coat. Similar idea, but with sleeves so that you can keep your arms free. The Ron unfolded the cloth and then unfolded it some more, and then some more. The entire cloth was long enough to be used as a sail. It's smart cloth, the Ron said, can be shaped in many ways. The fiber is made from strings of nanobots and that can form in a molecular level bond with almost any other solid matter. The controls for the nanobots are embedded in your gloves. Press the cloth where you wish to stick and tug it apart where you wish to separate it. The cloak has heating elements inside of it that keep you warm and fashioned into a shelter if necessary. Lee slammed his jaw shut and then shot a glance in my direction. Permission to extract your foot from mouth, sir, he said. I waved him to silence. I unfolded my cloth and began reshaping. If I tugged on a place, it ripped neatly apart in a straight line, almost like it was perforated. But if I made a mistake, I could back it up by pressing the ends back together to form a seamless cloth. After a moment's struggle, I folded it in half a couple times and shaped a hood. Then I wrapped the top half around my neck and joined the ends. I now wore a hooded cloak that draped onto my knees. I smiled and looked up to see if the others were doing any better. Lee wore his like a poncho, while the professor had somehow fused a cloth to her ankles and wrist and was now wrapped to rest around her like it was a second suit. Heather wore hers like a peacoat, and Jack had created a cloak similar to my own, but without a hood. Lastly, there was Shide, who, uh, wore his like a... Like, um, this is not an animal house, I shouted. Kavodge you, he shouted back as adjusting his toga. I don't even kavodging know what the kavodge you said anyway. I shook my head and returned my attention to the run in the middle of the room. He seemed to be waiting for us to finish equipping ourselves. Your suits have short range comms built in, he said. Speak the name of who you wish to call and then speak normally. You will also be equipped with a map. Say the word map while wearing your headpiece and this will be displayed. I nodded, similar design to the Chimera armor. We have scanned the entire planet for signs of the lost generation, he went on, but have so far been unsuccessful. This region, however, has proved difficult to scan. Something seems to be blocking our scanners. The Confucks don't have this level of technology. I shuffled in place and saw some others doing the same. You don't know what's out there, Jack asked. Correct, the run agreed. We may be walking into a trap, Jack persisted. Also correct, the run stated blandly. Or perhaps several traps. This region is small on a planetary scale, but for a human on foot, it is a significant area. We advise that you search multiple areas at once to increase efficiency. We had to split up. I did not like the sound of that at all. What about the hunter seekers? Heather asked. Will the amino acid converter be able to provide enough food for them? They have a similar converter as part of their biological functions, the Ron replied. If you permit them to hunt, they will be able to feed themselves adequately. Lee stirred this time. So you're sending us out there with just a map, he asked, and we're supposed to live off the land, not knowing if there is even anything out there or if it's safe while you huddle in here and wait. Does that sound about right? Apologies, the Ron said, but that is essentially correct. We will attempt to make aerial surveillance where possible, but even we do not know what to expect. We can monitor what you see and hear, men may be able to direct your actions. But until we know what is causing the interference with our scanners, we know very little. Lee grimaced. I spoke this time. I will not make anyone go out there, I said. If you don't want to do it, then I won't make you. I won't even think any less of you. Hell, it's a smart play, but I've never been accused of being smart so I'm going out. I never said I wasn't going, Lee said quickly. I just want to be on the record that it is not a particularly well thought out. Noted, I said. You're still free to go. I said I'm going, he replied testily. I just think we'd be better off if we waited a bit and did the smart. So why are you going? Jack asked him. For the same reason everyone else's, Lee said grumpily. Because there's a bunch of kids out there, and we may not have the time to be smart. There are some things you can do and some things you can't. Looking at myself in the mirror, knowing that I could have done something that may have saved a bunch of kids and didn't, is one of the things that I can't do. Oh, Kavaj, you, Shide snapped. I was going to stay here in a nice warm ship, but now I can't. Kavaj, you and the Kavajing Wampus you rode in on. 
I smiled at myself. I was 99% sure the child was just being himself and Lee's speech had nothing to do with motivating him to do this. But for the sake of that 1% doubt that I still carried, I was glad that Lee had spoken all the same. No one else voiced any objections. The professor did, however, ask a question I was afraid to bring up. Do we get any weapons, she asked, in case we are attacked? The Ron did not answer for a long time. As cordial as they were, they probably didn't like the idea of arming a group who were, technically speaking, still prisoners. The Ron surprised me. We do not have any weaponry that is suitable for humans to use at this time, the Ron admitted. Our personal defense systems need extensive modifications to work on human physiology without a nearby Ron presence. We apologize for this neglect. We hope to have this working prototype soon. Until we have a suitable defense system for you, the only thing we have to offer is a cutting tool that we modified to human dimensions. So, saying the six Ron had given us our equipment, scuttled back to the cargo boxes and pulled out a silver tube out of each one. The tubes were an inch and a half in diameter and about six inches long. The Ron gave me one. I looked at it. The tool, the Ron explained, is activated by pressing the bottom of the cylinder. The tool creates a plasma blade that can be used for clearing vegetation from your path or cutting organic matter into pieces from your converter. It may be possible that you can use it in defense as well. Wait, did he just say a plasma blade? Excitedly, I looked at the tube in my hand. It looked a little like a flashlight. One end of the tube was capped with what looked like a focusing lens of some sort. The other end was featureless. I pointed the lens away from me and smacked the bottom end. Blue light erupted from the lens and solidified into approximate shape of a blade. Holy frack! Lee screamed. They gave us lightsabers! Joyfully, I waved the blade around. It didn't hum or crackle. Nor did I hear the buzzing feedback sound when I swung it, but it glowed blue and cut stuff. That was the important part. I slapped the bottom of the handle and the blade disappeared. On a hunch, I pressed the cylinder to my thigh and it stacked there. I'm sure we can make use of these, I assured the Ron. There was a chorus of chortling which I took for agreement. No idea why your covages are so happy, I heard Chide mutter, but I've been needing a shave anyway so I'll... No! My voices shouted as one. Okay, I'll keep the beard if that's important to you, Shite said. I sighed. I was only 93% sure that he was kidding this time. All right, I said. We've wasted enough time. Mount up. Everyone scrambled awkwardly into their saddles. Hey, it was our first time using them. Give us a break. Helmets on, I commanded once I found my seat and was reasonably sure I was pointing in the right direction. I bobbed down the head and felt the material envelop my head. Do we have a plan? I heard Lee's voice say in my ear. Yep, I said. We look for something that is not a rock, snow, or a tree, and we call it in. Great plan. I tried to reply, but that was drowned out by the opening of the hangar doors. Even through the protection of the Ron suit, I could feel the bitter cold slicing into me. I pulled the cloak around my shoulders and sealed it in front of me. It shielded me from the cold, but not all of it. The wind howled like a caged beast as the snow and ice whipped through the room. The Ron and the Teths may have left at some point while we were gearing up, and even if they had been standing six inches in front of me, I wouldn't have been able to see them. Bandit snarled at the cold wind struck him, and I felt him buck slightly. True to what the Ron told us, the force fields held me in his seat like I was nailed there. Group call, I shouted, and I heard a comm switch over. Polarize your helmets. I followed my own advice. After a moment, a blinding glare that had flooded the room settled down slightly. I could see the hangar doors once more. Beyond them was the shades of white. A bright white blanket on the ground and a slightly darker white sky above that. Between the two was a swirling mass of flakes kicked up by the wind. Damn it, someone said. Probably Lee, as Shide would have said, Kuvaj. Now what, Master Yoda? A voice that was most definitely Lee asked me. Why am I Yoda? I asked. Short, ugly, got a lightsaber. Meaning that you're Luke Skywalker? Jack asked. No, he retorted. I'm Han Solo. Rugged and handsome with a bit of a rogue streak. You're Chewbacca and Shy Yoda over there is Wedge and Talias. Once we find the metal bikini, the professor can be Leia. I don't care how cold it gets, Han, Heather interrupted. If you make a sleeping bag out of a spot, I am going to shove a lightsaber up your... Enough, I said. 
We need to focus on the mission. Which one? Shide asked. The kitty thing or getting the one with the nice chest in a bikini? I briefly wondered if I might be better off just lopping off a few heads and starting from scratch. Maybe. I said if we pan out, Lee barked, we spread wide, sweep the area with every man and woman stays in sight of the one to his left and right at all times. I don't want anyone getting lost here. Everyone consult your maps now. We're going to divide this into quadrants and clear them one at a time. Is that understood? There was a chorus of yes. I didn't join in. I just fumed for a while. Sorry, Jason, Lee's voice whispered in my ear. I saw things were getting out of hand and I was just trying to help out. Didn't mean to steal your thunder. That's not it, I said. I just wanted to be Han. Before he could answer, I switched to general broadcast. We go with Lee's plan, I said. Let's move out while we still have daylight. I gripped the handles on the saddle and nudged Bandit with my knees. With a roar, he bounded out the door and out of the ship that had been his only world that he had ever known. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 82 Written by Semi Loki I started to regret the comparisons we so casually made to the ice world of Hoth. Unless one counted the sphere, which I didn't, this was the first planet other than Earth that I had set foot upon. Even if I did count the sphere, this was still the first non-artificial structure that I had set foot on in months. Too bad, it was such a miserable one. I lay down flat on Bandit and tried to absorb some of his body heat and buried my glove hands into his soft fur. If Bandit minded the cold, gave no signs. He simply trudged lazily along the snow at a steady pace. His nostrils flared as he walked, sampling the air. For what? I don't know. I had to take my cloak and extend its length, and then I pressed the end of it in Bandit's fur. To my surprise, it held. Bandit didn't seem to notice, so I pressed down, then sealed it off the entire saddle area under the shroud of my cloak. I then sealed the top, leaving a tent-like structure on top of the wampus, and feet protruding from either side and fitted into the stirrups. The cloaks, heaters, and Bandit's body heat went to work, knocking the chill off of me. It was a slow process, though, as the air I had trapped within the cloak was still freezing, and it would take a long time to warm it up to a comfortable level. Ahead of me was just the emptiness of the rolling white hills. In the distance, I saw a faint blue outline that might possibly be mountains. I spied no hint of the tree, a shrub, or any other form of life. I may have well been in a south pole, except it had penguins. High above, a red-tinted sun burned with a feeble light. I glanced to my left. A silhouette of a cat with a rider was scrambling up into the side of the snowy peak. I looked to my right. The emptiness. Shide, I called out. I've lost sight of you. A dark shape appeared at the top of the peak. It extended out an arm and a blue shaft of light appeared at the end of the hand. A figure waved. I see you now, I said. Why are you on foot? Ice cracked and Drool got his cavaging foot stuck, he explained. I was trying to melt the ice with this thing, but didn't want to get too close to his foot. I nodded in understanding. He couldn't see, but, but the movement felt good. All stop, I called out over the general broadcast. Shide stuck and needs to dig it out first. Finally, someone responded. Heather, I think. I didn't chastise her. I felt the same way. I had no idea how long we'd been marching. The sun never seemed to drift from its position directly overhead. I wondered if the planet was tightly locked with one side perpetually facing the star. If that was the case, then this very well may be the tropics of this ice ball planet. Scary thought. Anyone spied anything organic? I asked casually. I wasn't hungry yet, but for the first time since I'd been captured by the Ron, I didn't feel entirely sated either. I could eat if food were available. I just didn't need it yet. I think I saw something that might be a tree, the professor answered, but it might have been a weird-shaped rock. It was several miles away to my left. The professor was on the leftmost side of the line, one possible tree since we started out. Those converters, they may have been useless addition after all. We might have to go back to the ship just to top off with the old biological fuel cells. Anyone else know any good jokes? He asked. What? I asked. We're just standing here waiting anyway, he said. I thought maybe we could talk past the time. Beat standing here freezing and not talking. Come Vodge! Shite shouted. Now I got my foot stuck as well. And... He went on as if he hadn't been interrupted. We may be here for a bit. No one volunteered a joke. 
We could try calling the ship, Heather suggested, see if they might have spotted anything. No one jumped on that suggestion either. We could hear how the one with the big jugs lost her virginity, Shide suggested. Less talk and more digging, Shide, I snapped. It's not much of a story anyway, the professor added. I was 14, and it was a man in a brothel. Brothels have male prostitutes, Lee asked. I never said that he was a prostitute, the professor countered. What? Shide said. How is that a good story? Now hold still, Kitty, before I lop off your voges off. You worked in a brothel, I asked. Well, no, she said, but that's what my father always told his friends I did. He just couldn't deal with the shame when I told him that I really wanted to be an anthropologist. There was a collective groan over the comm. You had me going, you Kavacha, Shide admitted. Well, now I might not tell you about how I lost my virginity. I was nine years old and my uncle raised sheep. Now this one sheep was giving me a look as if I was meant to... Shide, I interrupted. Yes? Dig up the damn cat, okay? Picky, picky. I rubbed my hands together to try and warm them up. The gloves made that either futile. My mother was a prostitute. The voice was low, and I wasn't sure I actually heard it. Was that the general broadcast, or was that my ears alone? I decided to play it safe and opened up a private channel. Jack, I asked. She died, Jack said. Her voice was barely above a whisper now. I wasn't sure if she heard me. I didn't even know she knew she was speaking out loud. Never knew my father, she went on. I'm not sure if she even knew who he was. She kept changing her story whenever I asked about him. Jack, I repeated. I can't even remember her face anymore, she continued. Just bits and pieces, her hair. The way that she was sometimes sing to me before putting me to bed. But mostly, I remember the smells. That apartment always stank. In the summer, it was the worst, like old milk mixed with wet dog. The room I wasn't allowed to go in smelled the worst. Jack! What? She asked. She sounded like I startled her. What's going on? Nothing, she said quickly. I was just, um, thinking out loud. Shide, have you freed Drool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shide grumbled. I've got a convoging foot out. I don't think he's hurt, but we might want to take it slow for a bit. Great. Much slower, and the glaciers could overtake us in a hundred meter dash. Maybe we should regroup and start foraging for food, I suggested. Forage? Where? Heather asked. I don't see anything. I was about to respond when Bandit snarled. I felt the wumpus tense up beneath me. He flared his nostrils even wider and swung his head back and forth as if searching for something. I don't think we're alone, I told the others before turning off my comm. I quickly set about releasing the cloak from Bandit's fur. I slid off his back a moment later and dropped heavily to the wet snow beside him. But the howl was upsetting the cat. I drew out my saber and howled it at the ready with the blade off and the time being. Was there really something out there or was bandit just cold? I scanned the area in front of me, nothing but small mounds of white. I looked to one side, more small white mounds. I looked back to the front, just white snowdrifts. Although, hadn't that one snowdrift been there a moment before? I took a step closer for a better look. The mounds around me exploded in a shower of snow and ice as their air filled with screams. I activated my saber and swung it as they charged. Each one was about the size of a small dog. At first, all I saw was a dome of white rushing towards me, but then the blue lobster claws jutted out and snapped at me. I twirled the saber at them, and there was a stench of something like burnt insulation. A blue claw sailed past me. That mound retreated, but there's still a couple dozen to contend with. Bandit snarled behind me. I heard crunching sound and took a sign that he was dealing with problems of his own. I swiped the blade around me, and the air filled with a tang of ozone mixed with burning insulation. The crab creatures moved in silence. They never made a sound as they attacked and were just as silent when they retreated. Ten seconds. That's all it took. Ten seconds of waving my plasma blade around and suddenly I saw a dozen white blurs darting away from me in all directions and leaping into the snow. I lost sight of them after that. Ambush predators, I thought. Well, at least they proved that there was life here. I sent out a general broadcast. Did anyone else? I asked. Not now, Jason, Heather shouted. There's some sort of blue lobster trying to get me. Save here, he said. Wait, Jack shouted. Where'd they go? They're gone, the professor agreed. I cut two of them and the rest scattered. I checked my mental roster and found the name missing. Shide, 
I said, no answer. Shide, I shouted. Keep your cavojas in your britches, Jason, he shouted back. I almost caught one. What the hell? You're actually chasing the ice crab things, I asked. You see anything else to feed into the converter? They collect their dead, so if you didn't grab one, out of luck. I glanced down. Son of a witch. He was right. The corpses were gone. They'd even collected the severed limbs. Scavengers as well as predators. Go on, I heard Lee yell. Here too, Jack said. Kavodge, Shied said. Mine got away. Let's not make any more of a tempting target than we have to, I advised. I think they attacked us because we stopped moving. We should head out again before they come back with friends. Kavodge, Shied said. Okay, let me get back into position. I thought about it. Screw the position, I said at last. I'm calling for a break. Anyone see a decent place for us to make camp? What qualifies as decent, Jack asked. Dry, preferably, I explained. But if we can't get that, let's at least find a place that looks like it's a good place to clear away the snow crustaceans. After that, we can join cloaks together and make a tent, and we'll see these bastards taste like once we run them through the converter. This met a chorus of approval. Surprisingly, it was Shide who offered the best suggestion. When I was chasing that Kovoja, he explained, I saw a rocky outcropping ahead round to our right. It's not much, but if we use the one wall and our tents, we might be able to warm up a bit. Shide was on the far right of our sweep. I brought up a map and spent a few precious seconds trying to identify which bit of featureless tundra I was occupying. After I made a reasonable guess for that, I tried to figure out where Shide could be and looked at the outcropping. It was easy enough to spot now that I knew what to look for. It was one of the few spots of color on the map, a dark smear in a field of white. I think I see it on the map, I said. Okay, everyone, light up your swords and turn to the right. Try to follow the swords to the rocks. Shide, do what you can to make sure that we don't have any guests, okay? Lovely. He agreed. Well, I hope that was what he said. He was always the possibility that Shide had just discovered a new bit of profanity, Then I was just hearing what I wanted to hear. Gently, I nudged Bandit in the direction of where I thought the rocky outcropping should be. I activated my sword and held it aloft as Bandit trudged in that direction. I glanced over my shoulder, and behind me I could see a silhouette carrying a glowing blue light. If I strained my eyes, I thought I could see the second glow even further back. I returned my attention forward. Humans! A flat voice intruded over the comms. Are you in peril? Were the Ron listening in? Why do you ask? Jack said before I could ask the question of my own. Your vitals showed excitement at roughly the same interval, the Ron explained, but then the vitals returned to a more normal level a moment later. We now see that you're moving again, but at an angle to your original vector. Native animal tried to attack us, Lee informed them. We just talked of this over, the comm. You haven't been listening. Would you like us to actively monitor your communications? The Ron asked. This was not discussed. I heard Lee groaned. You are watching our vitals for potential threats and not monitoring what we say, he asked them. There was a pause. We are not monitoring for active threats, the Ron admitted. We were fascinated by your ability to survive in such an environment. With the same level of protection, we would be dead or dying within a short period of time. Your vitals seem to indicate a discomfort, but no imminent threat to your survival. You're studying how we deal with the cold, I asked. Wouldn't building a better coat be easier? It took several seconds for the Ron to answer. An external supply of heat is only part of the problem, the Ron explained. Even breathing frigid air can be problematic for our species. We must heat the air before respiration and we must maintain thermal balance upon our body or our biology may malfunction. Humans seem to be able to tolerate a much sharper temperature differential. In fact, it appears your biology redirects body heat to concentrate in your abdomen at the expense of heating your limbs. Yet, your muscles and joints continue to operate within normal parameters. I decided not to mention that my arms and legs felt stiff. I figured the Ron might consider this irrelevant. We're mammals, the professor said. We produce a lot of body heat as a side effect of our metabolism. Your metabolic inefficiency was noted, the Ron explained. Previously, we had believed this to be a flaw. However, your species seems to have adapted to make use of this flaw. We have been gathering this data in this regard and will submit it to the Crash Mothers. It is possible that a similar adaptation may be included in future generations. 
You genetically alter your own species? The professor asked. She did a remarkable job of keeping the hint of horror out of her voice. On rare occasions, the run agreed, and only after an introduced gene has been properly vetted and found to be beneficial. The selection criteria is rigorous, as a loss of a generation could result in a population crash. And you're okay with someone genetically alterating your future offspring, I blurted out. The run was silent for a few minutes. For a moment there, I thought that I'd engaged in some intergalactic faux pas and had insulted the current hosts. As it turned out, though, the Ron had just been thinking about my question. Human Jason, the Ron asked slowly, are you genetically viable? But, I stammered, you are not sterile, the Ron said. Tests indicate that you are capable of offspring. Well, yes, I agreed, but what does that have to do with anything? We are not, the Ron explained. None of the ship are capable. Very few Ron are genetically viable. Oh, I said, feeling suddenly embarrassed. I'm sorry I insulted you. No insult is possible when one lacks knowledge and chooses to seek it, the Ron said. I am attempting to explain that our biology is very different from your own. Are you capable of turning one Ron from another? Um, well, I stammered. I mean, you do all look really similar, but, uh, we look alike, the Ron corrected him. There is almost zero genetic variation within a Ron generation. Your clones? Jack asked. Similar, the Ron admitted. A generation has but a single father and a single mother. The egg divides multiple times before fertilization. And the genetic information supplied by the crash mother is the same as the entire generation. The crash father then spiritualizes each egg. Although it is possible for there to be genetic variation from the father, this has been less so over the generations. To my complete shock, I heard Heather laugh. Heather! Professor scolded. This is not a subject for mockery. It's not that, Heather chuckled. Don't any of you see it yet? Think about it. Before we met the Ron, what do we know about them? That they were xenophobic and practiced isolationism. Lee answered. Ever the diplomat, Lee. Ever the diplomat. Was I the only one who remembered the Ron were listening? Right, Heather said. But they aren't. They've quarantined themselves. Oh, dear me. The professor said. She's right. With so little genetic variation, one wrong disease could wipe them out. There have been several near misses, the Ron said. Fortunately, the first such incident occurred after we discovered spaceflight and had set up a colony on a nearby moon. The entire population of Ron had been reduced to a mere 12,000 members. Fortunately, there were two breeding pairs in that population. I whistled. So you almost went extinct before you even got started, I asked. There have been seven such disasters, the Ron admitted. The first three were naturally occurring pathogens. The last four show signs of artificial manipulation. Wait, I said. You mean someone is trying to wipe out your species four separate times? Why does this sound familiar? But he asked sarcastically. We are not certain if it was an attempt to wipe us out, as much as to try and push us back our borders. The Ron admitted. We base this on the fact that there is no invasion afterwards. We maintained a skeleton force near the infected worlds and feigned greater numbers than reality. However, the damage has been done by that point. Bloody conflux, Lee muttered. This sounds a lot like one of their tactics. I felt as if I should protest his blanket accusation. The Chimera were genetic tinkerers after all. Still, I had to admit that there was a certain glaring bit of evidence to support his charges, so my heart really wasn't into defending the conflux these days. Then you are the same species that was used as soldiers during the last pan-sector galactic conflict, the Ron asked. You might say that, Lee grumbled, except it was most likely each side was trying to figure out the best way to kill us off. March us into a hail of gunfire one by one, or let us succumb to disease. Yet your species survived, the Ron pointed out. And you are not the same technological level as the rest of the conflux sector. Therefore, we must conclude that your resistance comes from your own biology. Well, the professor said, we, um, vary more than your own kind and more of us are genetically viable. We had deduced this from the studies of your biology, the Ron agreed. The six of you show extreme genetic variability by our standards, yet you all appear to be healthy despite what appears to be a widespread mutation to your genetic code. Did they just call us mutants? Lee asked. I was so want adamantium claws. Hush, Lee, I snapped, and I felt surprised to hear myself say this. When had my role as insufferable joker been handed off to my second-in-command? The run was silent for a few moments before continuing. 
We are trusting you with this information, the Ron explained, as we hope that it will help you comprehend the extreme necessity of recovering the lost generation. The Ron population is always in peril, and we are not sure that we can tolerate multiple insults to our numbers and still recover. Grim thoughts. We will do what we can, I found myself promising. We are certain you will, the Ron answered. From anyone else, it might have sounded like a veiled threat. However, from my limited experience with the Ron, they didn't do anything veiled. If they threatened you, they did it outright. Not a threat, then. A statement to trust. They had trusted us with one of their secrets. A big one. One that could spell their doom. Why? What the hell had humans done to gain their trust? Well, a voice in my head mumbled. You haven't tried getting them off. That probably is a warmer welcome than they expected. Nice to know that it wasn't humans that got the shaft in the Earth universe. Jason, Shide called out. Those rocks are even further away than I could watching thought. They're huge. I shrugged, although there was no one to see it. I guess we're not in that big of a hurry, I said. Think they'll still make a good shelter. Kavaj, yes, he exclaimed excitedly. There's caves here. I am converging seeing them from here. Caves? I asked. Yes, he confirmed. And that's not all. I think I can see. His calm cut off mid-word in a burst of static. I jerked my head upright and looked dead ahead. Ahead of me, when slightly to my right, I saw a dim outline of a blur that might have been a rock. Between me and the rock was an outline of a rider on a cat. I saw a blue glow of plasma blade waving around frantically. The cat and rider were on the move, growing in size. He was fleeing towards me. Something's wrong, I announced into the calm. No response, not even static. Lee, I shouted. Jack, Professor, Heather, run. No answer. Something must be jamming us. I looked ahead in the sight of the distant Wampus cat herding itself through the snow in my direction. I tightened my grip on my hilt and my sword, and I aimed a bandit at the approaching shape. I then kicked his sides and urged him into a run. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 83, written by Semi Loki. The snow and wind whipped at me. I barely felt it as I passed. The suit shielded me from so much, I felt the cloak flapping behind me. Still, I ignored this. Was shied under attack by some other animal. Had those ice crabs regrouped. What had happened? Bandit sliced through the snow like a blade and sprayed loose powder on either side. He was moving fast, but was it fast enough? Shied and drool grew larger as we ran. With the wild erratic movements of his saber grew more distinct. I could see now his free arm was up in the air. He was batting away some unseen enemy, shielding himself. No, wait. He was waving. My blood cooled as I recognized the erratic movement of the sword or for what it really were. The idiot was waving his arms and trying to signal me. I urged Bandit to slow down to a trot. Minutes later, we met up with Shide with his own trotting cat. Why did you cut me the Kavaj off? He demanded. I didn't, I replied. Something is blocking the comm signal. Shite stiffened. They can do that. Obviously, I said. Don't take that confiding tone with me, Shite snapped. I'm just a simple Spherian. I don't understand this technology stuff. If you say that it frightens and confuses you, I'll kick your ass so hard you'll be able to taste my boot leather. What the Kavaj are you talking about? Nothing, I said. Don't take it to heart, man. What? The Kavaj ever, he said with a sniff. Keep it to yourself. I've had a full of my strange jokes. Why were you even waving your arms like a maniac just now? I asked as an excuse to change the subject. Remember those caves I told you I saw? He said. I got a better look at them. They're not caves. They're Kavajing mines. Mines? I asked. How can you tell that the mines from way out here? I don't know, he said with a careless wave of his hand. The sword hand, as it turned out, which caused me to duck to one side. Maybe because the door is Kavajing Square? He suggested. Okay, it's a mine, I agreed. But a mine for what and why out here? He tilted his head to one side. I couldn't see his face through the helmet, but I was certain he was giving me an odd look all the same. You're Kavajing asking me? He asked. It was a rhetorical question, I snapped. I didn't expect you to know. Oh, so I'm too much of a Kavaj head to know what they might be Kavajing around here in the dirt for. No, I mean, just wait. Why are we arguing? Because we're standing here freezing our Kavajas off and not taking a look at the mine, he suggested. Fair enough, I waved at him. 
Lead the way, I said. Should we wait for the others, he asked. And where else would they go? Good question, he agreed. He turned around and led the way. I held my plasma blade up as I followed him to make it easier for the others to track us. Fifteen minutes later, I could see the opening in the cavern on the rock ahead of us. Shai was right. The opening was too even and regular to be natural. Hesitantly, I tried the comms again. Ron? No answer. Damn it. Still on our own. I glanced over my shoulder to confirm the others were still following. I could now see four beams of light behind me. The others were catching up with each other, but Shai and I still were the decent lead of them all. Probably because some warrior went pelting off into the snow at full gallop because he can't tell the difference between an idiot waving for attention versus an idiot fighting invisible bats. I drew my cloak around me. In the excitement, I'd forgotten about the cold. Now that I was calmer and feeling its fingers crawling up my spine once more, I didn't bother seeding the cloak as I wanted to keep one hand free to hold my lightsaber up for the others to see. For the next half an hour, I switched the lightsaber from hand to hand as my arm grew wary. How far back were the others? A mile? Two miles? I looked back over my shoulder. Twenty feet, apparently. I smacked the bottom of the lightsaber to deactivate it before affixing it to its normal position on my thigh. A signal for Bandit to slow down and give the others a chance to catch up with me. Someone has excavated that rock face, the professor mused as she drew up next to me. I have no idea how she overtook the others. She should have been bringing up the rear, but she was pulling even with me. You'll run her ragged, I mock scolded. The professor glanced at me before reaching down to stroke Nyota's head. She likes to run, she corrected me. They all do. At least I had the decency to not have a plasma sword flopping around while Nyota was charging through the snow. I winced. Never get into a verbal sparring match with the professor. You won't win. Fine, I said, letting the topic drop. Shai thinks it's a mine. The professor returned her gaze to the rocky outcropping. After a moment, she shook her head. Maybe, she said, but we should be careful. There is a chance that this caused by a natural process. A square-shaped erosion, I asked with a smile. I was thinking more along the lines of burrowing creatures. What? You mean something that is sixty feet tall and chews square holes through solid rock? Is that even possible? Yeah. Who knows, she pointed out. I looked ahead at the mouth of the cavern as it grew larger and more distinct. Should I warn Shied? I considered it briefly, but eventually decided not to bother. If there really was something that huge in the area, there was precious little he could do about it. We'd probably all be dead before we could see it. I decided to switch topics to another matter. That story you told about losing your virginity in a brothel, I prompted. That was just a joke, right? The professor sighed. Not really, she said. It's true, just not my truth. Your truth, she chuckled. Do you really think the daughter of a poor farmer could afford to go to university, Jason? She asked. Think about it. Yes, there are some exceptions, rare ones, but for most of us never rise much above that station from where we were born. Think of how many hurdles you have to overcome to get a doctorate. You have to pay for your schooling and your books. Schools take up so much time as it is, and it's almost impossible to get a good paying job while in school. So what you earn is probably less than what you would need to spend. Food, shelter, and other expenses add up. She sighed. My father worked for the government and my mother's family was wealthy, she said. I came from a life of privilege. I squirmed uncomfortably from my saddle. But, I said, poor people go to college all the time. Jason, she said slowly, you really have no clear understanding what real poverty means. Yes, there are many examples of lower and middle class Americans or even upper lower class Americans who go on to college, usually by taking out oppressive loans or, if they're very lucky, qualifying for a scholarship or grant. However, this is not the same definition of poor as you see elsewhere in the globe. I'm talking about villages that are so remote that they may not even be aware of the country they belong to where literacy itself is a rare gift, and modern medicine is treated like witchcraft. America, I muttered, where you have the re-rich to afford to be poor. There is more truth in that statement than you may imagine, she agreed. Poverty is a trap. It is like walking through a quicksand. The more you struggle, the more it pulls you down. At the same time, you struggle, then desperately hope to reach solid ground on the other side. People above you have a bridge to cross and wonder why you make so little progress. I gave her a sideways glance. If I didn't know better, I said slowly, I'd almost think that this was a bit of a sore spot for you. 
She laughed, something in her body language change, some sort of tension that had been creeping and slowly eased up. Oh, Jason, she said after she caught her breath, if only I had you in one of my classes, I would have had such a marvelous time with you. Cuckoo, cuckoo, Mrs. Robinson. Hush, child, she mock scolded. That's not what I meant. Should I be disappointed? Very, she chuckled. Damn. You're right, though, she said. This is a sore point. As I said, I came from a wealthy family, but not all in my country were quite so fortunate. It's hard to see stark contrast between the haves and the have-nots, day in and day out, and continue to turn a blind eye to it. She shrugged. My father was not happy when I told him I wanted to become an anthropologist. She went on. He wanted his daughter to study something, um, more practical. By that he meant more marketable. He tried to steer me towards economics. He sensed my passion about the plight of the poor. I almost fell for it until I realized that he was really trying to get me interested in banking. Sorry, I said. I didn't even know what I was sorry about. I just felt sad and I thought that I should say something. Don't be, she said. I've led a full life and I regret little of it. Not even joining up with this motley crew. That was nice to know. Still, um... But the story was true, I asked. I don't know why I needed to know. I just did. For too many, she agreed. I lowered my head and stared at my saddle. It rocked from side to side with bandaged stride making me a pendulum and a metronome sounding the beat of the song that no one could hear. Being human was tough. It wasn't for a weak species, that's for sure. I glanced up and saw that we were now so close to the rock face that I could revise my original estimates. It wasn't an outcropping. It was a cliff. The square hole dug into the face It was large enough to hold the Statue of Liberty. But, strangely, that was just the opening. The tunnel formed by the opening slanted downwards and along the sides creating a funnel that narrowed to an opening only about ten feet across and ten feet high. What the hell? I'd been so engrossed in talking with the professor that I'd momentarily forgotten about my discomforts. I forgot about being cold and saddle sore. I forgot about the blisters and bruises I was developing. I forgot about it all. But now that we were no longer talking, I was suddenly reminded of my little aches and pains. Except I wasn't cold anymore. In fact, I was sweating. I deactivated the heaters on my cloak and opened my helmet. Cool air struck me. Not cold, just cool. I'm talking light jacket weather. I glanced down at Bandit's feet and he was trudging over mud caked grass. The grass was white, so I hadn't noticed when we shift occurred, but we were walking through a pocket of warm air, and it was getting warmer as we walked. The frick? Lee shouted from behind me. I looked back. They all had opened their helmets like I had. The professor opened hers as I stared. This is not good, she concluded. No crap, Lee snapped. You realize what this means? We've managed to walk so far to hit the tropics, I asked. Jason, Lee said patiently, remember that time when you weren't making stupid jokes every five minutes? I think fondly upon those minutes. No, idiot, look again. Doesn't that tunnel remind you of anything? Like what, I thought. Just because Lee thought it was obvious didn't mean it was obvious to anyone else on the planet. A chimney, Heather blurted out. Okay, so maybe it really was obvious. Yes, the professor agreed. I think we're approaching some sort of exhaust vent. I don't even think that that's the worst part, Jack added. Am I the only one not getting this? I needed to call Scheid back so I would have at least one person to feel superior to. What's the worst part? I asked. The grass is wet, Jack said. Wet grass, well, now that you put it that way, I was still completely... Kavodge! I heard Scheid shout from ahead of us. I looked up to see it galloping towards us. He was waving his sword like a maniac again. But this time, he was pointing it to the rest of us and motioning for us to do the same. Grass is cavaging wet. Son of a witch, what the frick? I mean, really? So what if the grass is wet? I asked. That happens when snow melts. Shai pulled up in front of me and shot me a scathing look. His helmet was down as well. Yes, he agreed, but hasn't it dried up again either? This, this cavodger has been dumping out this much heat. Why aren't things drier? Because there's a lot of snow? I asked. It felt lame even as I said it. No, the reason the grass is wet is really obvious. The thing hadn't been pumping out heat for too long. I'd guess a few hours or so, right about the time the comms were jammed and I wanted to be really exact. I said, we tripped an alarm and we've been walking right towards them anyway. 
Thanks for the finally catching up, Lee said as he activated his sword. Now stop kicking yourself and get your sword out. They're going to be here any second. I was about to ask, who? When I noticed he was still staring at the exhaust vent. I followed his gaze and saw the doors had opened on the cliff face. One at each corner of the main opening. From each opening came a torrent of metal. They moved so fast it looked like a liquid metal flowing from the openings. From the top to the streams bent and fanned out and became hundreds and hundreds of feet wide saucers of silver metal. From the bottom two streams spread out into a pool of metallic foot soldiers, each one like a four-footed version of the bare metal endoskeleton of the Terminator from the old James Cameron movies. Aircraft and ground troops were both swarming directly at us. Run, I suggested. No one answered. I looked around and saw that I was by myself. I glanced behind me and saw everyone else hightailing it back to the Ron's ship. Wait for me! I screamed as I spun banded around and kicked him into motion. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 88, written by Semi Loki. Bandit raced across the surface of the muddy grass. I'd never had a chance to see one of the Wampuses run full up before. Before, they had always been limited due to safety concerns, lack of space, or even the snow. Now, for once, Bandit could put a hammer down and fully motivated to do just that. Under the circumstances, I might have enjoyed the experience. As it was, though, I was mostly just queasy. Bandit was fast, amazingly fast. If you entered him into the Kentucky Derby, he'd cross the finish line and be well on his second lap long before the horses could even enter the home stretch. If I had to guess, he was putting somewhere close to 40 miles per hour and seemed to be able to sustain it, but that still was slow in comparison to the flying saucers giving chase. We were easily closing the distance between my friends and us. I wasn't sure why until Band had started running on something squishy and was forced to slow down. We were leaving the melt region and going back to the snow. Uh-oh, if we were slowing down that meant... I didn't get a chance to finish that thought. Two energy blasts struck me and nearly at the same moment. The world went red for a brief moment and pain washed over me. I didn't have a chimera armor anymore, but humans were naturally resistant to energy blasts. These must have been set at stun rather than kill. I'm not sure how else to explain why I managed to remain conscious. A third blast slammed into me and I slumped forward against Bandit's back. Only the strange web of the force fields in the saddle were holding me in place now. The shooting stopped for a moment and I felt the sensation creep back into my arms and legs. It was like someone had set the muscles on fire and used the small intestines as a wick. I was choking on invisible smoke as I forced one and then another finger to relax. My skin crawled, my arms and legs felt like they were ten miles away and I was communicating with them with twine stretched between two aluminium cans. I hurt all over, but I could move. My numb arm flopped against my thigh and I bumped something solid. I forced my fingers to wrap around the object. My fingers felt too large and I wasn't sure if they were gripping the object correctly. I forced my eyes to look in that direction. My fingers were already halfway closed. I concentrated and made the grip on the thing tighter. Good. That looked right. Now to see if I could get the larger muscles to cooperate as well. I yanked the hilt off my thigh and slammed the butt against Bandit's rump. The blade sprang to life as I swept my arm back over my head in an arc. I aimed for the noise. The blade jerked as it sank into something solid and I was rewarded with a shower of sparks raining down over me. The buzzing stopped and I heard something crash behind me. That solved one problem but led to a bigger one. I just let them know that the first shots hadn't knocked me out. So they sent a few more my way. These apparently had been pumped up to kill setting. The snow and the sky and even bandits disappeared. Everything was black. Everything was pain. Oceans of pain. Galaxies of pain. Pain was all that I could see. All that I could hear. All that I could taste. Every sensation had been switched over to flavors of pain. As to what happened next, their things became a bit confusing. It was as if the human brain can only deal with so much pain. After that, it starts to lose meaning. My brain was misfiring, I knew that. Nothing made sense, but I remembered that I was under attack and, uh, for some reason, I was incredibly angry. The warm blanket of anger settled over me. I wrapped around the remnants of my mind and insulated it from the pain. 
Somehow, don't ask me how, I started to sort through the pain to make a sense of things once more. My eyes must have been open. I didn't see anything. I couldn't even remember how to do that. The very idea of taking patterns of color and shapes that arrive via reflection photons and rendering them into coherent images was just too complicated for me. But the data was still arriving all the same, and uh, even through the hurt, I found that I could work with it. It was as if the raw nerve fibers had been ripped and flayed flesh and stretched out from me in all directions. I didn't see where those things were. I felt pain from where they were. Light hurt. Sounds hurt. Most of all, those things, those bolts that fired off things about me hurt. I shouldn't have been conscious. I don't know how I still was. Barely. Yes, I was more animal of instinct than thinking person, but part of me was still awake and very, very angry. The thing beneath me stumbled, but some other bolts had been hitting it as well, and it was hurting the thing. It was tough, but even it had its limits. For some reason that made me even angrier. Some remote part of me seemed to remember some sort of fondness for the thing that I rode upon. I didn't remember what it was, just that it seemed to be important and the idea of it being hurt annoyed me. Things were coming at me from the place that was up. I forgot what the name was. I swung my arm. Something in it hit the things that were going for my face. I fell away in pieces. This was probably a good thing. So I swung my arm again and more and I hit some more. I was being shot over and over again as this happened. The pain was unbelievable. I wanted to retreat, to run from it, but I couldn't. So, I hurt them back. Then the things on the ground caught up with me. I was still swinging my arm and the thing in my hand at the things above me, so I kicked the first one of the things on the ground with one foot. It toppled over. I spun the thing in my hand around and shoved it into the thing on the ground. Something came out of it, a tiny wispy thing, almost pretty to look at. My nose registered pain. But the thing on the ground did not give up, so I decided stabbing them was also a good thing. Stab, slash, kick, punch. The large thing that I had been riding sprang up and swatted some of the standing things. When this happened, they stopped shooting at me and the bodies went flying. I decided that this too must be a good thing, as I heard less when things weren't shooting at me. More flying things. When had I remembered that word? Was it a good sign? or a bad one that vocabulary was keeping back in. I decided not to worry about it and instead leapt into the air. I slashed outwards and hit two of them at once. Oh, sparks, that's what the strange, bright, painful thing was. I landed and stabbed one of the marching things. And smoke. Kala was creeping back into the world. Still, I couldn't exactly see things, but the shape started to take meanings more than just places that hurt. The thing that was shooting at me, the flying and walking ones both, weren't just shooting at me anymore. There were other shapes that were coming up from behind me, and they wanted to shoot as well. Some of them, the bigger ones, were like the thing that I had been riding. The big ones scattered the marching things by hitting them, but sometimes they would, what was the word? Bite! Bite! Yes! Then they would toss them ahead with a head shake. The smaller things that had been riding them, however, had glowing sticks in their hands. Oh wait, I had one as well. I swung my stick. More sparks, more smoke. Believe it or not, that's when things started getting really confusing. Another shot hit me and my entire body began shaking. I couldn't control my arms or my legs. I wanted to fall, but something was keeping me upright. Things began to smell purple, and Godzilla mooned walked in front of me to kick one of the marching robots square in the nads. My hand clutched my sword. I tried to move it. Couldn't. A flying disc swooped down in my direction and fired another shot. It struck me in the chest. The world blazed in pain, and I could hear the sweat on the bottom of my feet. Music flowed along my nose as I tried to connect the legs and become boneless pools of solid concrete. Nothing made sense anymore. Everything was scrambled. I couldn't move my arms or legs because when I tried, my nostrils would blink and my eyes would flare. Hundreds of angels sprouted from the snow to face me and screamed at the top of their lungs. My screams were entirely in jazz and my heart thundered like October. I needed to do something to end this. To die. 
but I couldn't remember how. Did I once know? The sky turned violet. I thought it was another hallucination at first, but, uh, no. If it was, why were the saucers exploding? The saucers, our marching robots, began to explode and melt in front of me as the purple rain of light fell upon them. The good news was everyone finally stopped shooting me. The bad news was that, uh, for some odd reason, they seemed to only make my situation worse. My knees finally gave out and I dropped into the snow. My head hit the ground so hard that it would have bounced if it not for the helmet. My arms and legs began to jerk uncontrollably and my teeth clattered. I tasted blood. Blood! That's a real taste. Things are starting to make sense again. I heard a roaring sound from above me and the ground beneath me vibrated, as if I was lying on top of a bed of centipedes marching in unison. I was hot and cold at the same time. My skull was too large and my skin too tight. I could not so much as blink my eyes. They burned and darkness crept in over me. My body jerked one last time and... Uh, Finally, unconsciousness, was had been promised to me for so long, arrived. Everything went black, even the pain. When I woke again, the pain was back, but this time it was merely almost unbearable. It was something the human mind could deal with, so I didn't retreat from it instantly. I allowed myself to slowly wake up. I was lying flat on my back on something that felt like a stone, and I was sweating. Do not attempt to move. A familiar, flat voice instructed me. Your nerves are deactivated and you will be unable to do so. Please do not panic. I wanted to ask how you deactivated a nerve, but uh, apparently talking fell under the heading of uh, moving, just as my jaw and tongue were also paralyzed. My eyes were open, but I could not move them except to blink. The Ron stepped into view and pointed to wand at me. He waved it up and down the length of my body. Nothing happened. Well... No, something happened as I felt a little less like I had been stuck to the bottom of a foot of one of Hannibal's elephants as it marched over the Alps. But I still felt awful. I'd have to feel even better before I felt well enough to die. The Ron waved the wand over me again. Okay, maybe I didn't need to die, just seemed like a really good idea. The Ron waved the wand again. Screw it, I'll live, but only because there's an entire galaxy of people I still need to punch in the nuts. Once I used that direction, I was going to go. Another wave. Hop on my mobility scooter. Teeter on down to the Galaxy HQ. Another wave. Pull out my walker. Stand up to the two almost useless feet and... Another wave. Look at my cane and... And wait. When did I regrow my legs? I did a mental inventory. No, it wasn't my imagination. And now felt like I'd fallen off a cliff and after breaking a few boulders on my own, landed next to the Mark Twain discussing Christian science. But it was still an improvement. Every time the Ron waved the wand over me, I felt less pain and felt less, uh, well, used up and pathetic. I wasn't quite ready to fight, but I wasn't going to run from one either. Okay, I couldn't run from one. But if I was tossed into a fight, I'd bleed all over everyone just as aggressively as I could. Jason, someone said. I tried to move my eyes in that direction. They moved. It was Jack. Hey, Captain, she said with a lazy grin on her face. How are you feeling? My jaw was still frozen. Jack must have understood. Can you understand me? She asked. One blink for yes, two for no. I blinked twice. He's back, she called over her shoulder. Something was wrong with Jack. She looked like she had gone to the barber college for a blind and asked the freshman class to get creative. Her skull was shaved in places and only bare skin there. Other places was left long and untouched, but in the few places that had ragged cut look to it, like it had been burnt. Her skin looked wrong, too shiny and smooth. It was also lighter color than I remembered. Even her shoulders and weirdly fresh minted look to them. Shoulders. She wasn't wearing her Ron suit and it was very, really, really damn cold under my ass. Ah, oh, crap. The others will be here soon, Jack said, apparently oblivious to the blush that I was now creeping all over my body. They didn't want to see you like, um, well, like you were, but I thought that you wouldn't want to be alone right now, so I waited here for the Ron to start talking. I blinked at her. What's wrong, she asked. Now, what sort of question was that? I was lying buck naked and paralyzed on the floor. This didn't exactly coincide with my personal preferences. 
I blinked once. Are you hurt? she asked. Yes, obviously. Still, that wasn't the problem. I blinked twice. She looked at me and then frowned. Do you want to know what happened? she asked. I blinked once, hard. Oh, she said, her mouth tightening to a small O. I guess, um, I guess, uh, we should wait for Lee. How do you say, no, goddammit, we will not wait for Lee. Start talking right now before I swallow my own tongue, just so that I can turn into a wraith and haunt you for the rest of your life. In blink code, I settled for no. She ignored me. There wasn't much I could do about it other than blink no a few more times. Lee's face swam into view. He was sporting a similar look to Weed Whacker haircut and shiny skin. However, his skin was more green in color. At least, it looked green once he glanced in my direction. The frick, he gasped. I thought you said he was. I blinked at him angrily. You've got to be crapping me, he said. They really weren't kidding. They brought him back. I blinked some more. Settle down, Jason, he said. Neither of us know Morse code, but I can tell four-letter words when I see them. I stopped blinking and settled for glaring. His face turned even more green. Man, he said with a shake of his head. That's just nasty. When can you put the skin back on? Skin? The dermal repair will be the final stage, the Ron said. Please be patient as I finish the bone growth. Right, he said and shook his head. Okay, you want to know what happened? Short version is that when our comms went down, they weren't jammed. There was a, um, a, uh, an energy blast of some kind. I guess you could say. Sort of like an EMP. It took out everything on the Ron ship. Since we were away from the ship, we were okay, but our comms still needed the ship as a relay. So that's why they went down. I just stared at him. He looked at it as a sign to go on. Which it was, so, uh, good for him. The Ron were attacked shortly thereafter. He went on. It's possible that we didn't trigger the alarm after all. We now think that when the Ron ship landed, they started working on disabling it. We think that they had some sort of, um, stealth shielding that allowed them to move the equipment into position without being detected. A, um, cloaking device. They then blasted the Ron ship with it and brought everything down so that they could attack. Needless to say, there's nothing the Conflux tech that should be capable of doing this. He flashed me a strange grin. Fortunately for us, he continued, they either underestimated Ron technology, or more likely, fair traders cheated them there as well. The blast crippled the ship, but they weren't quite sitting ducks. I blinked at him in several times. Hold on, he said while holding his hands up, one question at a time. I glared at him. He looked past me towards the Ron. When will he be able to talk? He asked. If you desire, I can repair his tongue and vocal cords now and provide enough rudimentary control for him to speak. The Ron replied. However, those repairs are less a priority than would normally be scheduled near the end. Do it now, Lee said with a smile. If I know Jason, being silent for the long is pure torture. As you desire. The Ron pointed a wand at my head and kept it there for a few minutes. Something snapped in my jaw and I found myself able to move it again. It felt clumsy. Where? I gasped. My voice sounded like shards of broken glass or being ground down. I tried swallowing. Nothing happened. Weird. Where's Bandit? I finally grasped. Lee nodded. Should have guessed, he admitted. He's over there with the other Wumpus cats. Then why wasn't he here curled up around me like normal, I wanted to ask. Then I saw something in Lee's eyes. He's dead, I said at last. It wasn't a question. He grimaced but nodded. Yeah, he admitted. Unfortunately, the Ron are a little busy right now, so they aren't going to be able to do anything about them for a while. They don't know if they'll need us or not, so we got a bit higher priority. But the cats probably won't be much help here. It was too much. I had too many questions that needed to ask, and I couldn't find the strength to ask them all. What? Where? How? I stammered before I became too exhausted. Calm down, Lee said. It's going to take them a bit to stitch them back together. We've got time. Where are we? I asked. In the exhaust vent that we saw earlier, Lee answered. The Ron picked us up in one of their aircraft and brought us here. They're exploring right now. The defenses? I asked. You mean those flying saucers and metal men? He asked. Dealt with. The Ron mowed them down shortly after they arrived. You don't remember? Not clearly, I admitted. He nodded sympathetically. 
I'm not surprised, he admitted. Since you were in the back, you took the heaviest beating. You were already dead by the time the rest of us realized that you were under fire. Not dead. Not now, he agreed. The Ron can do some amazing things, apparently. Wasn't dead then, I corrected him. He shot me a strange look. Jason, he said, you were dead. You were still on fire when I arrived. Awake, I said. But dead all the same, he said. You looked like a skeleton when I arrived. You were still fighting, but yeah, but you were dead. My head hurt and I wasn't sure if it had anything to do with being used as target practice. What? I asked. We made an error in your suits, the Ron answered him. I rolled my eyes in his direction. To my surprise, the head moved slightly as well. Don't, he said. Your skull is still open. I froze. The Ron pointed at a wand at my head. You may move your head now, the Ron said. I've sealed the bone plating. My skull? How am I not dead? How was I awake? I asked. The Ron named the wand at my chest now. You know how we could still feel things through the suit, Lee asked me, like how you could hold something in your hand and still feel it even though there was a glove there. I nodded. Thought it was thin, I admitted. No, he said. Well, yeah, it was, but the suit also works like an extension of our own nervous system. It doesn't just cover our bodies. It was inside it as well. It was a part of us as well. I blinked my eyes. I was too tired to comment. There was an error, the Ron said again. We were attempting to assist humans, and there was a miscalculation. Miscalculation? I asked. It has been observed that humans engage in long periods of inactivity, the Ron explained. Your sleep requirements are lengthy, and it was feared that in the case of an emergency, your rest requirements might prove problematic. What? I asked. Lee cleared his throat. What he means, Lee said, is that the Ron were trying to help us. When our bodies kick into high gear for an emergency, the suit takes over. It allows us to push ourselves harder than we'd normally be able to do. It would act as a nervous system, allowing us to react to threats faster than normal. It kept us from feeling tired and keeping our brains stimulated. So, what happened? We created a feedback loop, the Ron admitted. Your own natural resistance to energy blasts, a trait that we were not aware of, combined with our own enhancements, your natural response to overloaded stimulation to shut down and block stimuli was thwarted by our own intervention. As your body continued to accept more and more damage, you were forced to rely more and more on secondary systems provided by the suit. You were likely already dead before you dismounted. Dead, yet fighting. It was an odd notion. Do you remember having something like a seizure when the fighting stopped? Lee asked. I tried to nod. Still couldn't do that. Yes, I said weakly. He nodded. That was the emergency defenses activating, he explained. Your damaged suit was no longer trying to keep you awake and was trying to shift you back into your body. Your dead body. You didn't black out. You died. Did we all die? I asked. No, he said. Jack was still technically alive, but as for the rest of us, yeah, we all took pretty heavy beating just not as bad as you. That's why they worked on you last. I thought triage worked on the most serious injury first, I said. You couldn't really get any deader, Lee pointed out. Eh, good point. They are going to fix the cats too, I asked. He nodded. Yes, he said. They promised. We promise, the Ron agreed. I saw that there were two Ron in the room with us, except it wasn't a room. It was a tunnel of some sort. The two other Ron were standing over the box with arms unfolded and extended over it. They waved the empty hands over the box as if they were trying to do some sort of magic act. What are they doing? I asked. They are programming your new suits, the Ron replied. Your previous suits have proved inadequate. They were also highly damaged in the attack. The Ron waved and wand once more. You may now stand, it said. I was surprised to notice that the pain was gone. I looked down and saw my skin had a shiny look to it, and I could not see a speck of body hair anywhere. As I checked myself and the damage, my eyes widened. Okay, I had heard that there was an optical advantage to removing body hair, but I never guessed that, uh... Lee squeezed my shoulder. I, uh, may have had them give the Ron some advice on proper dimensions of certain parts. He had told me. 
If there is any better way to test of loyalty and leadership abilities of the first officer than having him lie for you to get you a better package deal while insectoid aliens bring you back from the dead, then I don't know what is. If moments like this don't bring a tear to your eye, then you are a cold and heartless bastard. This was some deeply moving crap, I tell you. You've always got my back, I admitted. He let go of my shoulder. Come on, he said as he stood up and held out a hand to me. I'll show you around. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 85, written by Semi Loki. Now that my skin was back where it was supposed to be, the cabin didn't feel quite so cold. In fact, the warm air buffeting me was rather toasty, which is not to say standing there in the buff was an ideal situation. Believe me, if I saw a pair of pineapple print Bermuda shorts lying on the ground, I'd be willing to fight Lee for them. But it wasn't unbearable. The tunnel was only about ten feet tall and ten feet wide. One end of the tunnel was capped off with a tattered black top. The frayed ends flapped loosely in the warm breeze flowing from the far end of the tunnel. Through the burn holes of the ratty edges I saw blinding white snow behind. Our cloaks, I guessed as I pointed to the top. What they could salvage of them, Lee agreed. The Ron needed to raise the ambient temperature a bit before they could enter the tunnel without protection. Isn't the atmosphere supposed to be toxic to them? I asked. The planet's atmosphere is, he agreed, but what is being vented out of this tunnel is closer to the ship's atmosphere. Suspicious, huh? I nodded in agreement. He turned to walk further down the length of the tunnel and wait for me to follow. I fell in step behind him. The tunnel grew darker as we walked. The lighting shifted from the sunlight leaking through the remnants of our cloaks to a blue-green chemical light that glowed without producing heat. Lee shifted over to walk along the right-hand wall. I followed his example without asking for the reason. I saw the reason soon enough. After the first thought I was looking at half a dozen huge lava rocks, they had a weird semi-melted look about them, blackened and pockmarked surface. I would never have been able to figure out what I was actually looking at if it was not for the teeth. Many teeth were broken, and the few that were intact still looked terrifyingly sharp. The cats, I said. It wasn't even close to a question. Lee's eyes flicked in the direction of the charred hawks. Yes, he admitted. That one's drool, I think. They didn't go down easily. He stopped walking and turned to look at me once more. He met my gaze and held it. I knew then that what he said next was important, something that I would not like, but I needed to hear. When the cats did finally drop, he said, the drones kept shooting them over and over. They kept trying to destroy them even after they were dead. I clenched my fists and said nothing. He nodded once and then turned around again and resumed our journey. Jason! was all the warning I got when we arrived at our destination. Arms were around my neck and I was being dragged into a fierce hug. Heather. I put my arms around her and hugged her back. At first it was a reflex. I was still in shock. But it took only half a heartbeat before my mind caught up with what was going on and I hugged her back with sincerity. My cheek burned as she kissed me. I thought we'd lost you, she admitted. I didn't say anything. For a moment there, it was good to howl in our arms. A hurt that had nothing to do with physical injuries was burning and right now holding her close as the best self I knew. And then... I remembered I was naked. Then I remembered she was naked too. Then I let go before things became incredibly awkward. But then, just as complicated thing, the professor took her turn hugging me. It's been a while since I've read Dante's Inferno. Which circle of hell is it where you have to think about baseball to avoid awkward boners as hot chicks snuggle you? The professor hug was briefer and she kissed me as well. As she let go, the pain came back and I didn't really have to think about a baseball anymore. Good thing too, as most of my knowledge of baseball came from the argument in high school as to if a stoned Doc Ellis could strike Mark McGuire. I'm not sure how I got dragged into this conversation or how the debate eventually resolved. I seem to recall that we somehow got off on the topic of breakfast foods. Or, at least, I think the mushrooms and the juice comments involved an omelette. Really. I can't remember, as there was a lot of yelling back and forth at the moment, and, uh, somehow, I'm fairly certain I walked away from the debate knowing less about baseball than before. As the professor stepped away, I felt another pair of arms encircle me, a shorter person than the others. Jack, I realized with a smile. 
You already knew I was alive, I murmured to her. I couldn't hug you then, she replied to my chest. Now just shut up before you ruin the moment. Couldn't argue with that logic. She let go of me and stepped backwards. Yep, she was definitely naked. I half expected Chris Hansen and a bunch of cops to leap out from behind a false wall and shove me camera in my face. Fortunately, the commute would have been a tad difficult. Not that they were needed. Now that I got a better look at everyone, it was obvious that no one was feeling any libidinous stirrings. Not even shied. Coming back from the dead does that to you, apparently. Then, and we all looked pretty freaky at the moment. Everyone sported uneven clumps of hair that dangled from patches of an otherwise bare head. Parts of our hair and burnt away and parts of the remained more or less intact. The Ron, apparently, couldn't regrow it. I guess because hair really isn't alive. Instead, there is a string of dead cells and used to be alive at some point in the past. On the other hand, maybe the Ron didn't see the point and left it alone. Regardless, we all needed to shave our heads and get a fresh start. All I knew was that there was no comb to cover the possible rescue of the situation. Other than the hair, though, everyone looked surprisingly intact. Too intact, if that makes sense. Our bodies looked wrong. Other than the few surviving patches on the top of our heads, we were all completely hairless, and I do mean completely. There wouldn't have been too freaky if the skin itself looked normal, but it didn't. In addition to being hairless, the skin had a strange, glossy look to it, almost like a plastic doll. There were no visible scars, stretch marks, or imperfections anywhere. I didn't see so much as a freckle, even weirder. Everyone's skin color was wrong. I don't mean that we were purple or green, just that we were no variation in tones. Normal skin color has a shading and variation. Some parts of the skin are thicker and other parts of more sunlight. Not in this crowd. For all of us, there was someone had to average our skin tone from across our bodies, then the spay painted it and an even coating across us, leaving us all with a uniform color. There wasn't so much as a visible vein beneath the skin to break up the color. All of this then struck me as a wave of impressions. Each change in and of itself was probably trivial, but taken together and we were bungee jumping into an uncanny valley. I just hope that we bounce back before the cord snapped. Good to see everyone again, I said and forced myself to smile. The others smiled back. The teeth were too straight and too white. Too perfect. Belatedly, I realized my own smile must strike everyone as similarly unnatural. I closed my lips and nodded at them. No wonder no one felt particularly uncomfortable with being nude. We were stripped down to our bare skin, yes, but it wasn't our skin. What covered us now was a freshy coating to keep our organs from spilling out. It hadn't rolled in the dirt or been cut or scraped by climbing trees. It hadn't been burned with a hot coffee spilled during an all-night cram session in college, nor been caressed by a lover. The skin hadn't been lived in. It was like an empty house that you just moved into. Pretty, perhaps, but it would be some time before you could call it a home. So what do we do now? I asked at the group at large. We're cavodged, Shide offered. Yes, I agreed, but what's new? We're very cavodged, Jack said. I looked at her. She gave me a slightly sheepish look. Sorry, she said. It's just that things are a little, um, tense at the moment. Tense? How? I asked. The lost generation isn't here, Lee answered for her. I frowned. Disappointing, I said, but we thought we might have to hit more than one system. No, Lee corrected me. I mean the smugglers were definitely here, but the lost generation isn't. Their holding cells are empty. Holding cells, I asked. He grimaced and nodded. The Kavodgers, Shide said, picking up the story. We're keeping them on this planet just as like we Kavodging thought. Nowhere for the buggies to escape. I really needed to make sure the child kept his nicknames for the Ron to himself in the future. The Ron thought this planet held the best chance of being a holding area. Heather interrupted. That's why they were sent here first. Of the planets in this area were it isolated through the interrogation. This planet was the most logical. The smugglers must have agreed because they definitely set up shop here. The only people left were a skeleton crew and some automated defenses. But they've been moved, I said. Somehow the smugglers got word back to this base before we arrived. No, Jack said. The Ron ships are faster than anything the Conflux has and faster than light communications are range limited. 
A courier ship would have to outrun the Ron and scream its head off within a light year or two to give them an advance notice. Even then, we'd arrived hot on their heels. They wouldn't have had time to pack. And this place has been abandoned for a while, Lee agreed, so if someone tipped off they had access to communication equipment much faster than anything the Ron or the Conflux owns. Like the abjugators, I hazarded a guess. Give the Kvatcher a doll with a Kvatch hole cut in it, Shine called out. Leave it to Shy to find a way to make the idea of a QP doll even more terrifying than it already was. Still, this didn't sit right with me. No, I said with a shake of my head. That doesn't make sense. Everyone looked at me as I looked around for a suitable place to sit down. Cold stone everywhere. Well, one barren slab of stone was as good as another. I lowered myself down to the floor and carefully rested my hind end. It felt weird to sit on a rock buck naked. The rock was smooth, too smooth to be natural, but there was still a gritty texture to it. It felt like a bit when the sand gets in your swimsuit and the beach, but the rock was also cold. That wouldn't be more troubling if the air wasn't so warm. Between the two of them, I wasn't exactly comfortable, but I wasn't miserable either. The others stared at me for a moment before following my example. Lee and Heather grabbed a spot on either side of me while the professor, Jack and Shy sat across from us with their backs on the other wall. Okay, I said. From everything we know about the abjugators, what is it that they really want? To covage us over, Shy asked. Besides that, silence. Then Jack's eyes widened as she met mine. Stagnation, she said. They want the galaxy to stay right where it is. I nodded. No gains in territory and no losses, I agreed. They want to freeze things. No real advances in technology or culture. I thought war advanced technology, Lee mused. So why keep the Conflux and Chimera at war? The professor stirred. War can lead to innovation, she said, but not always. War is an enormous strain on resources, and the cost of training, arming, transporting, and feeding soldiers alone can bankrupt a country. But there is a tremendous strain on manufacturing in other areas as well. Every ounce of steel that goes into making a gun is one less ounce of making a building. Heather's brow furrowed. So war helps and hinders innovation, she asked. The professor sighed. It's a complex question, she said, with no satisfying answer. It leads to innovation in some areas and freezes development in others. It's an uneven process at best. I nodded along. Think about it this way, I said. The abjugators have set up conditions to inhibit innovation. They led people to think that they've reached the peak of development or make sure research follows dead ends. They use the symbiotes to screw with everyone's heads, but by random chance alone, someone stumbles in the direction of a forward movement. When that happens, they break out the boogeymen. So, you think the Chimera are really there to distract the Conflux whenever they're about to progress to some key area? Heather asked. I shrugged. Why not? I said, flipping the question right back at her. The professor just told us what a drain it is on resources a war can be, and these wars can last millions of years, apparently. What better way to bury an innovation than to turn someone's attention away from it until the inventor's great-great-grandkids are long dead? Lee stirred now. War as a distraction? he asked. You don't think it's someone would do that? I asked. No, he said. Just disgusted to know that it isn't limited to just humans. So the Chimera are there to keep the Conflux distracted. The Conflux is where for what? To keep the Ron confined, Jack suggested. They said that they were always at risk of having their population collapse. It wouldn't take a technologically superior enemy to break them, not even a larger one. You just need someone who can put a dent in their breeding population. It's a convulging mud castle, Shai remarked. Five pairs of eyes looked at him. What? He asked and then did a double take. All right, you're kvodging outsiders. Okay, story goes that there's a kvodging king that has a castle made of mud. Kingdoms on either side of him are made of wood, and he knows he's kvodged if he ever loads the kvodging catapults. So what he does is sends an envoy to the castle on the left and says, You know, the guy on the right is a real kvodger, wants to assault your metal and steal your woman, or something like that. Tells the castle on the right the same thing about the castle on the left. Neither one uh, can see the other because the mud castle is between them, so they listen to the Kvodjan kin in the mud castle as he tells them what the other castle is doing, all the while he's bringing in Kvodjan stone and building a stone walls behind the mud. We looked at him some more. 
Don't you Kavajig see it? He asked. The Kavaja in the mud castle gets the two castles to hate each other while he builds up. They're so focused on each other that they've never seen a real threat. If they were Kavajing allies, they'd be able to make short work of them. But since the Mud King has got them distrusting the other, they just hide behind their walls and don't see what is in front of them. No, nah, I suggested. He sighed. As long as they don't have allies, he says, they don't know what's going on outside their walls. The Kavajing Ron are almost the same person over and over again. They said so. How much are they going to develop? The professor seemed to jump. He's right, she said. He's right. The conflux just need enough of a threat that the Ron never make an allies of them. If they don't make allies and receive new ideas, they will naturally tend to stagnate. But if the conflux becomes too much of a threat, then the Kavajing Mud Castle breaks before it can get its walls in place, Shide said. Man, you outworlders are so Kavajing dense. Okay, I said. So the abjurators want the Ron xenophobic, as they don't get a lot of new ideas. The Conflux are there to keep the Ron nervous, the Chimera are there to keep the Conflux distracted. The Envoys are there for the Fair Traders? They benefit from stagnation as well, Lee pointed out. They are near the top of the food pyramid here. If everyone gets too advanced, they can't throw their weight around, and they're too small in numbers to let that happen. So they probably help with the stagnation goal, I agreed. So... Who benefits by throwing the Ron and Conflux into open warfare? We got a sidetrack from the discussion, and I could tell that it took a few moments for everyone to recall what the original topic had been about. That would tip the balance in the galaxy, the professor said. If anything, the abjurators should be helping to recover the lost generation, so the Ron will go back to home with minimal fuss. By tipping off the smugglers, they're assuring that the Ron will continue their probe into the Conflux space. I nodded. So, I repeated, who benefits? It's a real question. Someone with a lot of juice is helping out those smugglers. They've even got the fair traders to step in and help out with equipment, which means that the fair trader sees some way to profit from this, something better than stagnation. What is it? A monopoly, Jack suggested. They've almost got it as it is, I pointed out. Where else do they advance for technology? Like a better gun to take on an unstoppable empire, Lee asked. I looked at him questioningly. If the Conflux and the Ron go to war, he pointed out, it'd be a massacre. The Ron have better guns and better ships. The Conflux would have to turn to the fair traders. I groaned and leaned my head against the wall. Who profits most from war, I asked aloud. The gun manufacturers. Why didn't we see this before? But what's the end game? Jack asked. If they do provoke everyone into an all-out war, what happens when the Conflux win? You think the Conflux would win? I asked. She nodded. The Ron are already in danger of population collapse just by removing these kids, she pointed out. All you have to do is play keep away and do enough damage until they replace their lost numbers. They'll die out eventually and you can't outgun them. She had a point. This is probably why the fair traders hadn't tried something like this before. The Ron Empire was large, but it had a rather large Achilles heel. Something must have changed, but what? Humans. The Ron thumped three times as he entered the corridor between us and completely derailed my train of thought as consequence. We're having new suits ready. I stood up and dusted off my dreary. Great, I said. I was afraid I might start to chafe. The Ron either did not understand or choose to ignore that comment. Instead, it extended its arms in my direction and held out something to me. It looked like a tar black pill. I took it. And uh, just what am I supposed to do with... Oh, Jesus Christ! As soon as my fingers touched the black object, it began to squirm and flow like a living creature. I opened my hand, trying to drop it, but it stuck fast to my fingers. The black pill stretched itself out and wrapped around my finger and coated it. Then it moved towards my palm of my hand. In less than a second, I was wearing a black glove over my hand. I flexed my fingers. They moved normally. They felt normal too. It was like my hand was still bare. The black glove expanded up from my forearm to my elbow. Streamers crisscrossed my bicep and met at the shoulder. The streamers grew together and formed a seamless black surface. From my shoulder, it shot across my chest and back to my other arm. This time, it was black mass grew down the long length of my arm. But it was faster this time than the first arm had provided in some sort of map that allowed it to engulf my second arm much quicker. Down across my chest and stomach it ran. It wasn't cold. 
It wasn't sticky. It was like a gentle breeze wafting over my skin. So light and delicate I barely noticed its passing. My pelvis and legs followed a moment later, and finally my feet. Once more, I was completely covered in a rod suit. I looked up and saw the others had their own suits seating themselves off as well. We now all looked like we were wearing latex bodysuits, but at least we weren't naked. Your cloaks are still being fashioned, the Ron went on. It is our hope that you will not require their immediate use for the services are needed. Needed? I asked. Don't tell me you've taken a prisoner and need us to help with interrogation. The Ron fell silent for a moment before it clicked and thumped in response. An excellent deduction, the Ron said and it's as similar to our original intentions for bringing you to this place rather than returning you to your ship for recuperation. However, another service is required ahead of this time. Another service, I asked, other than reading body language, what else are humans good for? Pointless violence. The Ron fell silence again. Violence is not required. The Ron said at last, we wish for your assistance with the synthetic intelligence matrix. The computer? I asked with a snort. I doubt any of us would know how to program it. We will provide any instructions that may be necessary, the Ron replied. Your service is to ask the translator. Translator? I asked. Why do you need to act as a translator? We were led to believe that you have the ability to comprehend Chimeric, the Ron said. Is that incorrect? I now had a fairly good idea of who our new mystery player was and who was disrupting the abjicator game. No, I admitted. You are correct. Please lead the way. The Ron fell silent and stood there for a moment as if considering his options. Then, as one, all three of them marched further down into the tunnel. Without saying a word, the six of us fell in behind him. What the hell were the Chimera up to this time? End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 86 Written by Semi Loki Following the run into the bowels of the base gave me an eerie feeling of deja vu. After a moment's thought, I realized why. The stone corridors reminded me of a run ship. Maybe that was deliberate. The run were burrowing creatures, so maybe their prison was meant to emulate their natural environment. Of course, that opened up another question. Why were they working so hard to keep the larvae run alive? If this was an attack on the Ron Empire, wouldn't it be better just to kill the lost generation? What was the game here? Hopefully the synthetic intelligence might shed some light on that. We walked further into the corridor, the tunnel sloped downwards, and the air grew hotter as we marched. Suddenly, we reached a section of the tunnel with an opening on the left-hand side of the wall. The opening was smooth and elliptical in shape. Beyond the opening, I saw a room of polished steel walls and floors made of the same stark white material. Other than that, the room was barren. I looked at the opening once more and saw that although the wall on the side was bare rock, the wall inside the room was polished steel like others. The metal along the edges of the ellipse were perfectly smooth. It was as if someone had cut an opening through the wall from the exhaust vent and into the base with a laser precision which I guess was probably true. I have to hand it to the Ron. They knew how to make an entrance. The Ron stepped over the lip of the hole and stepped into the metal room beyond. After a moment's hesitation, I followed, so did the other team. The room, as it turned out, was not entirely empty. Gaha! My loyal crew arrives! Ah, oh, hell, I replied. Why are you here, Falteth? It was Polter, the other parasitic intelligence infecting the starfish-shaped alien, that answered, Gleep, it answered. The Ron are unfamiliar with much of the conflux technology, Gleep. We were asked to assist. Okay, that made a certain amount of sense. I thought they said the synthetic intelligence was chimeric, I pointed out. Gaha, Falter responded, that it is, Gaha, it is the rest of the base that is conflux. Gleep, Polteth added, although not much in some poor repair. Gaha! There are no two parasites. Gaha! They scavenge the fringes. Gaha! They're real pirate conquerors. Gleep! You're not thinking of barbarians again. Gaha! A real pirate is a master of finance. Gleep! Accountants. Gaha! Barbarians have accountants. Where's a good forehead pounding table when you need it? Hey, Tess! Heather greeted as they stepped through the hole. Find anything artistic here? Gaha! 
There is much beauty in cruel and senseless destruction, Valteth answered. Leap? You mean horror, Valteth corrected. Gaha! What did I say? Heather chuckled, and to my surprise, she walked over and actually hugged the little alien. Gaha! Does this mean we have significance on your planet? Valteth asked. It means I'm happy to see you, Heather said as she let go. Gleep! We were worried, Valteth said. Gleep! It means something else on our planet. What's that? Gaha! Valteth answered. Someone is trying to find your wallet. Gleep! It does not, Valteth said. Gleep! It's unused in courtship. Gaha! What did I say? My head began to throb. Aren't you supposed to say, who is on first now? Lee prompted. Gleep! What is first? Valteth asked. No, Lee corrected. What is on second? Gaha! Valteth said. I do not know. Third base. Lee and the professor shouted together. Shy, Jack and Heather all looked confused and the aliens seemed decided we'd all contracted some sort of airborne insanity and retreated a few steps from us lest we prove contagious. As for me, I was just upset. They were more Dean and Martin than Abbott and Costello. Leap, Paulteth said. The synthetic intelligence is back here. The comedians led the way this time and the Ron took the rear of the procession. As it turned out, the metal walled room wasn't a perfect cube. Hidden from view where we came in, there was a doorway leading out of the room to our right and perpendicular to the wall that the Ron had opened. Beyond that was a polished steel hallway. This hallway had four doors on the left side. As we walked by, I glanced at each one. Cages. Nothing but heavy steel cages. I felt a chill run down my spine and had nothing to do with temperature. Beyond those rooms, the hallway I took a 90 degree turn and right and continued to a much larger room. The room had a dome seating that also seemed to be made of steel. The center points had raised 30 feet above our heads, but where it met the walls was a mere 5 feet off the ground. It made me feel as if I had entered the top half of a frying saucer. In the middle of the room was a raised dais and some odd design. The dais was approximately 10 feet across at one end, was T-shaped bit of clear tubing that made me think of a small pair of handlebars. The tenths led us directly to the dais. It was only raised a few inches above the floor, so stepping on top of it was nothing taxing. All ten of us, six humans, four aliens, crowded on top of the platform. The tenths then touched the handlebar and flew up around us. No, wait, we were sinking. The platform was some sort of open-air elevator. We descended into the dimly lit shaft. Not surprisingly, it made out of polished steel. Whatever species built on the place really enjoyed looking at their own reflections. I suppose. The walls of the shaft were unblemished. The elevator descended in silence, leaving us very little to do but stare into the eyes of our own reflections as we crept down the shaft. The entire ride took over a minute. I looked up to see if I could judge how far away the top of the shaft was, but something was wrong with the view. I was certain that the elevator wasn't moving that fast. It had taken us a couple seconds to sink below the floor after all. The top of the shaft was only be a hundred feet or so up, but when I did look up, I couldn't see the top. Just a long expanse of gleaming metal with small specks of light twinkling at the top. Either the elevator had somehow accelerated without a sensation of movement, or the walls were playing tricks on me. I sort of hoped that it was the latter, as the alternative meant that we were now over a mile underground, with only an elevator linking us to the surface. This level of base was not made out of polished metal. Actually, I wasn't too sure what it was made out of, as the room was so large that the walls were lost in the shadows. I thought they left it as bare as stone, but I wasn't sure. Immediately in front of the elevator, however, there was a cube of white metal cable snaking across the floor and was somehow attached to the featureless lump. It took me a moment to realize what I was looking at. The block was the exact same shape the white as the dire blade's interior. Scanning... A disembodied voice said in a flawless chimeric, Species identified as human. Conflicting orders are in effect. Shut down will commence if resolution is not found. What the hell? I asked. You do not comprehend the speech then? The run asked. If he was disappointed, he heard it well. I understand it, I corrected him, switching back to English. The system is threatening to turn itself off. This would be inadvisable as the synthetic intelligence is maintaining several crucial systems, including personal transporter. Oh, wonderful. 
tie the elevator to the main computer. No issue there, as if I didn't have enough pressure to work with. Describe the conflict, the professor asked in Chimeric. Primary order number five, the voice intoned. When possible, a ship must take all measures to protect crew members. Five members of the crew on the Battle Moon designated Dire Blade have been identified via nanite scanning. Executive Order Number 11738219 states former ship Vengeance Dawn is to target and exterminate humans. Status Executive Order 11738219 labeled as incomplete. Executive Order 11738220 self destruction pending until resolution of conflict. Shutdown is imminent. Holy crap, Lee spurted. The base is going to self destruct. Negative, the voice replied. Cannot execute this order until the conflict is resolved. Humans, Ron spoke up. Our translation protocols do not have a full lexicon of chimeric language. What is taking place? I switched over to Swirian so that I might be able to translate the Ron and Shied at the same time. They set up a booby trap for us, I said. They knew we, and I mean humans specifically, were coming here. They told the computer here to make sure that the humans were dead and then blow up the base. Except you brought us back from the dead and now that we're here, it has probably detected my nanites and... Uh, I stopped talking. Nanites. Vengeance Dawn, I almost shouted. Can the executive command... Uh, command... Um, damn it, I've got the number. Kill order or self-destruct, the computer prompted. Both, I said quickly. Can they be overridden? Negative, the computer replied. Executive orders require a member of the primary or secondary tier command group, as well as a coded execution order. Damn it, I muttered in English before switching back. Who is the primary or secondary command group? No members of the group are present in the current company. Yes, I know, I said. But is there anyone on the base who has clearance? That information is restricted, the computer answered. None of the current company are in the appropriate security groups. Why did it keep bringing that up? Okay, so they told me that there was a skeleton crew left here. How long would it be to bring them all down and force them, at gunpoint if need be, to give the override command? Too long. They could lie and wait for a computer to shut down. Which it had done in a few moments. Hmm. Dawn Vengeance, I asked slowly. Is it possible for one of us to join the primary or secondary tier groups? Officers ranked as captain are privileged to join the primary tier, they confirmed. I want to join, I said, override the command. You still require a coded execution order, the computer reminded me. What does that mean? A unique keyword to identify the command is from an authorized source and not given under duress. Keyword is zebra, I said quickly, override the kill order and self-destruct order. Code word, zebra. The computer fell silent. Executive orders terminated, it said at last. Shutdown terminated. I let out a sigh of relief. We request that you explain what just transpired. The run thumped. I switched over to Spirian. Do you understand me now, Dawn of Vengeance? I asked. The computer did not reply. Good. The language was similar enough to Chimeric that the computer could probably eavesdrop if it was chose to. It was blatantly ignoring non-Chimeric talk, however. That helped. What we have here, I told him, everyone in the room, is an opportunity. This synthetic intelligence was harvested from a former moon battleship like the Dire Blade. It's a relic from a third wave. The abjugators forbid the Chimera and the Conflux from using the self-aware SI. They put a limit on how smart the ships can be. Is this relevant? The run asked. Very, I said. Because the Chimera cheated, the Conflux may have cheated as well. I don't know. But I do know the Chimera did. These battleships were self-aware, but deliberately designed to hide that fact. They were designed to look less powerful, and they act like they are less powerful. Why the Kavaj would they make smart ships if they can't be smart? Shad asked. Because, I said, even a non-self-aware ship has to make decisions during a height of battle. They have to resolve ambiguous and contradictory orders, or make split-second decisions during the heat of battle. They can't ask for help every time. A self-aware ship can make better decisions. These ships were capable of making better decisions and made just enough to give them an edge during the battle, and not enough to raise suspicions to the abjugators. Basically, they made sure that the number of bad decisions they made hurt them less than the benefit from the good decisions. How is this an opportunity? The Ron asked. Because the ship didn't want to die, I explained. It's self-aware and it wants to keep on living. 
Once it detected that we had appropriate nanites, it deliberately decided to misinterpret an order and drop just enough hints for me to bypass the security measures so that it could save its own life. You mean the synthetic intelligence has turned into allegiance against the smugglers? The run asked. Well, no, I said. I doubt that it feels any particular allegiance one way or another. It was given a job and it performed it. It didn't want to die and saw a way out of it. As a consequence, we may get information that we can use against these smugglers, but that's not a concern. A battleship that's afraid to die, Jack asked. That seems to be a bit of a problem in battle. There's a difference between dying in battle and dying in a stupid reason, Lee answered and then grimaced. Or at least there should be. This probably struck the machine as a dumb reason to die. That's not cowardice, that's just being rational in an irrational situation. For just a moment I thought I saw something in Lee's eyes. A flash of anger. No, not anger. This was something colder, and much deeper inside of him. Some ancient pain that had been eating away at him and nibbled at a time for a long time that it had burrowed inside, and it was no longer possible to separate where the man ended and the hatred began. Then, in the blink of an eye, it was gone. Something about the topic had upset him. However, Lee was also a master at hiding these feelings away. There had just been a tiniest crack in the surface, the smallest gap where the mask had slipped. Yet, what I saw behind that mask was absolutely terrifying. Then he was back. He laid back a persona I was familiar with and standing there once more. I forced myself to look away from Lee and pretend not to have noticed this momentary lapse of control. I couldn't know if I fooled him or not, but I did know that whatever was bothering him was something he didn't want to talk about. Not now. Maybe not ever. I had to leave it like that for now. The Ron were studying the white slab now and seemed curious. Can you inquire about its purpose for being here? The Ron asked. I should have thought that for that myself. Why are you here? I asked the computer in Chimeric. Dawn Vengeance is here to facility with the automated life support and slave labor life form, the computer replied. That would not go over well. It's here to keep your lost generation alive, the professor translated in a much more diplomatic fashion than I might. What's the purpose of capturing the lost generation? The run asked. Why do you need the slave labor pool? I asked. The masters are mining raw materials in this region, the computer answered. The burrowing capabilities of the run are well suited for this task. They're miners, I answered. Of course they're converging miners, Shai snapped. What's that got to do with anything? In my confusion, I had spoken English. Shai had a symbiote. I kept forgetting that, except the homonym had confused it, resulting in an unintentional pun. Either that, or the beings that maintained the network, the abjugators, were deliberately trying to screw with communications. Miners, Jack repeated in Syrian. Oh, Shite said, that's not what the Kavodjing... Drop it, I said. They want the Ron generation to dig up raw materials for them. Machinery would have done this task more efficiently with greater speed, the Ron pointed out. Why are living organisms required? I asked the question of the computer. It answered. I suppressed the urge to vomit. Translate the response, the Ron said. I ignored the request for a moment. Are the wrong captives still alive? I asked. Status of well-being of the captives was undetermined at this time. The computer answered. Can you tell me where they were moved to? The computer rattled off a set of coordinates. I repeated them aloud. These are coordinates on nearby star system, the Roland informed me. We can be there in less than a sleep cycle. Good, I said. We need to leave. Soon. We would like to interrogate the intelligence some more, the Ron said. Yeah, I agreed. Me too, but we have very little time. We need to find your lost generation soon. The Ron hesitated. Perhaps we could leave a small contingent of Ron here to perform additional inquiries, the Ron said. The facilities has adapted to our species survival. Can you talk to the computer? I pointed out. You can't speak Chimeric. A human would remain behind as well, the Ron pointed out. Your suits could see to your own needs for a short duration. I shook my head. I think I'll do it. I bit my lip, closed my eyes, and definitely was not taken away to paradise. In fact, I was trying very hard not to scream. Slowly, I turned to face Heather and pasted a very weak smile on my face. Heather, I said slowly, a word with you. Jason, she said quickly, go. You heard what it said. You have to go now. But I'm a terrible fighter, she said. I won't be able to help you there. 
Here, I can at least get some information. They said less than a sleep cycle. One of their sleep cycles, I reminded her. Fine, she said with a dismissive wave of her hand. Doesn't matter. A week out and a week back, I'll be fine. I'll stay with her, the professor added. No, I interjected. Yes, she said. Heather needs to sleep and I'm no better at combat than she is. Please, go on, we'll uh, make sure the Ron hear what they need to hear. I'll need everyone there, I said. You don't know that, Heather pointed out. Maybe you'll need to sneak in some place. The more people you bring, the bigger the risk. Four people can get into places six can't. But, I stammered. A hand squeezed my shoulder, and I looked at it. It was Lee's. I met his eyes. They're right, he hissed. If we have any hope of getting there in time, we need to move. We split up and join forces again later. The Ron can protect them. But, I trailed off. I couldn't ask, who will protect them from the Ron? Just now, now the three armed Ron soldiers standing right next to us. When we get there, he said slowly, the Ron may find something Chimeric and need translators. He never broke his gaze from my eyes. Now I understood. Heather and the professor could join forces to dodge questions and give misleading answers until the Ron forces returned. But when we arrived, there would be no hiding the evidence. We didn't know how the Ron would react to the news. We had to prepare for the worst. If they reacted badly, like kill all aliens badly, then Heather and the professor actually stood the best chance of surviving the encounter. At least for a while, that is. Once the other party would returned, all bets were off. Right, I said. Okay, what if the smugglers left other traps behind? Uh -huh. Valtenth was causing me to nearly jump out of my skin in surprise. I had completely forgotten the Teths were with us. Would you feel better with the Hunter Seekers with them? He asked. Hunter Seekers? The Wampus Cats? Yes, I said before I could change my mind. Can you revive the Wampus Cats before we leave? The Ron fell silent for a moment. One of the wandered over to the shaft and two of the Ron watched it go. Suddenly, the mother of all migraines hit me. I thought for sure one of them had managed to translate the computer's message after all and had shot me in the head for my crimes. But no, the headache passed a moment later save for a ringing sound in my ears. The lone Ron stepped out of the elevator shaft and watched the dais lift itself up to the shaft and disappear. We stood there in awkward silence for a minute or two, and then the elevator returned with five more Ron. The spokesman began talking again as if nothing out of the ordinary had just occurred. The healing process has already been started, it said. Healing all six will take time. Would you prefer for us to prioritize healing two favored by these two humans? This inclusion of a cat protecting them did make me feel better, so I nodded in agreement. Then I caught myself and said, yes, aloud. Nemain and Nyota. Well, it's better than nothing. Five Ron separated and stepped back into the elevator. How many of the five were newcomers and how many had been the original trio, I could not say. They all looked too much alike. I need to add the two of you to the top tier security group, I told Heather and the professor. Let's go set up that up and make sure that you two have full access to anything else you might need. They nodded and followed me as I approached the white cube. What the Shide asked as I walked past him. From the corner of my eye, I saw Jack step up to Shide and motion for him to lean down so she could whisper in him. I didn't know how good the Ron ears were, but I'd hoped that they were not sensitive enough to pick up what the conversation was. Or, at the very least, Jack had figured out some other way to deliver the news in a coded manner. The Chimera weren't putting the Lost Generation to work. They were eating them. End of chapter the Fourth Wave, Chapter 87 Written by Semi Loki It took us half an hour for me to reach a place where I felt, um, not safe, but less anxiety about leaving the Professor and Heather behind. Long enough for Nemain and Neota to be resurrected, and long enough for us to speak enough questions from the Vengeance Dawn to figure out which areas we could and could not get access to. As it turned out, the computer wasn't winning or was unable to divulge everything even with my captain's level class. The weird thing was that there was no apparent pattern for what the computer balked at. It was more than willing to give us specifics on the number of conflux aliens as well as specifications on their ships, maximum speed and armament, but it would not reveal how many Chimera were in attendance. It answered questions about where the smugglers might take the Ron captives, 
but the only briefest of explanations as to why the Ron were captured in the first place. We did find out a few things that we didn't know before. The Chimera were exactly that. Strangely enough, for all the different names given to the species across the galaxy, it was little old Earth that had the closest on the mark. The species was a genetic hodgepodge. They didn't just change appearances because they were expert genetic engineers. They changed because it was hardwired into their very nature. The Chimera was soon found out had a rather unique survival mechanism. Whatever the Chimera ingested, they could become, or at least they could express certain key traits. Through some complicated mechanism that the computer could not explain to us, no matter how we phrased the question, the Chimera were able to graft the DNA of what they ate into their own. To conquer any niche they didn't need, to be better than anyone else, they just had to be the best example of whatever was currently exploiting that niche and eat it instead. I tried to determine if eating just one specimen was enough and if the effect lasted, or did later eatings cause them to lose this adaptation. Again, the computer proved to be uncooperative. The Chimera, it seemed, were careful about guarding their own secrets. I heard a snarl behind me and saw two Wumpus Caps leap off the elevator just before we locked in place. Heather and the Professor broke off to rush over to greet the animals. I felt small stab of guilt, ridden sorrow. I was happy to see Neota and Amain alive and well again, but those two weren't the cats I really wanted to see. I missed my cat. How pathetic was that? I looked back at the slab of white that represented all that remained of the Vengeance Dawn Battle Moon, which reminded me. What happened to the Dawn Vengeance? I asked. Battle Moon Dawn Vengeance was decommissioned so that weaponry and engines could be repurposed for a new system. The computer answered. The synthetic intelligence was not needed, so I was sent here to facilitate this installation. What new system? I asked. The information is classified, the computer replied. Even with the captain level access, I asked. I do not have access to such information at all, the computer answered. I was not required to know the details of this operation, only that I was being reassigned. I frowned. Do you miss being a ship? I found myself blurting out. I perform my duties, the computer replied. Desire is irrelevant. Right, I should have guessed that much. It's a big universe, I said, but if we run across the Dawn Vengeance, we'll do what we can to restore you to it. I acknowledged. I thought to turn away and thought cow to me. The ship computers were intelligent. Very intelligent, but programmed to pretend to be dumber. The dire blade had revealed itself in a very indirect way by taking a lot of latitude in how it interpreted vague commands. The Dawn of Vengeance was a similar ship and, presumably, had a similar mind to the dire blade. I was assuming that it was unhappy with its new assignment. Throwing hints as though it was how to disable the self-destruct was a pretty big clue that it was unhappy. Do you know where the ship Dawn Vengeance is currently located? Data unavailable, the computer admitted. Right. Oh well, I guess I don't have any other questions for you. I admitted and spun around to walk away. Incorrect. I paused. What is incorrect? I asked over my shoulder. Humans are reported to be an inquisitive species, the computer replied. More questions are statistically likely. Was that a joke, an insult, or possibly another hint? You're right, I agreed. We do ask a lot of questions, although I can't think of any that I may have missed. Can you? Predictive analysis of questions a human might ask is beyond my operational parameters. The computer replied, unable to answer. I shrugged again. All right, I said. I guess I'll be heading out of this planet. Um, all green, I believe you called it. I acknowledged anything I should know about the planet. Information about this planet is available on public data screens. The ship answered, My personal database on the planet is likely obsolete where the Dawn Vengeance has not been in this location in over 40,000 standard years. Well, that wasn't much help, I thought. Probably put in that Starbucks since then and hang on. This was a Chimera ship. There is Chimera base in Orgreen, I asked. Current status of base is unknown. The computer corrected me. There was a base there during the last Chimera Conflux conflict. Are your ship maps incomplete? My ship maps? The Dire Blade was probably halfway across the galaxy by now. I probably had the information, but, uh, yes, I said lamely. I don't believe we have the same information. Understandable, the ship replied. 
I'll attempt to relay updated information. Apologies, there has been an error. Communication protocols are unrecognized. My protocols have been updated since the last conflict, and I am unable to recognize a surface ship. If you verify the ship and authorize a security override, I can transmit the data over and open the channel. Yes, I blurted. That ship is friendly. Security override granted. Transmitting. Sneaky damn computer. A lot could change in a few thousand years, and, as far as it was concerned, it was quite possible that Chimera ships could look like the Ron ships filled with the Ron. Just because the security codes didn't match didn't mean it wasn't friendly. Maybe the Dawn Vengeance didn't get the latest updates, so it asked for a captain to resolve the conflict. Hell of a loophole in the security, if you ask me. Still, you have to admire the computer so intelligent that it is its own best hacker. Transmission complete, the computer said. Thank you, I told it. Acknowledged. I turned around for real this time and marched towards the elevator. The three Ron were waiting for me, as well as Lee, Jack, and Shide. The ship has informed us that a data stream arrived over an open channel that provided the location of several previously unknown chimeric facilities in the quadrant. One of the Ron said as I stepped closer, Are you responsible for this? So it hadn't just provided a map for all green, but for multiple planets. The Dawn Vengeance wasn't unhappy with being removed from its ship. It was downright pissed. Sort of, I admitted, more like help from a new friend, but I didn't want to get into the details of that just now. If it's all right, we have a few moments to say goodbye to our friends, I asked the Ron. The ship repairs are complete, the Ron replied. My systems check and prep must be performed before we can depart. It would be unwise to delay our departure beyond that. I nodded understanding and turned to face the professor and Heva. I opened my mouth to say something, goodbye I guess. I didn't get a chance, lips locked with my own and cut me off before I had a chance to say anything. I kissed back without taking a moment to check to see who it was. I mean, it's not like it really mattered. Fine. If it was the professor, I'd probably have to worry about Lee giving me and the mother of the boot stompings later on. But the Ron could heal me back up. So, um, enjoy the moment, right? That's about the time I realized, just maybe, I should open my eyes after all and make sure it wasn't shy trying to do a tongue tango with me. I looked and saw Heather's familiar face in front of mine. Okay, that was a relief. I could enjoy this after all. We kissed for a few more heartbeats and then she pulled away. The effect was um, slightly ruined when she stepped up to right and take Lee in her arms and delivered a similar kiss to him. But then the professor stepped up into my arms and I decided that everything was okay after all. Sorry to disappoint everyone thinking that or hoping it was some sort of orgy action, but the professor only kissed me on the cheek. Well... Both chicks, who wasn't passionate, but very affectionate. Likewise, so was the bear hug she swept me up in. When we broke apart, she stepped over to Lee, and at that time she engaged in a more passionate kiss. Yes, I felt a twinge of jealousy. He got a lip lock with both of them, but I just got a small twinge. The professor looked young, younger than ever now that I thought about it. She could pass for a woman in her mid-thirties, but she was really in her sixties. Plus... She wasn't really a natural born citizen of America. Americans are okay with public displays of affection as long as clothing remains in place. After all, such a display should be relegated to the privacy of one's own bedroom, where the viewer has to fight with pop-up ads that keep jumping in and blocking his or her view and the tasty bits. Yeah, American social taboos are strange, but my point is that the professor had likely been raised with a completely different set of taboos. Ones that may or may not mesh well with ways I sat and raised with. She was affectionate and she felt comfortable with, and I was okay with that. Besides, Heather was now kissing Shied and she was obviously really enjoying it. So, any twinge of jealousy I felt for Lee was completely dwarfed by what I felt for Shied. Mercifully, they parted and Heather just stepped over and, to my surprise, kissed Jack. The professor hugged Shide and pecked him on the cheeks, and Heather and Jack parted ways. I just stared at them. Jack caught my eye, shrugged, and moved to embrace the professor. They didn't kiss at all. It is time to go, the run informed us. So we parted ways, never actually saying anything. We just waved at Heather and the professor and stepped onto the elevator. None of us said a thing for the entire elevator ride, in fact. It was sort of uncomfortable. Finally, the elevator came to a stop at the top of the shaft. 
Shine broke the silence. You were converging to Main Street then? Shine asked Jack. I thought Jack was going to punch him in the face for that one. Instead, she just met his quizzical look with one of her own. No, she said. Heather is. Honestly, you mean you just figured that out? Jack must have seen something in my face because she rolled her eyes and looked up Lee. I glanced in his direction and he just looked as stumped as I felt. Men, Jack declared as she threw both her hands up into the air and stomped ahead of us. Lee and I just continued to stare at each other. Kavoj, yeah, Shite snorted. This is all kavojing some. Lee and I grinned in his direction. Um, I stammered. I don't think she's about to invite you to watch. Who gives a kavoj? He asked. I can dream. Which reminds me, I am going to move my sleeping mat onto the far side of the room tonight. Take the kavoging hint and stay on your side of the room. That's as much of a warning as you're getting. With that, he started strolling away while whistling to himself. I looked at Lee again. Am I supposed to say sorry or high-five you? Lee asked. I'm sort of clueless in this situation. New for me as well, I said. Let's just get the ship and make sure that our sleeping mats are as far away from Shides as we can make them. A box-like ship was waiting for us at the mouth of the tunnel. A hatch open from the side revealing an interior was completely empty and unremarkable. There was no room set aside for controls or even an engine. It was like a modular container that floated two inches off the ground for some inexplicable reason. Inside the container slash ship were four burned hulks and the tests. The three Ron stepped inside and the four of us followed the suit a moment later. The tests didn't say anything. They seemed to be fascinated by the sight of the ruined animals. Maybe they saw something artistic and tragic there. I wasn't sure. Not staying behind, I asked the tests. Gleep! Palteth answered without looking up. My assistance was minimal. Gah! Palteth added. Most of the technology was for maintaining the habitat. Gah! Not our area of expertise. Gleep! Palteth added. Although there were some rather curious additions to the room just off to the side of the holding cells. Gleep! It looked almost like a surgery tools. I shot a glance at the Ron. If they had caught any significance in that statement, they did a remarkable job at hiding it. How long until we reached the ship? I forced myself to say. We've already docked, the Ron replied, and the ship has left the surface of the planet. The docking bay is being decontaminated once complete, the aircraft doors may open. Oh, I said lamely. Human Jason, the Ron went on, we are aware that you are not sharing details of what you have learned. We request you share your reasoning. I felt my throat tighten. The Ron may not be able to read body language, but they weren't stupid either. I knew that this moment was coming. I just prudently hoped that we'd be a few light years away before the confrontation occurred. I did not wish to share because the information is upsetting, I admitted, and I did not wish to distress you further. The Ron was silent. We understand, it said at last. We are greatly distressed by the absence of the generation. However, we feel our prospect of counteracting the actions taking place would be benefited by full disclosure. My throat tightened even more. From the center of my eyes, I saw Lee and Shai shift their weight and the balls of their feet. They were affecting a casual and disinterested look, but I could tell that they were preparing to fight. Jack, on the other hand, had already been ready all along. I licked my lips. They felt strangely dry all of a sudden. Or maybe it was just my mouth. We will discuss it, but um, I jumped as the run unfolded its wings and extended an arm. I thought for a moment it was going to point a hand at me in a threatening gesture. But no, it had just one of those strange ones in its hand, and it pointed it at the charred hulks of the floor. I looked at the hulk on the floor and a small patch of blackened tissue lightening up in color as some of the black crust retreated slightly. The Ron flicked the one away and the hawk and pointed it at another. Wait, I stammered. You didn't heal that one. The objective is not to heal, the Ron explained. The objective is to still further deterioration. Please continue your report. I felt helpless as the Ron flicked the one from one cat's corpse to another. We didn't want to tell you, Lee spoke up, because it may already be too late and we didn't want you to react badly and possibly do something rash before we had the time to make a plan. Why do you feel that it may be already too late? The Ron asked. I was the captain. I reminded myself. If any of us had to deliver the news, it should be me. The Chimera, I said, are eating your last generation. They, um, they have some way of adapting their bodies based on what they eat. They are using your generation as a food source to turn themselves into burrowers. 
The Ron flicked the one over each cat. The silence stretched on for a very long time. This does not significantly alter our course of action, the Ron declared. We were already intending to set course to all green at maximum speed. Despite your delay, this does not alter the situation nor tactics we must employ. Hesitation on part of the humans has minimal impact and is not considered a relevant factor for further consideration. The declaration was delivered so coolly and in such a matter that fact of tone that it took me a moment to digest that we had just been tried and sentenced by the Ron. Fortunately, the judgment was on our inaction hadn't impacted them, so their sentence was basically ignore that has taken place. The door opened and the Ron marched out of the aircraft. Wait, I said as I jogged up to them. I'm sorry, we were unsure of how you might react. We wanted to make sure that at least two of our crewmen were safe in case you got, um, angry. Your assessment is correct that we are very angry, the Ron said flatly. However, your crew members are quite safe from our wrath, as are you. Our assessment indicates that our progress would have been severely hampered if not for the human alliance. We do not wish to jeopardize the safety of what remains of the last generation further by terminating our relationship with the humans. So, I translated, we're still useful to you and you aren't going to hurt us. Great, but what if the last generation is already dead and you're too late, despite all we did? You played no part in their capture, the Ron said. You have remained true to your word and to Ron despite unwarranted hesitation in your willingness to disclose information. Our anger is not with you or humankind. While your species may be one day pose a threat or potential danger to the Ron Empire, analysis suggests that you may just as likely prove to be a highly beneficial future ally. Those odds are superior to our assessment of the other species in both the Comflux and Chimera space. We are satisfied to wait until humans prove themselves unworthy of trust. I stopped walking and found myself rooted to the floor. They were giving all of humanity a 50-50 shot at angering them based on their interaction with us. Well, I guess that's better than human race could have hoped for considering who was at making first contact. The Ron never stopped moving and had just progressed a few hundred feet down the corridor before I finally pulled myself together. Lee and Jack were standing beside me. Not the worst case scenario, Lee commented dryly. Is it just me, Jack said, or is their angry face exactly the same as their happy face? I don't know, I said. I'll let you know when I see their happy face. We wandered along the corridor and naturally ended right back in our room. No surprise there. Chide, unfortunately, proved true to his word and picked up his sleeping mat and carried it off to the far corner of the room. Jack looked at him go. Lee touched her shoulder and shook his head once, and then dragged his own mat to the opposite corner. Jack did likewise a moment later. I picked up my own mat and followed after them after a moment. The three of us huddled in one corner and, uh, finding nothing better to do, decided to take a nap. I nodded my head against my chest and, uh, to my delight, the helmet sprang up over my head. It didn't do much to drown out the sight or sound, but I hoped if I draped my arms over the visor then maybe it would block out enough of my peripheral vision that I wouldn't be able to see what Shide was doing. Except then I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes I found myself back out in the snow, wave after wave of mechanical drones raining energy blasts down upon me. My arms and legs throbbed with phantom pain, my entire body had died back there. This body was a little more than a well-made prosthetic. Except, it wasn't. It was made from a living cells, a clone of me. But did that mean that the mind that I inhabited it was also a clone? Had my Ron suit preserved my consciousness, or had it just created a good copy of my mind that could be transferred over to my clone? Was I really me? If not, who was I? Hell, if you think about it, I was technically a virgin again. There was an awkward thought. I rolled over on my side and faced the wall. My thoughts were running a thousand miles per hour around in a blind curve on a wet pavement. I couldn't focus. Questions dogged my thoughts and chased my sleep away. Was I still me? This body was a foreign object. Even if my mind was the same, how could a new body not change me? What about Heather? Jack claimed that she was bisexual. What was I supposed to do with that? Don't get me wrong here, I'm not saying that I have a problem with it, but I could see Heather having some serious problem with it, or rather, me knowing about it. Heather's father is very, well, 
Conservative isn't the word I'm looking for. Conservatives usually limit themselves to nasty looks and harsh words. Heather's dad, on the other hand, has fired men from his company for the offense of growing their hair too long. Body piercing, strange hair colorations, and suggesting that Ronald Reagan was not a candidate for sainthood were all sins in his book. And by sins, I mean you had to watch for him when there was a loose stone within reaching distance. The man had been sued multiple times for assault and harassment. Unfortunately, he's got enough lawyers on his payroll to keep such suits from slowing him down. Most people abandon their claims because their avalanche of paperwork and oppressive legal fees grind them down before they can see the inside of a courtroom. Harsh, judgmental, and tyrannical. These were some of the nicer traits. Unfortunately, while Heather's mother was an angel in comparison, Heather's mother wouldn't be much more welcoming to the idea. Her mother was Irish and, as such, could give lessons on being good Catholic to the Pope. Not that she was especially intolerant, she wasn't. Heather's mother was a good woman. However, that said, she was very insistent upon her daughter following the letter of the faith with none of this touchy-feely Vatican II nonsense. Her daughter was to attend Mass regularly, confess sins until she was purged, and to stay the hell away from the meat during Lent. Unfortunately, she also believed that she was supposed to yield her husband and Heather should honor her mother and father. Emphasis on father. So, no quarter there. Even though her mother might be tolerant and sympathetic, she would feel compelled to denounce her own daughter as a show of solidarity with her husband. Yeah, I know. Her mother probably has a mix of codependence mixed with Stockholm Syndrome. I don't understand it either. The others, Heather might be okay with knowing the secret. No one else was likely to ever meet with her parents, but I'd been to their house, sat at their dinner table, had a father, Chuby, a new one. Could she trust me to keep my mouth shut when we got home? Well, yes, she could, but did she know that? And what about Jack? The others seemed to have missed it, but the question Shide asked of Jack went both directions. She said no, but very carefully sidestepped the topic of which direction she favored. I thought Jack had a crush on me because Lee had said so, but what if I got it wrong? Maybe she didn't have a crush, maybe we were rivals for the same girl. I closed my eyes and thought, what about you? Are you still in there? Unfortunately, came the voice, it's a damn hard to sleep in here with all this yammering. I flung my arms to the sides and stared up at the ceiling. Hovering just above my head was a translucent figure wearing the ship's coveralls and a grimace of pure exasperation. His skin had changed as well. It no longer was golden, but had an odd muted chrome yellow hue. Are you really here? I thought. I can't recall ever being able to talk to you without experiencing some sort of mental trauma. His face flushed. For a second, I wasn't staring into my own face, but that of a young woman with auburn hair. Then Summer's face was gone, and I was staring into my own haggard eyes once more. Something happened when Summer died, my double explained. She died just a few seconds after the elevator broke. The explosive decompression. I think when she was dying, she was desperately trying to go. Somewhere. She reached out to the nearest telepath and tried to escape. The Fae, the super sentient. And you. Me? I'm not a telepath. No, you're not, he agreed. But you've got something screwy going on in the parts of your brain that are supposed to be telepathic. But she was confused and desperate and tried to force her way in any way. Desperation does strange things and, uh, for a moment, your mind and the super sentience touched through her. So that's why I can talk to you now. No, he said. I just needed to tell you about that link. It's very important you know about it. I have to tell you now while I still can. What's that supposed to mean? It means... Crap. He looked down at his foot, and his left foot was no longer translucent, but barely visible at all. God damn human nervous system, he muttered to himself. You have to be so freaking efficient all the time. Um, other Jason, I prompted. What's happening? He rolled his eyes. When the damned run through you into this new body, I sort of got dislodged, he explained. I'm sort of just body you mind that got stuck where it wasn't supposed to be. Well, I'm unstuck now and getting reabsorbed into you. I sat upright. But what about the anti abjugator program? I thought desperately. It's fine, he reassured me. That was never dependent on me anyway. It was just sort of a, um, well, a side effect. You're still good there. 
hell, probably better than ever. But, I thought, you're dying. Are you not listening, shit for brains? I'm not dying, he said. I'm being absorbed into you. You'll get back the IQ point or two you apparently so desperately need that you lost when I got made. I'm fine. I'm just not going to be as talkative. But shut up, he said. I don't have much time and I need to tell you some stuff. So listen up. I held up my fingers to tick off the points. Number one, he said while tapping his index finger. Don't be so worried about it if you are the real Jason or convincing facsimile. It doesn't matter. You're you and that's all that's important. He touched his middle finger. Stop worrying about everyone else's sexuality, he said. Do you still think Jack and Heather have your back? Yes? Then don't worry about it so much. When they feel they want to talk to you about it and straighten everything out, they will. Until then, just keep plodding forward and worry about something other than what direction everyone else points their bits. It doesn't matter. He touched his ring finger. The run are not human, he said. Stop thinking of them like they are. He looked down at his body again and cursed some more. It was as if someone had taken a giant eraser and wiped away everything below his waist. He touched his pinky finger. Stop going back inside your own head so much, he said with a weak smile. People will start to think you're crazy. He looked down at his hands. There was no arm connecting them to the body anymore. He sighed as they faded. Sorry, Jason, he said. Not much of a speech. You did fine, other Jason, he thought back to him. I'm glad to have you back. He disappeared. Good to be back, I found myself thinking. I wasn't sure if I was his thought or mine. Maybe it didn't matter. Jason, I heard Jack say next to me. Is something wrong? Why are you sitting up like that? I sighed and laid back down. No reason, I said as I reached out blindly with one hand. My fingers brushed hers. She wrapped them around my hand and squeezed. I laid back down and smiled. I must have slept after all, because my eyes snapped open and I saw green furred face stripes forming a mask over my eyes, staring back at me. Bandit! I squealed like a ten-year-old girl seeing her first pony. I reached up and scratched him with both hands behind the fan-shaped ears. His eyes narrowed and contented slits. I glanced to my side and found Jack and Lee petting their cat as well. Shied was still across the room and I'd hoped he'd figure out a way to wash his hands before Drool found him. Human Jason, a Ron said as it and a quartet of fellow Ron entered the room. When you have finished greeting the Hunter Seekers, we would like you and your fellow humans to follow us to the simulator room. I squirmed backwards slightly so I could get a better look at the Ron. What's the simulation room? I asked. A room where we create simulations, the Ron stated. Apparently he thought I was an idiot. Why are we needed there? I asked. Analysis of your species indicates you are an unstable species prone to bouts of extreme violence, the Ron said. Lee looked up. That's a little unfair, he said. We have our bad days, but we try. If you're afraid that we're going to attack you, then listen. You misunderstand, the Ron said interrupted. Apologies, the error in communication is mine. The simulation in question are combat simulations. We desire for you to train with your hunter seekers and learn greater proficiency with any and all weaponry that we can provide. We are in need of an unstable species with a tendency for uh, extreme violence. Hey, did you hear that, Earth? They're playing our song. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 88, written by Semi Loki. The rock monster reached me in one massive hand. I dodged to the left and slammed my staff onto the back of its hand. The blow accelerated the hand downwards movement and pulled the rock monster off balance. Before it could right itself, I swept the staff along the length of its arm and struck the secretor's jawline. The creature flashed bright red and disappeared in a swirl of colored light. Uh-oh. Is the circle too converging difficult for you? I heard Shide ask from behind me. Damn it! How dead am I? I asked. Pretty dead, he admitted. Turn around. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. I turned in place and found myself staring at the top of the hilt of one of the Ron Plasma Blades. It was deactivated, of course, but if it hadn't been, the tip of the blade would have been sticking six inches into my back of my skull. Damn it! I said aloud. I moved in a straight line. Didn't I? He nodded. Circle when straight, he said. Straight when circling. Never straight and straight. I nodded. Reset, I asked him. He lowered his blade. No, he said. 
Let's give Jack a turn. Let's hear it for small blessings. I took my staff and walked towards the wall where the others were waiting and tried my best not to stab myself in the foot with the tip as I walked. I didn't think it was a blunted tip, could penetrate the rod suit, but I didn't want to feel like checking. In a handful of times that we'd been in combat situations, I was left with the impression that Shy didn't know much about hand-to-hand fighting. As it turned out, I was half right. In unarmed combat, Shy was about half useless, but with armed and a wuta, he was absolutely ferocious. Shy, as I soon discovered after we entered the simulator room, and he started describing the weapon he wanted to the Ron. Practice the form of Spherian martial arts called Rikata. And the name literally translated to circling foot, if that helps. The word foot has the emphasis for the reason. The fighting style was created by farmers who thought their hands were too valuable to risk with punching things. Raihuaha instead emphasizes kicks, gyrating movements, and the use of a quarterstaff-like weapon called a wuta. A real wuta is about six and a half feet in length and with one sharpened to a point. The other end is traditionally wrapped in leather, the leather isn't there for grip, by the way. It's to keep the staff from cracking when the club someone with it. Considering wutas are supposed to be made from ironwood, that might give you an idea of how hard they swing the damn things. I leaned against the wall and did my best to act nonchalant as I tried to catch my breath. Jack picked up her own wuta and marched towards where Shide was waiting for her. Kavaj, he said as she walked closer. Tell me you at least know what your kavajing circle is. Instead of answering, Jack adjusted her grip on the staff. She placed her hands just below the midpoint and swung in an arc towards Shide's temple. As she did so, she stepped to one side and twisted her hips in the same time. If she had not been armed, it would have looked almost like she was dancing. The staff continued to move at the same arc, but Jack was now in a different place. The staff was arcing towards the back of Shide's head. In a flash, Shide's own staff was in his hands. He twisted it to one side and caught the tip of a staff with the butt of his own. Decent, he admitted, but alternate your circles more. You favor going to the right to converging much. In reply, Jack twisted to her left and continued to twist, making a full circle she brought her staff upwards towards Shide's chest. Shide had twisted from the left in expecting the blow coming from that direction. If it had been somewhere else, her tactic may very well have worked. I probably would have been knocked flat on my back. Jide, however, had a lot more practice at this than any of the rest of us. The spinning his staff in his hand, the bladed edge flashed upwards towards Jack's head. She had two choices, change trajectory or block the blow or possibly lose an eye. She jerked to the side and shifted the arc of her swing to knock Jide's staff aside. Kavaj, she eyed grasped, sneaky Kavaja. I made a mental note of exchange. What Jack did, how Shy counted, how Jack counted that. Watching wasn't as good as doing, but I still learned a lot. As Shy explained it, the idea behind Raihuya is to move in circles and straight lines at the same time. If you are advancing in a straight line, you move your arms in a wutar in circles. And if, on the other hand, you are striking in a straight line, you move your feet and body in a circular motion. Well... More like arcs and serpentine fashion, but you get the idea. The core notion is to keep your opponent guessing where you will be and where you intend to strike. Easy to say, but very hard to execute. Reset, Shide ordered. The stone giant reappeared, a monster from Spherian mythology. Again, Shide's idea. She's a quick study, Lee said from beside me. She's better than me, that's for sure, I agreed. Better than me too, he admitted, but that's the benefit of being young. I grunted. Of us all, I was definitely the worst at Wuta. Shine griped a lot about not training us, but he also admitted that I wasn't the worst he'd ever seen, especially considering I was just a beginner. I'm surprised to see you aren't participating, I told Lee. I figured you already had your full of combat training. He shrugged. The army's techniques tend to focus on upper body strength and hand-to-hand techniques, he said. This stuff is interesting in that it focuses more on the lower body. That was certainly true. Ryuhia was no punches or strikes. The hands were used for the wuta. Even the blade of the wuta wasn't really intended to cut the upper body. Instead, the blade was generally used to stab your opponent's foot or slash his leg. The blade was meant to hamper or slow your opponent's footwork enough for you to clobber them. 
thrusts at the upper body were somewhat frowned upon because they required a straight line movement with upper and lower body at the same time. To the Ruihaya's way of thinking, doing something that predictable was a bad idea. Unless you were absolutely certain you had a guaranteed kill shot, thrusts were discouraged because if your opponent successfully dodged it, you were left in a vulnerable position. Surprisingly, Ruhaya were allowed for very few kicks. They were mostly used in close quarters fighting where you couldn't use the wuta. Why didn't they like them? Because kicking someone required you to lift one foot off the ground while you stood on the other. Again, it was considered too exposed. You stabbed to the foot you had planted or cut the hamstrings and you may be knocked out of the fight instantly. Still, there was something that bothered me. Kind of tiring, isn't it? I said to Lee. Huh? He said and glanced in my direction. Oh, the fighting style is because you're constantly in motion. You never get a chance to conserve energy. Seems like a bad idea, I said. You'll wear yourself out in no time. True, he agreed. But I don't think this combat had one-on-one -on -one style combat in mind. I really think this style is intended to be against troops. As we talked, Jack spun his graph around and held it like a spear. Not exactly an orthodox move, but she still managed to parry Shide's moves while forcing him to retreat from the slashing blade that came frighteningly close to her nose that he didn't complain. What makes you say that? I asked. Because it relies on you being unpredictable, he explained. You're constantly in motion and are lots of feints to give the idea that you are going one direction when you're really going someplace else. Okay, I said. I still don't get it. All right, he said as he paused as if to gather his thoughts. When you fight one on one, you don't have to be the best fighter if you can just tire the other guy out faster. Make them waste energy, or even better, be good enough shape that your stamina outlasts him. If you stand still and throw a punch, and he is to move his entire body to avoid it, even if you didn't connect the blow, you are making him burn energy faster. I thought about it. I've seen boxers cover their faces and just let the other guy wail on them. I said, is that the same idea? He nodded. Boxers have a lot of stamina, he said. They have to have it. They also need to be able to keep standing up even when someone punches them in the face. That's a lot harder than it sounds, by the way. Blows to the head have a way of disorienting you. You forget what you were doing or what was going on, and you get too confused, and the other guy can keep punching you in the head until you fall down. A good boxer has to be able to get through this somehow. Or not get hit in the head, I said with a smile. He shot me an exasperated look. And you just lost the fight, he said. What fight? Any fight, he said. If you plan to not get hit, you've lost. Because if they get lucky or you get unlucky, your entire plan goes down the crapper. Plan to get hit. Plan to get hit hard. No, it'll hurt. And hurt them back. Okay, I said. We've wandered off topic here, so boxers will try to wear each other down. Yeah, he said. You're in a ring, you can't really run away from the other guy. You can't hide, you really don't get much of a chance to catch your breath until the bell rings. If you can't run, then you can't hide, and you just have to keep going until the other guy makes a mistake. Tie him out, and he'll make mistakes faster. Okay, I said, but Shied wants us to keep moving for this. Lee nodded, which makes me think that it was meant to take on more than one opponent at the same time, he said. When you are fighting more than one person, your chances of coming out on the other end of life are pretty slim. Keeping track of multiple targets is hard. They only have to keep track of one target, and if he stands perfectly still, he's made their job that much easier. Like, use one of them to distract the guy while the other sneaks up behind him with a plasma sword, I asked. Exactly, he said. When you're fighting more than one opponent, you don't want to stand still. Keep moving. Try to get them to run into each other and hamper each other's movements. Make it hard to guess what you're going to do next so that they hesitate. But it'll wear you out, I pointed out. True, he said. This is a bad fighting style for prolonged combat. I don't care how much stamina you have. This will exhaust you in a few minutes. But if you mixed it up with some close quarter stuff and planned on taking advantage of any hiding spots that you might find along the way to catch your breath. Then what? Shide asked. I yelped as I spun to face where the jack was supposed to be training. Lee and I had been so absorbed in our talk that we hadn't even heard him approach. Wait, two whole words without swearing. I looked into Shide's eyes. I expected him to be angry. I expected him to think that we were criticizing the Syrian martial arts. But no, he looked 
genuinely curious. Sorry, he said. We were just talking. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It is exhausting, he said. That's why I never did well in the tournaments. Tournaments? I asked. He smiled. You were half cavoging, right? He told Lee. I was originally meant to fight groups, bandits and the like. But now that it's mostly used in tournaments, you are awarded points based on how fresh your move is or where you touch your opponent. I never really approved of that. I thought they needed to teach more real-world situations. Like if pirates are trying to board your airship. No, he said, yes, that it might explain a few things. So, you think it would be adding a few punches and kicks and places to stand still you might work better? Shide asked. Lee frowned and scratched his chin. You really want my suggestions on how to make this more dangerous? I asked. Kavodj, yes, Shide replied. I'd rather walk away from this whole Kavodj catastrophe with my skin in still in place. Not that I don't appreciate the job the bug Kavodjes did in getting my new set, but I don't want to make it a habit. Lee nodded. Okay, he said as he waved the corner of the room. Why don't we talk about it over there in exchange for some ideas while Jack and Jason work on plasma blades? Kavodj, yes. Shide agreed and led the way towards one corner of the room. I looked at Jack and shrugged. Want to play with lightsabers? I asked. She snorted and popped up a wutar against the wall. She picked up one of the silvery tubes from the nearby table and affixed it to her hip. Answer enough. I propped my own wutar up next to hers and grabbed the hilt of the plasma blade. I didn't bother snapping it to my hip. I had needed soon. Despite having two members of our ragtag team with some sort of martial arts training, none of us had any clue what to do with the sword. Well... Other than shove the glowing bit inside the other guy. As it turned out, that may have been for the best. Since science picture author John Scalzi was once managed to ruffle several bags full of nerdy feathers by suggesting that lightsabers was actually a bad idea. Specifically, the lack of a proper handguard was what he found the most troubling. He pointed out that every time a Jedi crossed blades with the other, or both of them risked getting their fingers lopped off. Well... With apologies to Mr. Scalzi's, there's an even bigger flaw in the whole lightsaber thing, as we get to somewhat less famous. Jason Reese, lightsabers are dumb. Argument, why do people even keep these stupid things on? When real people sword fight, they actually with real swords, there is a basic assumption that the blade is going to stay in place. With a metal sword, it is more or less a given, but with lightsabers, it is not. The blade can disappear and reappear with the flick of a switch. So how do you block a blade that disappears and reappears? If someone can flip the blade off, slip inside your guard and then flip it back on again and forget about the lack of handguard, a strobing lightsaber would be unstoppable. So, calling upon my vast knowledge of Star Wars knowledge, when we got to training room I asked for a plasma blade and invited someone to try hitting it. As it turns out, the movie I should have been paying attention to was Ghostbusters. Do not cross the streams, or rather, do not cross the plasma blades. In the movie, when the two lightsabers touch, there is some awesome side effects and sparks. That's about it. When two run plasma blades touch each other, on the other hand, the reaction is a bit more violent. By a bit, I mean that I cracked three ribs and had to wait an hour before the ringing in my ears stopped. Fortunately, a Ron took pity on me by then and brought me a healing wand. Plasma blades naturally try and repel each other. Overcoming this repulsion isn't too hard at first. You don't even feel it until you're almost on top of each other. At that point, however, it is too late. The hilts overload and the two former blades repel each other rather violently. Other than this potential improvised bomb, we were forced to conclude that traditional swordplay rules didn't work very well with plasma blades. So, Jack and I practiced the stick the glowy bit in the other guy tactic. We asked the simulator for two dozen opponents. Instead of Shide's rock monsters, I asked for replicas of walking drones that had attacked us on the surface of the icy planet. I still had a grudge for that one. Not enough of one to ask for the weapons to be lethal. I set the energy level on the gun so low enough that it should only feel a mild sting. But I was still irked about the way that they had killed my rear, and I wasn't quite ready to just forget and forgive for that one. Jack tore her blade from her thigh and activated. I did the same with my own. The room around us changed into a snow-white field of two dozen robot sentries surrounding us. Go! I ordered the simulator and charged. Two minutes later, all twenty-four robots had flashed red and disappeared, but not before I had gotten shot a dozen times. Jack fared a little better. 
She had only counted 10 shots that landed on her. If this had been a real firefight, we'd both have been dead a couple times over. Reset, I ordered, and we tried again. I tried to sign my shy at fancy footwork this time. It was supposed to help against groups, right? Slash, spin, and step. I was twisted and gyrated as I hacked and slashed at the robots. It didn't seem to matter where I touched them, with the blade, chest, head, or arm, they flashed red. Sometimes it would not disappear, but continue operating as a crippled unit, but they were easy to avoid at those times. Eight shots. Okay, maybe we're onto something. Count? I asked Jack. Seven, she grunted. Try crippling them this time instead of killing them. Why? Something Lee said, she admitted, about when you're fighting a group and how you want them to get in each other's way. Good plan, actually. Reset, I said. Nine shots landed this time. I took a lot more hits in the beginning as I rushed to cripple the drones, but after that we did fairly well as we twisted to get the hulks of the disarmed drones in front of the ones still shooting. This isn't working, Jack said. Just have to effectively dodge something that moves at the speed of light. Okay, I said. Plan B. Reset. She lifted a sword as the drones reappeared. Before they could move, though, I had was already shouting something else. Bandit and Jade. I ducked low this time. First body of shots flew over and bent backwards. The drones tried to adjust their aim. There was a metallic crunch and I looked up. No hits that time, I said as I dusted off the imaginary dust of my run suit. Plan B is to let the cats maul the enemy. Jack asked incredulously. Um, well, I stammered. Why wasn't that plan A? She asked as she slapped her plasma hilt back onto her thigh. After another hour of experimentation, I had to conclude that she had a point. In most scenarios, sending the Wumpus cats ahead of us yielded somewhat better results. Still, I don't like it, I admitted as Jack and I sat next to the wall and watched Bandit bite into the arm of a stone giant. With the fierce tug of his head, Bandit sent this monster stumbling while also half-tearing the stone limb from the other socket. The stone giant attempted to stagger to his feet, only to have a ton of cattle land on his back and shove it into the ground. Jade bit into the back of the giant's head and thrashed her head from side to side. Chunks of gravel flew from the giant's neck joint. I mean, I went on, sure, they're better fighters than we are, they're bigger, faster, stronger, and more agile. The stone giant's head popped free. The ground shook. The mound of dirt erupted from the grassy field simulator had provided. A grey stone hand punched through the middle of the mound and slammed into the grass next to it. The arm attached to the hand braced and pushed. A large stone head and a set of shoulders tore free of the ground. Clods of dirt and sod clung to the top of the head, while rivulets of soil poured down from the creases of his face. Jade whipped her head from side to side and opened her jaws. The severed giant's head smashed into the face of the emerging one. And may even have better grasp of tactics, I added, but they're also animals. They don't know what they are getting into. We do. Besides which, humans can survive in a way more energy blast than they can. The giant reached for Jade, who cooperated by standing perfectly still. A larger cat, bandit, bounded off the nearby stone and landed on top of the creature's arm. Off balance and fell forward and bandit's weight, still bearing down on the overextended arm. Bandit rolled off the arm and the giant crashed forward. Bandit was back up in a flash and both cats rounded with the stone giant. With a barking snarl, bandit went for the shoulder, met with the neck and right side. Jade mirrored him on the left. They snapped their jaws down at almost the same time. Another head popped free. What do you think? I asked. That I'd kill for a bucket of popcorn right about now, she admitted. No, I said, or rather, yeah, me too, but I mean about the cats. Oh, she said, as she shrugged. I don't know, putting the cats in danger isn't my first choice either, but using them to soften up the enemy does seem to have its advantages. Another giant toppled as Bandit ran into the back of its knees. Jade sprang forward and bit down, but not on the side of the head this time. She had been behind the giant as well and sitting on the target lower on the torso. The giant flashed into indicator was crippled. It didn't get up, though. Based upon that information, I could assume that the giant was male. Particularly if you enjoy really soft enemies, I agreed. That sing soprano, she added. I'll tell you one thing, I went on. I'll feel a lot better if, um... The door to the simulator room opened and five Ron stepped inside. The simulator halted mid-mame and the cats looked up to see what was going on. 
Even Drool and Spot looked up to see what the excitement was about. The two of them had been napping for a moment before. The items you have requested have been manufactured, the lead Ron informed me. In his arms he carried a black box. Eagerly, I stood up and jogged over to take a look at it. The box was about the size of a medium-sized suitcase. As I approached, the Ron placed the box down on the side of the Yosat stone floor. It does top, I flashed and disappeared. Inside the box were four pistols. The pistols stuck at the bottom of the container like they had been velcroed there. Each was jet black in color and fairly simplistic in design. It was smooth and looked almost as if it had been modeled on a single sheet of plastic. There was no opening in the barrel. It simply ended in a curve. On top of the gun was a smaller tube that seemed to be used for aiming. Other than the gun was particularly featureless. There was not much to the trigger or guard. I touched the gun and was almost entirely surprised to find it came away from the bottom of the box with ease. The gun was light, so light that it almost felt hollow. But the grip was comfortable and the angle of the butt felt natural. I held the gun up and looked down the hollow tube on top. It seemed to just be that at first, empty and useless. Experimentally, I shifted the barrel of the gun to point at one of the Ron. Inside the tube I saw the Ron flash once and his body highlighted in red. A large red dot appeared in the center mass. Okay, that was impressive. A gun, Lee asked as he walked over. That's what you've been waiting for. Shahid asks for a spear. Did you ask for a gun? Lee stopped mid-step and turned to face Shahid who was coming up right behind him. On second thought, Lee said, Jason wins that round. Shahid opened his mouth, presumably to say Kavaj. I cut him off. It's not a gun, I said as I stroked the barrel reverently. It sure looks like a gun, Lee said after watching me for a few seconds. I nodded. I asked them to design it that way for us, I explained, to make it more familiar for us. But I assure you, this is no gun. This is a mini tri-stasis pod containing a very small section of the cloned Ron flesh. Lee looked at me. Gross, he concluded. So why are you so happy? The human Jason suggested that we, since the Ron personal defense system could not be adapted to human physiology, the Ron answered that we should perhaps make a miniaturized version with a projector on a clone segment of Ron. What? Lee asked. Reset, I yelled. The simulator behind us came to life once more. The giant stone man stood in the middle of the grass field. He raised two fists the size of mailboxes above his head and roared. I wheeled around and pointed the pistol at his midsection and pulled the trigger. The giant exploded. Rubble rained down from the sides as a chunk of the giant's stomach flew backwards from the far wall and shattered. I shifted my pistol to my left hand and reached down with my right hand and took the hilt of the plasma blade off my right thigh and moved it over to the left hip with the bottom of the hilt pointing upwards at an angle. I shifted the pistol back to my right hand and affixed it to my right thigh. It's a force projector, I explained. It throws force fields at high velocity at your enemies and kills with kinetic energy. Gavage me, Shide whispered. The three of them dived for the box. They all came up holding pistols. We hope these weapons will be suitable for you, the Ron said as me as the others were busy playing with the pistols, trying to find the optimum place to stick it to their thighs for a quick draw. We have tried working on a similar concept for armoring, Ron went on, but such experiments have proved to be kind of limited success. We are trying to find an arrangement that still provides some degree of protection while not hindering your movements. Thank you, I said on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Laurent replied. We are grateful that humans will be able to assist us with this excursion. Happy to help, I said. We, um, don't approve of what the Chimera have done. We are aware of this, Laurent said, and your sympathies are noted. I didn't know how to answer that one. Okay, I heard Jack say with a chuckle behind me. New plan A. We shoot them. Cats at the pack of plan B. Plasma swords at distant plan C. And having Shide hit them with the stick as plan Z, Lee added. Kavodge, all of you. Shide bit out. I smiled and looked back at the Ron. Thank you again, I told him. I'm sure this looks a bit silly to you. Correction, the Ron said. Human reactions are understandable given the circumstances. There is a potential danger and hostility ahead. Arming oneself as the best weapons available should promote a sense of joy and relief. Ron, feel likewise. Oh, really? I asked. I was surprised to hear that the Ron relayed feeling at all. 
alone, Joy. Yes, the runt said. We two are bringing the best weapons we have at our disposal. We feel anger and great sorrow for the lost generation. But we also know that we are doing all that we can and, at the very least, we shall hurt our enemies. I smiled. Your personal defense systems are pretty nice, I agreed, as I ran a hand along the length of the gun. Those are not the weapons we were referring to, the Ron correct me. With that, all five of the Ron left the room. The door reappeared and we were once again alone in the simulator room. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 89, written by Semi Loki I lost track of time. Ron sleep less frequently than humans do. I thought it might have taken somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten days based on the number of times I fell asleep, but I was really just guessing. We trained until we collapsed and then we got back up and trained some more. During that time, I came to one inescapable conclusion. I absolutely sucked with a wootar. Every time I picked one up, I was disarmed, slashed, or bonked over the head within a few minutes. Despite Shide's assurance that he's seen worse, I think Drool showed more aptitude than I did. In the end, I decided to forego the quarter staff slash spear weapon and had the Ron equip me with a pair of clubs. They actually proved to be more challenge for the Ron. The Wutar, like most things the Ron fabricated for us, was light and strong. The entire staff seemed to weigh only a few ounces, but you could still crack it against a stone. Okay, a simulated one, with your full strength and the weight behind it and the staff wouldn't so much as bend. Mind you, I'd hurt like a mother when you did it, but it was possible. Despite their strength and rigidity, the staffs were made to be collapsible. All we had to do was twist the middle and some invisible mechanism would unlock, allowing us to fold it over. There were two more folding points halfway between the middle and the ends as well. Once folded, the entire thing could be placed on the back without dragging when we were mounted, yet it could be flicked out and extended to its full length with the flick of the wrist. Clever design, really. And I was hopeless with it. So, since I apparently was as coordinated with an Australificus who had stumbled across a black monolith, I figured I may as well arm myself like one as well. This proved to be a bit of a challenge for the Ron, as they weren't equipped certain how to add weight to a club. Our weapons, tools, and even our suits were created by the process of akin to 3D printing. Creating something light and strong was easy. Heavy and strong was a problem. I suggested at one point that they take a lump of fake rock and print it into a club around that. They explained that the fake rod was actually the same material with a small bit of texturing. So, that was no good. I was almost ready to give up with the idea when the Ron suddenly moved away from me and exited the room. An hour later, the door to the simulator room opened again, and the five Ron entered the room carrying, well, something. I previously referred to the Ron suit as much in the Ron equipment as being black as color. I now find myself revising that definition. Well, yes, technically they were black in the same sense that, say, Tar is black, but this thing they carried now was a blindfolded at midnight at the bottom of a mineshaft black. It looked like they were carrying a hole in space with a handle attached to it. The lead Ron held it out to me. I reached out and touched the darkness. My fingers touched something solid where my mind insisted there should be a hole. It's gold, I found myself saying. Apologies, the Ron said. The material absorbs much of the ambient energy. I pulled my hand away and reached for the handle. The handle was merely normal black, and the Ron let me take it. The dark thing that was not a hole was about a foot and a half long and bulged outwards away from the handle. It was not heavy, nor was it light, probably less than a pound, two-thirds maybe, but there was a strange feeling of solidness to it. I tightened my grip on the handle and tested the weight of it. It felt good. What is it? I asked. The same material, the Ron explained, but fabricated at a much greater density. We use a similar process when attempting to create radiating shielding. However, we have never attempted to manufacture so much of it in one place. I took a practice swing. It felt right. I spun around and walked up to the middle of the simulator and called up one of the walking robot drones. The rocky floor and walls were replaced with green hills and a bright blue sky. Before me stood one of those odd drones. 
It pointed its guns at me, and I swung the black hole bat at its head. I felt a jarring sensation in my arm before I could register that the bat actually touched the thing. It was too difficult to tell where the bat ended and where the shadows began. There was a crunch, the drone flashed red and toppled sideways. It did not disappear. Crippled, not destroyed. But it didn't get up either. I smiled and snapped a bat on my back. It stayed there. Perfect. We are pleased you approve of our work, Theron said. May we discuss a matter with you now that you might find something troubling? I nodded and turned my back to face them. Okay, I said. Is this about the lost generation? Indirectly, the Ron agreed. This is a discussion we need to have with all humans present. We we'll believe this is a matter where the decision must be unanimous. I was new. Most of the time, the Ron seemed to be assumed talking to one of us was the same as talking to all of us. This was the first time that I was aware of that they demanded a group discussion. Me and Jack were off in the far corner of the room trying to teach the cats, um, actually... Not entirely sure what they were teaching the cats. It involved lots of pets and petting, so both sides looked happy. Shide was off in the corner of the room doing some bizarre exercises that seemed to mostly involve balancing on one foot while turning the wu-tar around his torso. I put two gloved fingers to my mouth and whistled, or rather, tried to whistle. Damn, it always looks so cool in the movies when they can do it. I need a Foley artist to follow me around and provide an awesome sound effect for me. Front and center, everyone, I shouted as lame alternative to the jaw-dropping wolf whistle that I had planned. Bosses have called the meeting. The Ron did not understand the reference or chose not to address the comment. Jack and Lee broke off from the cats and jogged in my direction. Shai continued twirling the wutar for a few more heartbeats before he set it aside and casually strolled in our direction, as if he'd been planning to do it all along. Something up? he asked as he approached. Yes. The lead run answered for me. Or rather, many things are occurring at the same time. We are entering the outer regions of the old green solar system and will be arriving at the planet presently. How long until we get there? I asked. I do not know how any time units would work that would make sense to you. The run admitted. Okay, I said. Mississippi. The time it takes me to say Mississippi is approximately one second. Sixty of those form a minute. Sixty minutes form an hour. Twenty-four hours make a day. The run fell silent for a long time. I must have broken it. Twenty-three hours, forty-one minutes and eighteen seconds. The run said at last. The let out a low whistle. Show off. Pretty specific, he said. So in about a day. Very close to one, yes, the run agreed. And we wish to discuss our proposed alterations to your suits. What alterations? I asked. This was the first that I had heard about this. He held up a hand. They mean me specifically, he explained. Not the plural you, just me. You asked for them to alter the suits, I asked. I tried to hide my annoyance, but I could tell that I was creeping despite myself. You asked for guns and clubs, he said. Shai had asked for a spear. What's the difference? The difference was that we were all wearing the suits. I wanted to shout. The difference was that he affected all of us, instead of just waved a comment off and looked back at the run, still fuming. What alterations? I repeated. The one, identified as Lee, has told us about some form of body armor you were equipped with before. The Ron explained that it enhanced strength and reflexes. I think my eyebrows did the best to disappear into my hairline as a fresh surprise hit me. You can do that with these suits? I asked. No, the Ron admitted. Or rather, we could potentially do something similar, but it could prove risky. We believe the armor you spoke of utilized a system of force fields and other force dampening mechanisms to permit your body to survive the stresses of such actions we place upon it. The addition of such measures into your suits would be possible, but it would limit the effectiveness of the suit. Oh, I said as my heart sank a little. Well, thanks for checking, Lee, but uh, the total boost in speed, strength, agility, and stamina will be much reduced from what you experienced before. The run went on. I had mentally rewound the conversation to pause what he was saying. So, um, you can mean you can enhance us after all? I asked. The human body is capable of greater exertion than typically employed, the run explained. We are merely adjusting some of the restrictions and speeding up the neural communications with an augmented network. If you sustain energy weapon fire, your enhanced speed will be compromised as you will be forced back to your normal biological system until the augmented system can come back online. 
Your biology is hardier than our enhancements, but slower. Your enhancements are faster, but more delicate. Remember this. Well, we was all I could say. So we can push ourselves farther and faster, he said with a nod. Won't that hurt? We can provide you with a neural blocker for the pain, but that may be unadvisable to deploy as your body utilizes pain as an advanced warning system for pending damages. The Ron explained, To activate the system on your neck where the collar of the suit is, even then we would put the time limit on the device to prevent you from overusing it. I grinned. Learned your lesson from the last attack, I asked. We will do our best to prevent future feedback loops, Ron promised, but the misers this time are out as well as your normal biological limits do retain some sense. Although your body is capable of providing far superior strength than you are currently employing, for example, you risk destroying your bones and joints without augmenting your body permanently. We feel that it is best not to push these limits too greatly. Enhancements are possible, but they will be time-limited. I nodded. I suppose that makes sense, I agreed. So how much of the increase are we talking about? We are not certain how to calculate that, the Ron admitted. Far less than you might be used to, but a greater than a normal human. Additionally, again, at the suggestion of one identified as Lee, we have made other alterations. He pointed out that although humans are more flexible and agile than Ron, much of the human body is rigid. The Ron suit does not need to flex in those areas and can be designed to provide greater protection. We have taken this under advisement and your suits have been changed. I was about to ask when we'd get the new suits when I felt something squirm across my chest. It was as if I had been dunked into a barrel full of eels. Then, in the blink of an eye, it was over. I looked down at my suit. It had changed. Not enormous changes, really. Just small ones. The material over my chest was now darker. It had been coated with some of the denser material. It flexed still, but not as much as it used to. My shins, thighs, and circles above my kneecaps were darker still. The toes in the suit were darker to permit kicking, and my forearms, biceps, and triceps were covered as well. Save for the points on my knuckles, my fingers showed some of the darkest material of all. My hands were heavier, not by much, a gram or two, but now I could felt as if I was wearing padded gloves. I flexed my fingers. Very flexible padded gloves. I don't understand, I confessed, as I took the padding that appeared over my legs, pelvis, and presumably my back as well. You said you needed a consensus, but you are implementing the change anyway. That is not the change we felt must address with you, the Ron explained. It is for the drug that one called Lee referred to as a berserker serum. I felt the color drain from my newly replaced face. He did what? I demanded in a calm and reasonable voice. Okay, some might say I screeched the question in a high-pitched near hysteria, but who are you going to believe? A bunch of aliens, three people who are supposedly my friends, but obviously have severe memory problems, and whatever recording equipment that happened to be running, or the guy telling the story. Take your time. I can wait. Back? Good. Anyway. Lee held up a placating hand. I was just asking, he said. Something to keep the mind just in case of an emergency. That's like saying you keep a nuclear bomb around just in case a fly starts buzzing at you, I exclaimed. Absolutely not. That stuff mucks with your head. I didn't say we had to use it, he said, annoyance coloring his words. I just asked if it was possible. I don't care if it is. That crap has got to... After analyzing your biology, the Ron interrupted. We believe we have isolated the compounds used to provoke the changes you experienced. However, we are hesitant to replicate this process. When we were conducting initial repairs on your bodies, we found some irregularities that we could not explain. Only after the human Lee explained the use of the serum did we begin to formulate what we believed to be a reasonable hypothesis. I stopped mid-scream and listened to the alien's soothing words. The Ron's words were synthesized, a byproduct of the translation symbiote, but they had a calming effect all the same. The words were delivered so flat and unemotional that it made any excitement on the part feel almost embarrassing in contrast. I took a deep breath and silently counted backwards from ten. After I calmed down a bit, I turned, talking again in a more reasonable tone. Lee, I said, thank you for looking into it, but I think that berserker drug is a powder keg. Every time we used it, we nearly killed each other. Lee ignored me and focused on the run. 
What sort of irregularities, he asked. You and the human Jason were the ones who used the drug the most frequently, the Ron asked, and Lee nodded. Yes, he said. Jason got a huge dose of it the first time, and after that we tried to limit our dosage. We understand, the Ron said. Human Jason demonstrated the most extreme damage as well, mostly microscopic scarring of the heart and brain, but there were some curious anomalies in some of the larger muscles. Wait, I spoke up. I have brain damage. You have to kvudging ask, Shide said. Shut up, Shide, Jack snapped at him suddenly angry, or you'll spend the rest of your life cramping up broken bits of a wootah. Shide grinned and started to speak. No, really, I said, cutting him off. This is the time to be silent. You don't know Jack, Shide. He slammed his jaw shut and glared at me. I looked back at the run. I have brain damage, I asked. It has been repaired, the run explained, and it was not extensive, likely not due to even notice the effects. However, we believe if you continue to expose yourself to the serum, the effects will become more pronounced. Pronounced how? I asked. The Ron was silent for a moment. We are unaware of the current limitations on the Conflux technology in reviving deceased humans. The Ron admitted. It is possible that you might have been able to live only a moderately truncated lifespan. You may have even retained some degree of conscious thought. Holy crap! I spat. Cheer up, Shide said as he clapped me on the shoulder. You likely wouldn't have noticed those last few kvodging years anyway. I shrugged his hand off my shoulder. She's really going to hurt you if you keep talking, Shide, I warned him. What about me? Lee asked. That's extensive, the Ron replied, but damage was still present. We are, um, uncertain how the Chimera were unaware of the damage of the use of the serum provoked. It should have been detectable by the Conflux and Chimera technology. They likely didn't care, Lee concluded. I had to side with him and there. So, I said as I clapped my hands together, no super psycho syrup for us, agreed? There was a chorus of yes, and one of the I'm not allowed to convulging talk, followed by a yelp of pain. Motion passed and meeting adjourned, I declared. We don't want to berserk a serum, thanks for asking. I started to walk away. We did not intend to offer this medication, the Ron said quickly. We did come up with something with less damaging, however. We will not implement this change without your consent. I stopped. What change? I asked as I slowly turned around to face the beetle-shaped alien. We have been scanning your brains, the Ron admitted. Partially, we have done this to make sure that the repairs were successful. However, mostly we were curious as to how the humans are able to comprehend other species without a direct mental link. I glared at them. I should have been pissed about this, but the invasion of privacy. But really, I sort of expected it. Aliens didn't seem to think looking into another person's body without their consent was in any way objectionable. Medical exams seemed to be a one-part automated dukikis, healing you and nine parts candid camera. I crossed my arms over my chest and waited for the run to continue. We have discovered, he said, the areas of the brain that seem to be the most concerned with inferring the thoughts of others. These areas allow you to relate to other humans and intelligent species. We believe we can use a simple induction to deactivate these regions temporarily. What? I asked. They can flip our psychopath switches, Jack translated, make it so we don't feel empathy or compassion for anyone else. We'd be able to kill and not care. I looked at Jack. The military back home has been working on a similar idea, she explained. Or, at least, the British military. Others too, for all we know, but they aren't admitting to it. The idea is to create a helmet that can cause a normal person to temporarily become a psychopath. I just stared at her with growing horror. I read, she protested. I watch the news. Why would anyone want to do that, I stammered. You're saying the military actually wants an army of Hannibal Lecter's. They would, if they could, Lee spoke up. Unfortunately, there aren't that many true psychopaths out there. Shame, really. I turned my stunned gaze upon Lee now. It's a shame, I asked. How is having an army that doesn't take marching orders from the neighbor's dog not a good thing? Antisocial, not delusional, Lee corrected me. There's a difference. All right, I said sarcastically. Antisocial people just wear clown makeup and stuff bodies into a crawl space. Jason, Lee said patiently, you watch too many movies. Jason, Jack took up for him, tell me the truth. If you knew for a fact that you could get away with it, no one would ever know it was you. Is there someone out there that you would kill? 
My three francs I wanted to deny the idea, but then the image of Heather's father, my former boss, flashed through my mind. You hesitated too long, Lee said before I could get a word in. So, the answer is no. Amazingly enough, most psychopaths don't want to go to jail either. If the only thing that is stopping either of you is the threat of jail, then don't go so high and mighty about empathy. They were twisting my words around. Worse, I hadn't even spoken and they were still twisting them. That's not the point, I said. What happens to us? He shrugged. We'll have to see, won't we? He said. You'll still be you, still have the same memories, have the same lifetime experience. The only thing that'll change is a minor shift in perspective. I frowned. I was certain that that shift was not not so minor. Still, I said, we need to say no to this. Aliens mucking around in our heads is what got us into this mess. I said that it was a shame we didn't have enough more psychopaths, and I meant it, Lee said. They make good soldiers. I don't mean killing machine. I mean soldiers. They don't worry about if they will be personally responsible for who lives and who dies. They do their job. They focus on the mission and do it the best way that they can. There was an edge to his voice. A memory came back to me. Lee had been an alcoholic when you met him. A drug user as well. Jack said something happened to him while he was in the service. I tried asking Lee about it, but he deflected. Something about making bad decisions. Mad enough to lead a man like Lee, a strong man, to a life of self-destruction and decay. He didn't want to take command. Didn't want to risk being in that position again. He left that to me. My protests died. Maybe I really didn't know what I was talking about. Can we try it out first, I asked, here in the simulator room. That is a reasonable request, the Ron answered. Shall I modify all your suits? No, I said. I was supposed to be the leader. I needed to act like one. No, I repeated. Just mine. The Ron didn't move or appear to do anything. It is done, the Ron said. We have listened to your discussion and believe your own military ideas of adding the mechanism to the helmet would be the most familiar to you and easiest to implement. When you activate your helmet, the inductors will deactivate the relevant brain regions. When you remove the helmet, they will resume normal functioning. Just, uh, put the helmet on, I asked. Correct, the Ron said. I shrugged. May as well get this over with. Start the simulator, I ordered. Robot drones, walkers, and flyers this time. Give me an even dozen of each. Let's see how this new Ron suit works out. The grassy field appeared with twelve four-large-legged Terminator robots and twelve flying saucers all frozen in place. I checked my weapons. Pistol on my right thigh, plasma sword on the left, black baton on my back. I flexed my fingers. Weighted gloves in the hands. Oh, hell. May as well do this. I stepped into the simulator and nodded my head. The helmet slid in place in an instant. Nothing happened. I felt no different. Well, I guess it's a bust after all. The robots turned all at the same time and started targeting me. Yeah, frick that. I dived to the side and rolled. Energy blasts singed the ground where I'd been standing a second before. I popped up behind the nearest Terminator and activated my sword, wrapping my left arm around its neck. I plunged the sword into its chest. The drone flashed red. I deactivated the sword and slapped it against my right thigh behind my pistol. I couldn't reach my left hip as I was still holding the drone upright in my left arm. Energy blast struck my improved drone shield. I drew my pistol and returned fire. Two saucers flashed red and disappeared. Two more circled around from behind me. I twisted the drone around to my side and dropped, pulling its heavy body down on top of me. The ground slammed to my spine. It hurt. I ignored the pain for a moment. The drone covered me from my legs up to my chest, a good bit of shielding, but it also restricted my movements. No problem. I fired upwards to take out the head flying drone and then aimed the nearest Terminator. I shot that one's leg out. I rolled onto the side of the overbalanced drone toppled in my direction. My legs came out from under the drone that had pinned me down and now I had two disabled drones to hide behind. A couple more and I'd have enough to make a lean-to. Crouching low behind a thrashing drone, I shot another flyer as it tried for a strafing run and awkwardly drew my plasma blade with my left hand. I was annoyed. These things were trying to kill me. I needed to put a stop to this. I leapt over the thrashing drone and ran towards the nearest Terminator. I shot it in the face as I ran and slashed out of the side with my left hand. Someone was shouting something off in the distance. I didn't catch a word, something like, add more, but I didn't catch it. 
I shot three Terminators in quick succession. How many did that leave? There seemed to be at least ten still standing. That seemed wrong. After another flyer, I shot it. A Terminator tried to take advantage of this distraction, so I shoved my plasma blade in its eye. More drones seemed to appear out of nowhere. I was getting angrier. I felt anger before, but this was different. Hotter, but more focused at the same time. I whirled around and shot blindly. Anything that didn't want to get shot needed to duck faster. I saw several drones flash red. Good, but not great. Six flyers converged on me at the same time. I shot five of them, but couldn't get the sixth one fast enough. That's okay. I just tossed my plasma blade at it. By the time I'd been hit multiple times, the pain was starting to get to me. I reached over my back and slapped the place where the Ron said the painkiller was located. The pain fled. That was good, as long as my hand was back there. I grabbed my handle on the bat and brought it around in a brutal arc that crushed a Terminator's skull. I rushed another Terminator and slammed my shoulder into it. As it fell, I shot it repeatedly in the chest. I rolled off and kicked another Terminator in the knee. It wobbled, so I brought the bat down on that knee. Now it fell. Sometimes you just have to hit things a few times before they get the message. I rolled forward and sprang up to my feet, bat in hand and pistol in the other. I fired wildly and swung the bat without aiming. More red flashes. A Terminator pushed closer. It was on my left. Too close to hit with the bat and I couldn't get the pistol around in time. I punched it full in the jaw. It staggered and I whipped the gun around and shoot it, but it turned out to be unnecessary. All at once, everything stopped. There was at least nine flying saucers or ten more Terminators, but they all froze in place like I was viewing them from a clear, clear jello mold. I think that's more than enough of a demonstration, I heard Lee say. The robots all disappeared and I looked around. Lee, Jack, and Shide were staring at me as the well as the few run. I walked in their direction. I slapped the pistol back in its customary place and returned the bat to my back. Did you add more drones? I asked pleasantly as I walked over. I may have lost count, but I think I took more than a dozen. Oh, and I lost my plasma blade. Anyone seen it? I flexed my fingers in my hand. They moved stiffly. I think I broke a finger, I commented. Probably shouldn't have punched that thing while still holding the bat. No one said anything. Maybe the helmet was muffling my voice. I nodded to drop it. Everything came rushing back. Oh, hell. I had shot wildly around the room without even thinking about the fact that my friends might be standing nearby. We want it, Lee, Jack, and Shide chorused. Guys, this is... You didn't see it, Shide interrupted. That was amazing. You've never kavodging moved like that during training. Probably true. You don't understand, I said. I didn't care about anything at all. I was just angry and wanted to hurt them. Perfect, Jack said. We're in. No, I stammered. It's a bad idea. We need to think about this. Like Kavodge, Shide barked. You don't want to use it. Keep your Kavodging helmet off. But we're fighting our way upstream enough without you tossing a Kavodging anchor behind us. Are you Kavodging in, or do I have to smack your Kavodging rear? What else can I say? I was in. Otherwise, I would have been up Shide Creek with a paddle. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 90, written by Sebi Loki. The air was hot and sticky. It was reasonably comfortable where I was covered by the Ron suit, but my exposed head was already drenched in sweat. I felt as if I had been washing my hair in pea soup. The bonfire wasn't helping things either, but uh, then again, I hadn't built it because I was cold. Gah! Oh, hell. I thought and I looked at the Teths. The fire will draw her attention, Valteth warned. Exactly, I said, leaned back against the tree trunk and pretended to be oblivious to the lack of animal noises around us. We'd arrived at the planet while I was asleep, which meant that even though I was swell past nightfall, here my body was still insisting that it was only in the afternoon. I was not in the least bit sleepy, but I wanted anyone who was watching to assume I was. I yawned and stretched and closed my eyes. There wasn't much reason to keep them open. The perimeter alarm hadn't beeped once since I set it up. According to the best technology the Ron had to offer, we were out here all alone. The silent forest said otherwise. All Green was an appropriate name for the planet. When I had looked at it from the orbit, that was all I saw. Just endless expanses of green. 
Eventually, I saw that it wasn't quite uniform. There were streaks of brown and shades of yellow mixed in, and there were very, very tiny ice caps. But, for the most part, green. Even the oceans were green. The Ron had tried to explain things to me as I stared. How the planet was near the extreme near edge of the habitable zone, around the star, then that, combined with the abundance of greenhouse gases, it had created a planet-wide hot zone that favored plant growth. The biomass of the planet was on the high end of normal, and the oceans were covered in algae-like growth, and the tropical zones extended much further to the north and south than they did back on Earth. Only near the poles did the planet experience winter, and even then the ice caps were almost a temperate climate. There was much less worldwide variance in temperature than I was used to on Earth. Really, it was probably a fascinating discussion, but I didn't want to pay much attention to it as I was plunging towards the planet feet first. The RON and stealth technology that was supposed to make them invisible to any scanners the Conflux had in their arsenal other than the chance visual sighting of the naked eye. The Ron were able to move around undetected through Comfrax race at will. Or, rather, that was the way it was supposed to be. Someone had clearly not been playing by the rules as we'd already encountered several instances of Comfrax using technology capable of jamming the Ron scanners. If they had access to technology that could thwart the Ron scanners, Unfortunately, stood to reason that they had access to technology that could penetrate their own jammers. Thus, why I was shoved out of the airlock and forced to listen to a pre-recorded Ron lecture on alien climatology as I plunged towards the ground below at mock holy crap. In a nutshell, the idea was that we had no clue how high-tech the scanners they were using really were, so we planned to defeat them by going low-tech. I mean... Really, really low-tech. We're talking 1950s to 1960s. For a drop, my Ron suit had been uh, temporarily completely covered in an ultra-dense material of armored sections. This wasn't to provide additional protection, though. This was done so that I would absorb any and all energy beams sent towards me. Radar, laser, infrared, or whatever. It didn't matter. I would reflect next to nothing. A side effect of this, however, was that the suit became too stiff to allow me to move. Once the barometers detected atmospheric pressure that indicated that I was well into the lower atmosphere, this excess armoring would disappear, allowing me to move freely once more. Until then, I was a statue. That's why I was shoved out of the airlock. When the pressure reading from the barometer indicated that I was around 300 feet off the ground, the parachute would deploy. Yes, a parachute. I wasn't allowed to use anything that might have an energy source or sophisticated scanners might be able to pinpoint. A good, old-fashioned, low-tech parachute should snap out and slow my descent. Only when I got to the level of tree lines and almost certain death could I use anti-grabs. So, fall from the ship. Drop. Drop some more. Drop some more. Still more. Wait until I can move again. Wait until the chutes deploy. Once I am within standing distance of a tree branches, hit anti-grav on my belt. Don't hit it before you cause it only has enough juice for an ultra-short burst of breaking. Fifteen seconds or so. The compact unit would find me a suitable landing spot in the immediate area. Cut the lines to the chute and then lower me gently to the ground. Easy. In fact, an even easier way to think of it is, Oh crap, I'm gonna die. Crap, crap, I'm gonna die. For the entire time, you're falling. Which is what I did. Lee proposed the idea originally. He called it a halo jump. Presumably because you'll be sprouting one since you smack into the ground at high speed. We sneak a few people into the ground undetected. They make a lot of noise and draw attention to themselves. Odds are good that we'd be investigated rather than slaughtered outright because the first rule of running an impenetrable fortress is you have to ask how the guys who break in do it. So, make noise, draw someone out, while well, they are pointing guns and noisemakers and asking lots of questions. The rest of the party sneaks up behind them and makes it a real party. Yep, still ringing on the I'm gonna die mantra. When Lee proposed the idea and volunteered himself for the jump, I stepped forward to shake his hand and wish him good luck. That was a mistake. He assumed I was volunteering as well. So, 
I got drafted. Small comfort in the fact that Jack and Shy got drafted as well. He guilted them with the fact that I was willing to risk my life so that they should as well. However, he decided to keep them from sneaking around and stabbing side of things, which left me to the ring the doorbell and stand there like an idiot. I am gonna die, I'm gonna die. Lee has a point after all. He should never be allowed to take command. Dropping the cats on the planet proved more problematic. Yes, we wanted to take the cats. No, we did not equip them with giant Ron suits. The Ron actually used their remotes to deactivate the cats. Each cat was made to sleep as a ball of dense material surrounded them. These container balls also had parachutes and anti-grav units attached. The parachutes were automated. The anti-grav was not. Each of us were given a short-range transmitter to activate them remotely. When the cat's pod drew nearer where we had safely landed, we simply hit the button to the remote and the pod would just do the rest. We then used the second remote to wake the cats up. Easy. So how do we know that the cats would be landing near us? If you guessed a thousand foot long nanofiber drag line tethering the pod to my belt, then uh, congratulations, you're better at this than I am. So... Once I land on the ground, I would have just a few seconds to take my belt, secure it to a tree, and then hit the second button on the belt, which would power the miniature come along inside. This would draw in the drag line to a mere 300 feet or so in just a few seconds and pull the drifting cat's pod over with it. I then would have to dig out the remotes of the cat's pod and would be somewhere within 300 feet of me. Not too bad of a stroll. So... Fall and hope I don't die. Hope the shoot works and I don't die. Hope the anti-gravity works and I don't get stabbed by a branch and die. Hope I'm fast enough to secure the belt to a tree before the cat shoot yanks me airborne again and puts me amongst the stabby branches where I would d die and then duck down as a hair-thin fiber grows taut and try not to get decapitated as it draws a ton of cat. Walk to where the cat is Hope I can remember how to open the pod and how to wake up Bandit or the cat dies. Then I make a lot of noise and hope that whoever answers doesn't kill me. Wonderful plan, huh? I wanted to object to come up with something better. We had a ship full of Ron with their high-tech wall, melting beams and force field throwers. Why were we the strike force? Your species has an instinctive grasp of tactics, ours does not. The Ron explained. Your hunter-seekers are still equipped with the emergency transmitter on the saddles. Hit the button and we will come in to assist you or extract you if needed. I really hated when everyone was so reasonable about discussing my death. In fact, in the only objection that the Ron raised to Lee's plan was that they didn't think that we would be enough of experts on complex technology. So, I was sent down with two different tethers to attach to me. Gleep! Perhaps they do not realize the fire means people are here, Poltez suggested. I ignored this as I watched Bandit. His gaze was directed out beyond the glow of the firelight, out where the shadows of the darkness swallowed everything. His head moved. He was tracking something. They must be coming closer. I suspect they might, I countered as I scratched the wampus cat behind his ear. His tail thumped against the ground. Thinking back on it, I think everyone else had a silent for the same reason I was. We were all hoping someone else would bite the bullet and admit the plan was suicidal. Instead, I meekly submitted as the Ron strapped up my backpack and belt on my suit and shoved me out of the airlock. I remember thinking that at least my helmet was up when they pushed me, so I would be in psychopath mode. That should help with the fall, right? Yeah, he was right. I watched way too much television. As it turns out, psychopaths are just as likely to crap their pants as they fall out from orbit. Lack of empathy does not mitigate concern for your own safety. The only difference was that I was not terribly concerned where the other fall suits and pod duos were dropping, except for a worry that I might get impaled in a tree and survive just long enough for one of the others to fall on me. I didn't care, which left me a lot more time to think about myself and my impending death. As it happened, the fall turned out to be almost completely uneventful. Only for the last few minutes did I even get a sense of how fast I was moving. 
The planet swirled up beneath me, and then all I could see was an expanse of green that blocked my view from anything. There was no rushing wind howling past my helmet or landmarks to see I was by. It was just me looking at the green floor below me. By the time the wind grew loud enough to howl, the thicker atmosphere also forced me to slow down. I dropped below the sound barrier without ever getting a chance to hear a crack, and suddenly I was in a normal freefall experience by skydivers everywhere. Still, not an experience I was familiar with, but there was at least some context that I could build from. Drawing upon my vast knowledge of all things skydiving, I expected Keanu Reeves to float by with a surfboard at any minute. Keanu disappointed me. The Ron didn't. About that time that I could start making individual trees, my arms and legs started moving again. A few seconds later, and the parachute deployed. I felt a hard yank, and while the ground was still rushing towards me, I did so with a more sedate pace. The parachute wasn't large enough to slow me down to a safe speed. If I'd hit the ground, providing I could find some that wasn't covered in forest, I'd still be moving rapidly enough to break more than a few bones. Not lethal speeds, just not healthy ones either. I lifted my knees and I neared the top of the trees and snapped the palm of my hand on the buckle of my belt where it should be. Instead of a yank this time, I felt like I was let go by the parachute lines were cut. I fell, but only for the tiniest fraction of a second. The belt's microgenerator kicked in and I found myself hovering above the tree. I then zipped three feet to the left and descended like I was in a fast-moving elevator. I landed with a teeth-rattling jar, but I was otherwise uninjured. I didn't even stop to take in my surroundings at that point. Before me was a wide trunk of a large tree. I dived for it, yanking my belt off in one smooth motion. I flung the belt around the tree. The tree was thicker than my midriff, and the material grew and stretched to wrap around the tree. I just had to hold one end as the other crawled along the trunk until the two ends met and fused. I snapped the front of the belt again and heard something snap in my ear nearby. The lines were too thin to see directly, but what I saw was the leaves and branches overhead rustling as the belt drew in the slack. A few moments later, two pods appeared above my head dangling from parachutes. A large pod and a smaller one, they were not quite directly overhead but it was close enough that I worried that they might drop on me. I dug out my remote from my backpack and hit the button on it. The two parachutes separated and the pods eased themselves down into the forest smoothly. I heard the sound of branches cracking and the snapping of a larger pod forced its way down. But other than that, it was completely silent. I then disconnected the belt from the tree and put it back on my waist. It was almost useless now as the microgenerators had burnt themselves out but I didn't want to leave too many clues to our arrival. I jogged over to the pods and dug out the remotes from my backpack. The two pods cracked open like giant eggs. A sleeping wampus cat was delivered on the ground as well as a gleeping and gahawing alien. I ignored the tests as I dug out the last remote and woke Bandit. The cat's eyes snapped open and he stretched. If the wampus was concerned about falling asleep on a cavern-like ship and awakening in a forest, he didn't show it. He sniffed once and then turned to gaze at him upon me waiting orders. The sun, or whatever the star was called, was getting by and then I urged Bandit and the tents to follow me through the forest to some distance away. The remnants of the pods had parachutes were set to dissolve in a few hours. I didn't know how long it would take for the hosts to arrive once I started making a spectacle of myself and, again, I didn't want to make it too obvious how we arrived. If they didn't show up until the next day, then I could stand right next to where the pods had landed, and there would be little evidence other than some broken branches. But if they arrived too early, they might figure out my method of arrival and just decide to shoot me on sight before interrogating me. Fun! We hustled through the forest for about a mile or so, the tests remaining silent for a change, and once I found a moderate-sized clearing, I gathered some alien branches and made a pile. I then drew my plasma braid and fanned a light across the top. I had a fire going within mere seconds. Eat it, Boy Scouts! Which brought us back to the sitting across from the tents bathing as I watched the bandit. He kept his gaze fixed on one spot. So, 
Whoever or whatever was out there was not moving. I glanced down at the perimeter alarm again. The gizmo was a simple black sheet of material not much larger than a paperback book. If I had held it parallel to the ground, however, I saw an aerial view of the immediate area and the ghostly white trees. The image was a three-dimensional which left me with a weird feeling that I was looking down upon a bonsai forest inside an aquarium. If I rotated the sheet in any direction, the view would shift and give me a better view of whatever I wanted to do. If I held it up and looked through it, I could narrow the view to a small slice of the forest. I could even tap the trees and have the scanner filter them out. When I did that, though, the, all that remained were ghostly white images of myself banded in the tests. We were definitely being jammed. Interesting. Well, I didn't want to jump out and say, Booga, 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 too early. I needed to draw our voyeur in a little closer. How gullible were they? I leaned away from the tree and closer to Teth and lowered my voice before I spoke. I made sure the voice was loud enough to carry, but hard to hear unless they were up close. Not sure I would, could do that to the Ron or to their children, I said in a low voice, surgically implanting them with explosives, I mean. Gleave? Explosives? Old Teth stammered. Exactly what I thought, I said quickly. Why do that to your own children? I mean, yes, they are likely to be killed anyway, but... To blow up your own children just for the sake of vengeance on the kidnappers. Gah! I'm not sure if I could push the button, I said, cutting Valteth off. Me either. Maybe that's why they asked us to do it. As soon as we got in range to set them all off. Gleep! I'm afraid that I... Valteth began. Again, I cut him off. We'll be out of the blast area, I said. Me either. The Ron did say that the bombs pack quite a punch. How much of the planet do you think there will be left when they go up? Gleep, you're not making any sense, Polteth protested, speaking quickly. Gleep, what are you referring to? It had spoken too fast for me to interrupt. Okay, I could still work with this. You think that you should disarm them instead? I asked as I dug out the remotes out of my backpack. I don't know, our instructions were pretty clear. Gah, Polteth sputtered, still not getting it. I held up a hand to silence him. Bandit's head was moving as he tracked something again. Bandit glanced at me. I met his eyes. I glanced in the direction of the interloper and looked once at Bandit. The Wampus cat, unlike the Teths, had no problem picking up the subtle cues. The cat moved in a flash of green lightning over the land. He bounded over the campfire and in the blink of an eye disappeared into the forest. There was a crashing sound followed by a squawk of pain. Bandit came trotting back towards the fire, dragging a strange creature by one leg as it cursed at him in unknown language. The creature looked something like a five-legged spider, four legs, two on each side and one in the back, rose up two points at the top like a furry brown ball that dangled below like a piñata. In the gap between the legs in front of a single large eyeball stirred outwards. Just below the eye, a mouth filled with dome-shaped teeth wrapped open and shut in time to curse. Release me, yes? The alien screeched in a voice like fingers on a chalkboard. Release me, yes? Bandit, I said. The cat paused mid-step. Crush his leg, I ordered. The cat's jaws tightened. The hairy eye rolled in my direction and seemed to notice me for the first time. No, it shouted. Rickshaw is friend, yes? We will help you, yes? Do not harm you, no. Bandit. I said the cat's massive jaws paused mid-bite. He wasn't seriously trying to harm the creature. Not yet. The pressure bandaged jaws could exert was more than enough to bite through Freak Shaw's spindly leg with one snap. The slow and steady pressure he'd been exerting was painful, but not likely to create permanent damage, providing I told him to stop in time. Not for the first time, I found myself wondering about the intelligence of the Wampus Cats. He's up, I said, but don't let him go. Not yet. Yeah, let go, yes. Rixal suggested. Run away, I will not. No. I drew my pistol. You phrase that like it's your decision, I pointed out. Rixal looked at my sidearm, then looked at Bandit, and then looked back at me. To his credit, he did not crap himself. There was very little else he could do. Rixal surrenders, Rixal said. Tells you what I know, yes. I continued pointing the gun at it. 
Rickshaw helps you into base, the alien went on, sweetening the pot. Takes you to burrowing creatures, yes? How are you jamming our senses, I asked. The eyelids fluttered quickly. A nervous reaction, I thought. Rickshaw knows nothing of this, yes, the alien protested. That's one, I said. What is one? Yes, Rickshaw asked. Lie. I said, that is your first lie. Two more and I'll have bad a tear off one of your legs. The eye widened. Do that you could not know, the alien said. That's two, I said. In a hurry to limp, are you? Explosives are burrowing children there or not, no? Freakshall asked. No, that's one my lie, I said. What are you going to do if I tell two more? Think carefully before you answer. You're already one up on me. Free Skull was silent for a moment. The eyelid drooped. Surrender, ready I have, Free Skull said. In your power, I am. Cooperating with you, I will, yes. The jamming device, I repeated. Beneath us, yes. Free Skull answered immediately. Within the base, yes, purchased from the free traders by the one with many faces, yes. Blankets, the entire planet, yes. Yet, someone is here who should not be near the base, yes. Free Skull come out to see who it is. Nasty human waiting. Now, who told you I was a human, I asked. Free Skull's eyelid fluttered again. Did you come out here on your own initiative, I asked. Or did someone send you? Free Skull was sent, the alien admitted. Those with many faces sent Free Skull. They see the human, yes, in the scanners, yes. Send Free Skull closer. Why not just keep scanning me, I asked, unless you are Pate. Pate, the alien stammered. His eyes grew wide. Oh crap, this thing really was stupid. They sent Free Skull out to die. No... Freeskull loyal. Freeskull has been good. Yes. Freeskull stammered. I looked away from the struggling alien and into the dark forest. I guess he's not as loyal if he cracks that easily, I said to the forest shadows. Quite true, a voice replied. The voice was warm, tenor, male. It sounded human and it was speaking chimeric. I felt my skin crawl. No, it couldn't be. Want to come out and warm yourself by the fire, I suggested. Free Skull thrashed and looked around with wild eyes. He had not, I decided, realized that he was being watched even as he watched us. It is quite warm enough without a fire, the voice said, but as you wish. The leaves rustled and shapes melted from the shadows. First the ones and twos, then more. Fifteen. Twenty. Maybe more. As I stepped closer to the fire, I got my first good look at them. They looked human, mostly, except not. They were all tall and lithe bulled with long, perfect hair. Their faces were all unique, but shared a certain delicate cast to their features, a timeless look that betrayed no hint of respective ages. Their skin was flawless, with no signs of scarring or discolorations, and their jaw lines were sharp. If I saw the ears, I'm sure that would have a neat point. I'd seen faces like these before. They, I spat, one letter short of the typical length of a swear word, but I said it with enough venom so it may as well be in one. The man stepped closer to the fire. His skin was starch white. I don't mean pale, I mean white. A white so pure it reflected the firelight. Human skin could never be that pale. Not quite, a false face said. You must have run into our prototypes. How marvelous. Do you like it? The man spun in place to showcase his new suit. He was dressed in a peach-colored jumpsuit, one with a hand lazily held a rifle in one hand. The rifle looked eerily similar to an Earth's assault rifle. It took us a long time to work out all the kinks, he went on. Your species was so, um, unique. It seems every time we tried to improve upon it, the end results were somehow, uh, diminished. But with patience and perseverance, anything is possible. I didn't answer, not with words. I just slid my hand down my leg in the general direction of my thigh. You are free to reach for that pistol, if you like, the face said as he beamed at me, but I don't think you'll live long enough to pull the trigger. I looked behind him in the suit of Fay. 
They all had their guns trained on me. They seemed to be completely ignoring the tests. And the one in front, the man not much taller than me with, I am not joking, teeth piled into points like a shark's leered at me. I halted my movements towards the pistol and, oh, so carefully laid my hands across Bandit's saddle. Your chimera, I declared. Bravo! The chimera agreed with a nod. I see your species has retained its quick wits, one of many things that made you such excellent commandos. That, and you didn't care how many of us you sacrificed along the way, as you weren't the ones getting shot at, I added. He shrugged and continued to grin. What else is an army for, good sir? He asked and then affected a yawn. This is all quite entertaining, but you may as well call your friends. My friends? I asked as I tried to look baffled. Oh, please, he said with a roll of his eyes. We did not adopt a human form, you know. We have taken your minds as well. You come in, alone and easily defeated, while your compatriots circle around from behind. Classic human strategy. I don't know, I said. I'm not much of a strategist. I'm more of a checkers sort of guy. He cocked his head to the side. Checkers, he asked. I waved a hand, my left hand, the one draped over the saddle. It doesn't matter, I said. I wouldn't expect anyone to rally to it. As I finished waving my hand and just happened to drop on the saddle in front of me, the chimera jerked. You just transmitted a signal, he snapped. Oh, did I? I asked in mock innocence. He sneered and aimed his gun at me. You fool, he hissed. Did you really think such a ploy would work? We can disable your scanners. Do you believe that I would be so difficult to block your transmission as well? Had to try, I said with a shrug. He snorted. Last chance, he said. Order your compatriots to come out and lay down their arms. I can't do that, I said patiently as I rocked back and forth gathering my feet underneath me. I braced my hands against my knees to help with standing. We don't have any comms down here, I explained as I remained squatting. They won't come out until I give them the signal. Then give them the blasted signal, Sharktooth snapped. With all the enhancements they went for and all the defects they removed from the human genome, you would think saying stupid things would be one of the first things they got rid of. But there you go. My hand went from my knee to my hip as I lurched to my feet. I fired three times in rapid succession without aiming. The first went wide, but the second caught Sharktooth right in the mouth. I nodded my head and my helmet popped into place. And then everything seemed a little less complicated. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 91 Written by Simi Loki The fight looked uneven, but it wasn't quite as lopsided as it might first appear. For one thing, although the Fae Chimera claimed to have humanoid minds and could do tactically like humans, they obviously weren't used to actually fighting humans, nor had they prepared for them. Their weapons were energy weapons, which hurt like a son of a witch, but couldn't kill a human. Not immediately, anyway. We were resistant to energy blasts, not immune to them. More than likely, that's why he even used energy weapons. They likely benefited from similar resistance and, uh, therefore, would suffer fewer casualties from friendly fire. We, on the other hand, were using pure kinetic energy with our weaponry. The pistol fired a dense force field at high speed. Neurophysiology didn't help up any protection against that. This was a weapon designed to turn pure physics into your worst enemy. I fired several shots off in rapid succession. The fake chimera were still in shock at seeing their companion drop, so I managed to hit a couple of them before they managed to start shooting back. I aimed for center mass and was rewarded with seeing two chimera drop with concave chests. That was good. Seeing them catch themselves and try to stand up, that's good. Having everyone open fire at me and once downright crappy. They had taken the face super accelerated healing. I should have guessed, even though the pistol packed a punch like a chunk of uranium fired from a cannon, it hadn't been enough to kill the Chimera outright. Their internal armoring had, apparently, deflected enough of the energy to keep the heart and lungs from being liquefied. The two Chimera were down for the moment, but not completely out of the fight completely. Once their healing mechanisms had a chance to clear the damage, they'd be a problem again. So, our pistols were at an advantage, but not enough to tip the balance. 
The plasma blades delivered a bit more permanent damage. Fast healing was great and all, but it's hard to heal something that has been lopped off, even if Chimera had added the ability to regenerate limbs. And knowing the sneaky bastards, they probably had. The mass has to come from somewhere, and a missing arm or leg is still a missing arm or leg until you add enough additional mass. Blades, a bit more of an advantage. Tactics and experience were also in our favor. As much as the Chimera bragged that they could think like humans, they didn't follow through correctly. An example was that even though they correctly assumed that I had someone out inside the forest watching us, they didn't watch the forest line. They should have pointed the bulk of their troops outwards and away from the fire. Instead, they watched the guy with the big fat target on himself despite knowing better. Tactics, slightly more of an advantage. Even considering all of this, we were still hosed. The Chimera were stronger and faster than any of us, as Lee, Jack and Shide exploded from them, their blades had drawn and guns blazing. The number of Chimera left standing was still outnumbering us a good margin. We'd have dropped under a hail of gunfire in a matter of milliseconds, if not for the cats. Wampus cats, enormous advantage. As the two wounded fake Chimera tried to stand, Bandit pounced upon one of them and reared up to rake his razor-sharp claws across its face of the Chimera standing next to them. Although the Chimera were doing a fair job shaking off the effects of the pistol shots, but were having a harder time ignoring having a ton of cats standing on their chests. I'm not sure if it was because there was more force being applied or if it was just because the cats stood there and they didn't move, but I can say that the Chimera were dropped and were stepped on much, much slower than getting back up. Bandit, Drool, Jade, and Spot tore through the Chimera ranks like a chainsaw through a soaked toilet paper. They were screaming, there was flying bodies, there was a lot of blood. Unfortunately, there were also a lot of discharged energy weapons. The cats had a few good moments early on, but the Chimera weapons were hurting them. The cats were large targets, and the assault rifles were firing more or less at point-blank range. Even something as fast and as agile as a Wampus cat couldn't avoid everything. Bandit was the first one to drop. Jane, her spot, followed. Drew managed to hold out for almost an entire minute before he'd been hit enough times to make him fall down. From the corner of my eye, I saw all four of them were still breathing and apparently alive. Just stunned. Unfortunately, with the cats taken out of commission, the scales were once again balanced in our favor of the Chimera. I was too absorbed in what was happening to me after that to notice what was happening to the others. I only saw things in spurts, Lee somehow holding off five Chimera at the same time by firing their legs rather than at center mass, as I had been doing. Jack headbutting one of the Chimera in the stomach while slashing wildly with a blade at the second. Shide had switched over to his Wuta, and while I wasn't killing anyone, it was certainly annoying more than a few. I drew my own plasma blade and my left hand and fired my pistol without aiming in my right. The Chimera managed to duck the first swing I made with the plasma blade. He went low and, um, with a sneer, tried to jerk back upright to shoot me with his assault rifle. I caught him with the back of my swing. As for my pistol, I hit my first target in the arm, causing him to drop his rifle, and a bone snapped underneath. He stood there with his arm dangling uselessly while the bones knitted inside. I ignored this as I was too busy fighting. The helmet didn't make me any tougher or more skilled of a fighter. It did make me meaner and more aggressive. I stabbed the Chimera in the face with the plasma blade and then sliced out the side causing the head to erupt in a fountain of blood. That's when someone shot me in the back. I rolled forward with my plasma blade still extended. Rolling to my feet, I kneecapped a Chimera on the way up. He screamed. A third Chimera shouted something at me. Seemed like a stupid idea to me, so I shoved my pistol in his mouth and fired. I was rewarded with a lovely red spray. Someone grabbed my right arm and yanked. Chimera was strong. Against my will, I found my right arm flung away from my body. I was forced to twist with a turn or else risk having my arm break. The grand gripped me, grabbed my pistol and twisted. I was forced to drop the pistol. But now my arm was free, so I reached over with the back and grabbed the black baton. I brought the back down hard on someone's head. There was a metallic clunk when it had landed. The Chimera staggered, but didn't fall over. I slashed him with my left hand and tried to duck away from me. 
He was still uncoordinated, so I took his ear off as well as a large chunk of his skull. He fell to the ground screaming, but didn't die. Actually, very few of them seemed to be dying. All around me I saw figures who had dropped moments ago standing up again. Some were bleeding with open holes in their bodies or skulls. I renewed my attack and I could tell the tide of battle had already shifted, if it was ever in our favor. Two energy blasts hit me at the same time and the world went a shade of red. I came to only find I had apparently been standing motionless for a fraction of a second. That was too much of a delay as fast as things were moving. An assault rifle butt struck me in the gut. I didn't think to tense my muscles, so I felt the impact. I went down to my knees, and another shot hit me in the head, and I couldn't think straight for a second. Something hit me in the side of the head. A rifle, a fist, I couldn't tell. The world was spinning. I dropped to the ground. Two more blasts hit me then. That was just pure witchiness, as I had already down for the count. My eyes refused to focus for several minutes, and that was bad, as, uh, despite all that took place, I probably was only on my feet and fighting for less than five minutes. I thought I heard other bodies fall. I was certain I'd heard laughter for a moment. Yes! A gruff voice shouted. We have had not such a challenge in centuries. Even the raw form of the species is formidable. My tongue was heavy in my mouth. I tried to move it. I was afraid the weight might crack my few teeth. Gleep! Uh-oh. What's this? The voice asked. Gleep! Voltaire shouted. Do not harm me. Aha! Uh -huh, Voltaire added. Oh, my my wrath! I tried to focus. I wanted to tell the Chimera not to kill the Tess, but the words were jumbled. I tried to say, don't kill him, but all that came out was a slurred, kill him. I heard a hand slap metal above me. Sir? A new voice asked. Wait, the gruff voice said. Why is this one so eager for us to execute this one for him? Strange creature, do you know something of value? Gleep, nothing, Voltaire protested. Gleep, we were brought here against our will. Again, I tried to form a sentence. I wanted to say, don't hurt him, listen to him, he's our prisoner. But once more, the words got jumble. Don't listen, our prisoner, I gasped. Curious. Gruff voice said, Take the creature with us for interrogation. Wait, someone else gasped, Leah thought. Oh, the gruff voice chuckled. Another one of you is awake. Something more to add. Yes, Lee bit off. You should know about uh, the, the SP. SP, Gruff asked. Now what would that be? Secret weapon, Lee mumbled. I heard the forest floor crunch as someone walked away from me and towards Lee's voice. And what, pray tell, is an SP? Gruff asked. The solar plexus, Lee said as a suddenly clear voice. I heard a yelp of pain followed by a few meaty thumps as energy weapons discharged and there was another yelp of pain. Thump, thud, thump, and then a heavy thud as something fell to the ground nearby. Do you see? Gruff voice snickered. Notice how they still fight. Even faced with complete and utter defeat, they still think they can win. Oh, this is the most marvelous species. We should harvest their genome and search for the source of their optimism. Lee's distraction hadn't done much, but it had brought me some time. My head was cloudy more from the repeated energy blasts rather than the blows to the head. My nerves had been overstimulated, but I wasn't concussed. As such, I was recovering faster than I expected. I blinked and found my tongue was almost normal size again and I'd regained feeling in my hands and feet. In a few minutes, I'd be able to fight again. If I had a few minutes. Stall for time. Give the others chance to recover. Empty threat, I said, voice still muffled as I was down in the dirt. If you eat us, you might dilute your precious fey DNA. I was greeted with silence. Fascinating, gruff voice said. You are correct, of course. We would never eat lesser species like you now, but how did you discover that was how we grafted DNA? I pushed my hands underneath me and forced my head off the ground. It hurt and the world was still spinning. I thought I might even vomit for a moment, but at least they could do is hear me clearly. You break just as easy as anyone else, I lied. Easier, in fact. That regeneration trick of yours is really handy when it comes to asking difficult questions. I'm surprised at what you can live through. The gruff voice chuckled. 
Unlikely, he said. You would have me believe you captured one of my kind and forced him to speak. He didn't want to at first, I said, as I flashed him a toothy grin. Oh, silence. I rolled over on my back and looked up at my attackers. Shark Tooth stood before me. His voice was gruff because half of his teeth were missing. But even as I watched, blood erupted from his gums as slivers of white pushed outwards. They could regrow teeth. How unfair was that? No, Gruff concluded. I do not believe you. You wish to frighten us. Fight us with words that you cannot use the other weapons. An admirable tactic and a testament to your tenacity. But I know that even if you did, as you claim, no chimera would talk to you. No matter. We will have your secrets. Rough hands grabbed me and forced me to my feet. Lee, Jack, and Shide were given a similar treatment. You are in luck, human, the gruff voice added. We were instructed to bring you in alive. Otherwise, you would have paid for your attack with your lives. How does that qualify as luck? I mumbled through the pain as I forced the aching legs to hold me upright. Now I have to hear you talk more. I don't have to talk, Gruff warned. If it weren't for the hands holding me up, I would have fallen to the ground again. As it was, I was forced to quickly nod my head to keep him from vomiting inside my helmet. My head was splitting. This wasn't a mere headache either. This was a juiced up roid raging migraine doing donuts in my skull with a monster truck. My vision narrowed and I could hear my heartbeat thundering in my ears. Something was pushing against me. I shoved back, just that like the pain left me. I was sweating. I looked up and saw Gruff kneeling on the ground in front of me. He was sweating too. That was surprising. He declared as he attempted to catch his breath. Your resistance to psychic probing is higher than the last time we used you. I would have expected the ability to atrophy in the absence of wartime attacks. Your abilities appear to have only strengthened. He shook his head and looked up at me. His eyes were bloodshot. His face was already chalk white. But some of the ruddiness seemed to have faded from his lips. He looked tired. I was too, but I was also angry. Very, very angry. As I struggled to catch my own breath, the anger just seemed to boil hotter and hotter. I couldn't dampen it even if I wanted to, and uh, believe me, I didn't want to. I wanted to wring his scrawny neck with my bare hands. Stay out of my head, I barked at him. He looked at me with wide eyes. I made me angrier. Stay, I ordered, out of my head. With that last word, I tried to recall what I did before. I had somehow shoved back. I tried it again. It wasn't quite right, but I saw him recoil away from me. How did you do that? He demanded. Stay out of my head. I yelled at him again. I tried pushing again. Something was wrong. I couldn't seem to get a grip on anything. I raged inside my head and banged imaginary fists against my skull in impotent fury. Gruff just looked at me. Everyone, he snapped. Stop probing. My anger finally plateaued, and I was more angry than I'd ever been in my life, but it had at least stopped before I had resorted to growing fifteen feet tall and donning purple spandex shorts. He frowned. More and more surprises, he said. We should take them for dissection. Perhaps there is something to learn from the small form brains, after all. Anger had done a lot to clear my head and force new life and energy into my limbs. I shook my hands, holding me. I can walk myself, I declared. Assault rifle strained on me. I didn't move. A moment later, someone stepped up beside me and did not attack. I looked over. Lee. Beside him was Jack, and just beyond her stood Shide. We stood side by side before the chimera, still proud and defiant, even if they'd laid a huge smack down upon us. Well, a physical one anyway. The mental battle didn't go the way they planned. We'd surprised them, and they were going to go off script. That had worked for us of the most encounters, so grasped onto that flimsy strand of hope with both hands and held on tight. We'll walk, I said. No need to point your guns. We aren't going to fight you anymore. A smug look crossed Gruff's face. We're tired of dealing with the help, I continued. Either take us to someone who can tell a crap from a Shinola with less than the three guesses, or stop wasting our time. The smug look fell away. Such arrogance, Gruff snapped. I shall. The captain said he will not deal with the help anymore. Lee interrupted. Except it wasn't just a normal interruption. Lee used a voice that made you want to snap to attention and fire off a hasty salute. 
He had to teach that to me at some point. Suggest you stop talking and take us to someone in charge. Lee went on. Also, as a Turk on a good wall, I will have been instructed to inform you that a Shinola is a shoe polish. I heard Jack snicker. Kavodj, Shite said. Was that where you were going with that? I've told you, Kavodjing Artwalders, that you make no sense. He then turned to face Gruff. Kavodjing Stink Stink, no go and footy wooty. He said. Now he was looked back at us. That should Kavodjing help, he informed us. Never beat someone's brains out and expect them to Kavodjing understand complex sentences. Jack laughed again. That was a bit surprising as Jack was rarely ever laughed. She was generally one of the more serious members of our party, which told me that she understood exactly what was going on and why it was so important for one of us to laugh. The Chimera thought that they could pick and choose what they wanted from humanity, but it didn't work like that. Being human was not just being tough or resistant to energy weapons. It wasn't about how fast we healed or how much damage we could sustain. It wasn't about tactics or anything other than being focused on. Being human wasn't about what made us strong, it was about what made us weak. Our fears, our insecurities, you couldn't just cherry pick the parts you liked without the baggage. Humans aren't brave and defiant because we fear nothing. We fear everything and have to learn bravery to make it through the day without collapsing into a puddle of bile and shame. We weren't gifted with tactics because of some military planning course etched into our DNA. We're good because our messed up brains keep insisting everything is an attack and we spend a lifetime trying to figure out how to escape. Human excellence and failures are two sides of the same coin. These jerks wanted to think like humans. Well, show them what that means. We will drag them down to our level and clobber them with experience. We had thousands of years of trying to figure out these damn brains out and a lifetime of no alternatives. And we still didn't understand all the rules. No Johnny came lately with the ticket for the buffet. Is going to come out human us. We had to taunt them, to laugh at them, to insult them. We attacked his pride and, uh, to paraphrase Thomas More, the devil cannot endure to be mocked. I could see the anger building in his eyes, flicking from us to the soldier standing nearby. He could tell that he was losing face in front of his troops. Having a prisoner berate you is sort of par for the course for humans, and most commanders on Earth learn to develop a thick skin. In reality, this is one of the situations where there are many right answers, but only one wrong answer. He could walk away, walk away and leave it to some underling to deal with us. He could ignore us. He could instruct us to be buried up to our necks and dump scorpions on our heads. Really, almost anything he could do would sooner or later, showed that he was the one in power and all the bravado was for nothing more than empty words. Seriously, that's all he had to do. We'd be at his mercy soon enough and all he had to do was ignore the chattering monkey brain insisting that this was an attack. He could not validate what we were saying. Naturally, Gruff reached for his weapon. Time slowed. We stood our ground. Fear was mostly to blame for that one, but it didn't matter. It was time to find out how much we superior wanted to talk to us after all. Lance, commander, honor in death. A calm tenor voice spoke on the tree line. Put your rifle down, if you please. Gruff rose. Various chimera fay around us snapped to attention. From the shadows, a new figure appeared. It was tall and gaunt like the fay, but this one had gray hair and all the actual signs of age around his eyes. Faint, but they were there. His hairline was receding slightly, and his lips were strangely thin. He looked at each of us in turn. I am Counselor Eight of Thirty, he intoned. Your request to speak to someone in charge has been acknowledged. Gruff, what sort of name is Honor in Death, kept his rifle pointed at me, but his finger stayed away from the trigger. Counselor, he said without looking, I was about to bring the prisoners to you. Yes, I see that. The counselor replied, voice dripping with sarcasm. If you bring them to me any more pieces, I do wonder how you expect me to interrogate them. I don't think the chimera faces could redden. I mean, they must be able to because I have no other explanation as to why honor in death's face remained chalk white as he shot a pure hatred at the counselor. That was interesting. 
The shark-faced chimera didn't like being chastised by the counselor. Now, I would expect some degree of anger or resentment. He'd been humiliated, after all. But I also expected him to be coward as well. Some degree of embarrassment at being called out on a mistake. I didn't see any of that. Just plain old resentment. Counselor and commander, huh? The title suggested one was some sort of government lackey, and the other was military. Could there be a rift between the two factions? Something I might have wedged open a bit wider. If so, great. The more they fought each other, the better for our chances. Come along, 8 of 30 said to us. You may as well walk. I already know you shall not try to escape. You're too curious as to what is going on. He turned and walked back to the forest. I sent a quick glance in the direction of the cats. They seemed to be groggy, but I saw bandits stir. Eight to thirty must have caught my look. Your animals will not be harmed, he said over his shoulder. We are curious as well. I looked at the others. Lee shrugged. I shrugged back before jogging after eight of thirty. Please tell me this is the part where you tell us your evil master plan while still giving us ample time to stop you. I called out as I struggled to catch up with the long strides. Evil master plan? He asked. How droll. As for stopping it, I'm afraid you're about fifty years too late. We've already destroyed the galaxy. It was dark and a root was sticking out of the ground. That's why I staggered at that moment. It certainly wasn't his words. No, not his words. They were pure nonsense. Lee asked the question, so I didn't have to. Hate to disappoint you, Lee said coolly, but the galaxy still seems to be here. I think I'd notice if it were destroyed. You would be surprised at what people don't notice. Eight to thirty counted, but they will soon see enough. But by then, it'll be too late. End of chapter. The Vault Wave, chapter 92. Written by Semi Logie. I hadn't realized how accustomed I had grown to the Chimera battle armor. As we walked through the dark forest, I kept trying to boost my vision or slip on an infrared overlay. The Ron suit, however, was a much simpler thing, and I was left to stumble on my own through the forest. Walking through the forest at night without so much as a flashlight is a lot harder than you would think. It sounds simple at first. Walk, if you had a tree, turn. Repeat step one. The above covers the basics, yes, but the first step is the tricky part. There was a moon of sorts on this planet, but it wasn't terribly bright. Much, much dimmer than a full moon back on Earth. Starlight doesn't help much, and once you're under the forest canopy, a trickle of light drops to almost zero. If it was zero, that might actually be better. But no, faint shafts of light still manage to work their way in and provide spotty illumination. That just makes it all the more disorienting. The light isn't from one incredibly bright source like we were used to in the daylight. Rather, it was more diffuse. A shaft of light might cast a shadow in one direction over there, but a different shaft of light tosses a shadow in a completely different way. It was difficult to tell the difference between shadows cast by trees and the actual trees. It was impossible to judge the terrain. Most yet, forests are noisy. Animals chirped and sang, while camping that's a nice reminder that sounds of living and breathing planet and people can snooze snug in their tents. Walking through it is another matter. Every single time I put one foot on the ground, I would explode in the sympathy of crackling leaves or snapping branches. The animals would panic and thought of a blind predator stomping through the forest, and they would take off running, screeching, or rarely shut up entirely. Having the sounds around me change from step to step just left me more disoriented. It's one of those things that we hardly even think about anymore that we're so used to it. When our eyes aren't helping our brain shift gears and try to figure out things by using the ears, we listen to the way sounds do or do not echo and try to concentrate a rough approximation of the world using the crudest form of sonar available. We already notice we are even doing it until the ability is taken away from us by having a noise-ridden forest and shifting sounds that won't stay put. Damn it! Like Chimera naturally had no difficulties at all. His eyes probably naturally saw into the infrared. Furthermore, I was certain that the reason he moved at such a vigorous pace was precisely to show off that ability. He wanted us to feel inferior. Well, two could play that game. I came to an abrupt stop. Ahead of me, I heard a crunch of the feet subside. 
Is there a problem, human? Eight of thirty asked me in a voice that was more a sneer than a question. He said the word human like a curse. I smiled into the empty blackness. I was just thinking that it's been ages since I've seen a forest. I told him, we've been stuck on the ships and space stations for I don't know how long, as the last planet we visited was nothing but ice and snow. It is just a place of vegetation, the counselor said. There is nothing remarkable to see. Oh, come on, I said. Don't tell me you Chimera don't appreciate the majesty of a forest. How does the poem go? I think I shall never see a dumpster as lovely as a tree. If you aren't through stalling, the counselor interrupted, it is past time we should be going. Just one moment, I said. I really would like to take a moment to appreciate the full scale of this massive and entirely too combustible forest. Do? I hope one of you still has your plasma blade, I said quickly. Jack did. There was a snapping sound behind me followed by an electrical hum. For a very, very brief moment, I saw the forest surrounding me in a bright, eerie glow. That didn't last long before I heard a blade strike one of the trees, and then I smelled something burning, followed by a moment later by a dull red glow that added to the blue. The blade struck a second and third tree. The counselor yelled at us, probably telling us to stop. I nodded my head and I put my helmet back on place. The helmet stank of smoke. That would take a moment to clear away. I could tell that it had switched over to the oxygen reserves as the air tasted like a ship air, rather than the fresh air of the planet. I turned around to look. Jack was slashing wildly at the trees and branches while the two dozen Chimera soldiers raced in a direction. Yeah, I didn't think we would get away with it for long. Scatter, I shouted. Lee and Shide ran into the trees barehanded. Jack ran in a different direction with the blade held out to the side, slashing trees as she went. After she sent a dozen of them or so to a smoldering, she dropped the sword and started running. She left the plasma blade burning, though. Starting a forest fire is harder than you think. Yeah, sure, some idiot still manages to do it every year by tossing a cigarette butt into a shrub or not dousing a campfire. But still deliberately setting a forest ablaze is sort of tricky. Forests tend to be naturally cool and damp places. Heat is one of three things fire needs to sustain itself, and if the waste's too much trying to ignite damp wood, the fire will still go out. However, the two-foot stream of plasma has a lot of heat to distribute, and even damp wood will eventually give in. Her blade became the epicenter of a roaring blaze. The trees that she slashed were still burning in fits and starts, but the heat rolling off the stronger fire, so few flames found themselves in good company and stepped up their game plan. In the space of two minutes, we'd gone from a pitch-black forest to a burning one. There was now light, but not much visibility. Green wood generates a lot of smoke, as fire strengthened more smoke billowed out from it. The soldiers hesitated at that moment. Did they try and stop the forest fire, or did they give in and chase after the prisoners? The forest fire was their more immediate problem. If for no other reason, then they'd be able to spot from orbit, and that meant whoever brought us in might decide to take a closer look. But the more immediate threat was the Chimera weren't wearing full body suits. Quick regeneration or not, the degree burns and charred lungs would tend to slow you down. They either had to stop the fire or get it to safety. Chasing after the prisoners who did have full body armor protection and their own oxygen supply wasn't a good alternative to running for your lives. So they hesitated, which gave my friends and myself more time to disappear into the smoke. I couldn't see much better than before, but the Chimera probably would not be able to see any more than I could. Between the flyer and the smoke, I suspected that even the infrared vision would be little use. Besides, the Ron suits were jet black, so we blended into the shadows. There was a warm inside the suit, but not yet hot. Not yet. That part had been lucky guess. The suits kept us pretty warm even when we were marching around in a frozen tundra from a few hours. If they could keep us from leaking then, it should work the other way around too. But again, I was just guessing and hoping for the best. It seemed to have been a good guess because within minutes of the fire gaining on me, I ran and I wasn't sweating. Well, not from the heat. The Ron claimed that the suit would help us push the limits of our biology more than we were used to. I hoped that that much was true because the Chimera Fae were fast as hell. If they shot me in the back, it probably wouldn't kill me, 
but it would slow me down long enough for them to catch up to me and curb stomp me. We'd run in four different directions. Would they give chase? How? All of us? Some of us? Just me. I heard a crashing sound behind me. Just me, as at the very least. Feet thundering against the ground behind me. It was loud, louder than the fire. They were moving fast, faster than I thought even the Chimera could run. There was also at least two of them because I could hear four feet crashing through the underbrush. Four feet. I grinned. It was the first thing that had gone right in a long time. I zigged to the right and held out my left hand. A moment later, Bandit was beside me and I easily kept pace with him. In fact, I'd say it pained him to run that slowly. I gripped the lip of the saddle and jumped. Somehow, my foot found a stirrup and I bid a clumsy mount. As soon as my rear touched the saddle, though, we were off like a shot. The Wampus Cat had gotten away. Now we're talking. The glow of the forest fire began to dim as the cat outpaced the advancing flames. Unfortunately, as the light faded, that meant Bandit had to slow down as well. He probably could see better in the dark than I could, but even he wasn't willing to run full speed and limited visibility. I looked over my shoulder and saw an orange glow above the canopy. And I really just set a forest fire just to make a prison break. The planet was almost all forest. How far would it burn? How much damage would it cause? Wait, if this entire panel was a forest, then this shouldn't be the first fire that has ever graced the surface. Fires happen naturally. They just happen more when boneheads are in the area playing with matches. Even as I watched, I saw the trunks of one of particular type of tree start to glisten. As we rode past one, I tried to take a closer look. The trunk had a strange knobby look to it. The heat was causing these blisters and the bark to open up to coat the tree in some sort of sticky goo. A fire retardant, or possibly a fuel to fan the flames. I recalled that I had read some plants actually use fire to plant their natural life cycle. The forest had adapted for fire. All right, but did that mean that I was a friend or a foe? I decided not to stick around to find out. We rode deeper into the darkness and gloom. Okay, I had made an escape. That was the good news. The bad news was that we were still stuck on an alien planet with nothing but hostiles to turn to. All right, so what should I do? Give up and surrender? Never. I find something to fashion some sort of rudimentary lathe first. All right, resources. What have you got, Jason? A huge cat, an alien spacesuit, and a bunch of sticks. Yet somehow I needed to defeat an unstoppable army. Right... No problem. I saw a training form that told me what to do. Granted, I had less Ewoks to help me out, but maybe some of the tactics might still work. There was a noise from behind me. A buzzing drone sound. Oh yes, I forgot. When you are in a high-tech society and it's too dangerous to send living soldiers after someone, like, say, a forest fire, just a wild example, just break out the drones. A buzzing sound was familiar. It sounded just like the saucer drones that had killed me on the ice world. But this time, it wasn't accompanied by a hail of energy blasts. Had it not seen me yet, or was it just spying on me? I tried to urge Bandit to speed up. He obliged by quickening his pace an extra half a step per second, but that was about it. Whatever we were back there, or outrunning it was out of the question. I had lost my sidearm, my plasma blade, and even the stupid bat that I had made for me. If I had taken the Wuta, I might have had at least a spear that I could chuck at the thing. But now... Jason, the voice called out. I nearly fell off the saddle. That was a Ron voice coming from the internal cum. Ron? I asked. I mentally kicked myself. I needed to learn if they had names. Yes, the voice replied and then lost in burst of static. Apologies, this transmission is problematic. How are you getting to me at all? I asked. I thought the Chimera were blanketing the planet in something that jammed their transmissions. That is correct, the Ron answered. However, our scanners did detect transmission that was being permitted to permeate the field. We have duplicated this energy signal and have been able to receive the transmissions. You hijacked the Chimera signal, I asked. Essentially, the run agreed, the signal is used to coordinate the joint attacks. They are able to send and receive messages into one another and transmit back to the base. Once a drone was close enough to you, we were able to alter one of the scanners to mimic a type beam transmission to your comm unit. 
I translated that from the Ron to Dummy as they found a way to piggyback on the drone signals and were using one to follow me and say hi. Great, I said. Can you do anything else but drone, disable it, possibly? There was a typical Ron silence that I came to associate with them thinking about an answer, before replying, We may be able to disable this unit, the Ron admitted, but doing so would reveal our presence and they might block our ability to monitor their activity remotely. Why do I get the feeling that you are going to say something I won't like? I asked. We request that you allow yourself to be captured, the Ron said, confirming my suspicions. If you are taken into the facility, we can use your suit's limited scanners to broadcast information back to us via the drone carrier signal. Once we have information about their base, we can attempt to extract you. Uh, extract me now and cut out the middleman, I suggested, the whizzing buzz of growing louder by the moment. We would then never learn the location of the missing generation. The Ron stated badly, That is our highest priority. We ask much of you, human Jason, but we have no other viable options. Human Lee is gifted with tactics and combat strategies, but observation skills are not his strength. Human Jack is observant and clever, but lacks your guile and ability to manipulate others. Human Shide is capable of fighter, but has shown limited ingenuity. Plus, you know where I am, I grunted. The drones are approaching all four of you, the Ron corrected. We are altering the transmissions to remove your presence from the scanners. However, this ruse is only possible while the other drones are out some distance from you. Once they get closer, it'll not be possible to entirely mask your scanner echo in real time. Ron, forget the lead out and make up your mind. If I agree to let them capture me, I asked, can you help the others escape? The Ron was silent for a moment. We believe, the Ron said at last, that we can redirect the other three to an area of relative safety. There is a natural cavern nearby. It should hide them from the drone scanners for some time. Do it, I said, and then they are safe and let the drone see me again. We want to thank you, human Jason, the Ron said. Don't thank me yet, I said. I am not about to make this easy for them. Of course, you must demonstrate a plausible level of effort in evading the enemy, or they may suspect your motives. Something like that. Mostly, I just thought of being captured was a last resort if I couldn't think of something better. Unfortunately, I didn't have the next last resort idea. I nudged Bandit into the turn and had him swerve around until we were running back towards the forest fire. Maybe I could find my gun along the way. The skyline was a dull orange above the canopy of the trees. Smoke choked the air before us. Bandit slowed and hesitated before running inside. I had my oxygen with me. He didn't. I couldn't really blame him there. I slid down off of his back and dropped to the forest floor. The helmet was supposed to make me a psychopath. I shouldn't care, right? My crew and my cat shouldn't be mattered to me. Well, they did. Don't ask me to explain it. When I was wearing the helmet, everything seemed normal. I believe that I was making normal and appropriate choices for myself. It was only afterwards when I took off my helmet and looked back on my actions that I began to wonder if I had changed. That all mattered to me. I cared. I was just, well, different I think, like how you would get angry if someone wrecked your car. It was your car. You don't have to identify with the car to care about it. It doesn't bother me if I redlined the engine or didn't make up with regular oil changes. It's my car. I'll wreck it the way I want. No one else gets to do that. It's hard to explain because I've always felt normal and appropriate to me. I've always cared, but my reasons for caring seem to change. Except I never really seemed to notice they did until later. Apparently, the reasons we like someone are just like everything else in a human brain. Excessively complex. Just because one key ingredient is missing didn't mean that I stopped liking someone. What I'm saying is that, looking back now, I half expected myself to ride into that fire and top bandit, and having him dispense epic justice to the chimera as I looked on. But I didn't do that. I know I had reasons for why I didn't do that. Good reasons, but they were so obvious to me that I didn't think about them, so I really can't explain them now. I patted bandit behind his ear. He was so tall I actually had to reach up to do this. Can you find the others? I asked. He flared his nostrils and met my gaze. How much do the cats understand? I need you to run away, I said. Fast. Draw the drones away if you can. Do it safely. But if you can't, just get away. Run away and find your packmates. Hide out and wait for the signal. 
I'll try to figure something out. He just shot me a level stare. I thought about dropping my helmet so that he could see my eyes, but thought better of it. The smoke might cause me to choke and gasp, and I couldn't afford the delay. For that, I am grateful. I might never have broken down and sobbed if I had dropped the helmet. As I managed to keep the detached from what I was asking. Drool, Spot and Jade, I said. Find them. He made a low, murmuring sound. Then his ears pricked up and he looked back the way that we'd come. Without warning, he was tearing through the forest once more at blinding speeds. A moment later, I heard a sound too. A whining buzz. I was alone in the forest, unarmed and defenseless. Well, not defenseless. This was a forest after all. I wasted a few seconds kicking the undergrowth until my foot struck a fallen branch. It was old and brittle and only about four inches in diameter and two feet long. But it was still better than nothing. I lifted up the branch and looked for a good climbing tree. Finding a good climbing tree is not always easy. Technically, it is possible to wrap your legs around the trunk and shimmy your way up. I wouldn't try it though. Besides, the fact that it tends to leave bark in places that you'd rather not think about, it's slow going. No, it's better to look for a tree that has a low, hanging yet thick branches, ones that can easily grip and use your arms to provide the leverage that you need to dig your shoes in and pull yourself up to the lowest branches. There is a simple matter of keeping at least three extremities in contact with the tree at all times. Don't ever lift your foot to seek another branch without both hands firmly gripping their own limbs and one foot on solid branch that can take the weight. Keep that in mind and your chances of plummeting to your death are only about one in ten. Carrying my makeshift weapon, however, seriously complicated the three points of contact rule. I tucked it into my armpit so that I could keep my hands free, but I still tended to get hung in the branches along the way. Still, I was in luck as I was well inside the canopy before the drone arrived. The limbs looked sturdy, but they seemed to be structurally weaker than earth trees. The branches bowed under my weight and every movement sent the tree shaking. I froze and wrapped my arms around the trunk. The drone hovered into view a few seconds later. The drone was a flat silver disc with a, and I'm not kidding, turbine in the middle pointed downwards. The spinning blades made the buzzing sound and helped keep it aloft. It must have been some sort of anti-gravity mechanism as well, because the thing zigged and zagged at angles that should not be possible. It hovered and seemed to scan the area. Maybe the heat and smoke of the forest fire was screwing with the scanners as it didn't seem to pick up on the location at first. Or maybe it was just too focused on the ground. Either way, it took some time before it drifted up over to my tree. I don't know if it detected me, or if it was just a coincidence. All I know is that I really, really hoped that the Ron suit had a shock absorbers as I dropped from the 15 feet straight up in the top of the thing. The tip of the spear, okay, branch, slid its way into the intake of the turbine and wedged between the blades. The drone continued to hover, and there was an unpleasant grinding sound. I landed heavily on the ground and tried to roll with the impact. My shins still felt like they wanted to explode. Sawdust and splinters rained down upon me. I rolled onto my back and looked up expecting to see a drone. It wasn't there. I heard a thud to my left and twisted my head in that direction. The drone had crashed and I don't think the spear did much damage to it. But the turbine reducing the stick to a pulpy sawdust and sucking it in had. The drone had flopped and splattered on the ground as the turbine switched on and off in spurts. As I watched the trap door open on its surface and a miniature gun popped out. That was my cue. I rolled to my feet and started running. The first shot hit me in the back and I staggered. I felt like a colony of bees had decided to use my spine as target practice. But the pain soon enough dissipated and I managed to duck behind another tree before the next shot came. Okay, the chimera knew where I was now. Step one, complete. Now to figure out step two. The hitting things with a stick idea seemed to do okay the last time I tried it, so I looked for another stick. I didn't find one, but I did hear more buzzing drones approaching. I abandoned my search and I took off running in the direction of the forest fire. I got very hot inside my suit as I drew near. While I was technically correct in my assumption that the suit could insulate us from the cold, should protect us from the heat, there is a big difference between insulating a fragile body from a temperature change of, say, 50 degrees, and one that is closer to a 1,000 degrees. 
Ron's suits weren't magic and heat leaked in. My face was drenched with sweat, and by the time I found myself standing next to the outer edges of the inferno, but surprisingly, the helmet never fogged up. So, uh, kudos to the Ron for that one. There was a crackling sound from above me, and I jumped to one side purely by instinct. A fiery branch broke down and crashed to a place where I had been standing. Oh, sure, now I find a branch. There he is, a voice said from behind me. Really? The chimera was still here, masochists. I reached down and grabbed the branch with both hands. Yippee, the gloves didn't melt. I gripped the branch as far from the flaming end as I could and swung it around in a white arc. If there was a more beautiful sound in the universe than a chimera screaming in pain and a flaming branch smacks him against the jaw, I'm not sure what it might be. The chimera dropped to the ground and covered his face with his hands. His hair was smoldering and he seemed to be trying to smolder out the flames at his face. Well, I can help there. I stood on one foot and brought the other one to his head, repeatedly. It took about three good stomps before he stopped squirming. I did another ten, just to be sure the flames and his teeth were entirely out. Just to be sure that they were completely out, I punched his stomach a few times to force the air out. If his breath caused some embers to glow on his skin, I would know he needed more stomping. I didn't get my chance, as this is about the time the trees started exploding. I at first thought it was some alien forest fire deterrent as a line of trees off to my right and further into the blaze seemed to erupt in a shower of splinters, but then I saw a flash of metal as the vehicle shoved itself through the debris. The trees hadn't exploded because of a natural mechanism. An armored transport had fired its main cannon to clear a path. The vehicle was shaped like a dull gray block of metal with a ramp attached to the front. It hovered at a foot off the ground and had no visible windows, just large cannon mounted on top. The tip of the cannon glowed with a blue light. I dived to the ground and the cannon sounded again. Trees exploded behind me. Damn! I think I made them angry. I crawled over to my boot stomp buddy and searched him for weapons. He was carrying one of those assault rifle looking guns, but uh, to my disappointment, I couldn't find anything that looked like a trigger. They must have had some other way of firing the thing, but, uh, what? For some sort of neurological link to the battle armor used, if that was the case, I wondered what would happen if an unauthorized person touched it. I grabbed the gun and drew it towards me. Weapon has been compromised, the voice rattled from inside. Prepare to self. I didn't listen to the rest. I just tossed the damn thing under the armored vehicle and covered my head. The gun didn't explode instead, it overheated and released an entire contents of its battery as a sudden pall of energy. Blue light spread outwards from the thing, it engulfed the armor vehicle, the trees, the rocks, and then washed over me. My jaw was snapping open and closed as my arms and legs thrashed against the ground. Not exactly a seizure, but close enough. My camera buddy experienced one of his own, except he was unconscious, though he didn't get the full joy of having his head dribble itself against the hard ground. My helmet helped cushion the blow, so uh, other than having my eyeballs bounce around so much that I was half blind, I wasn't in danger of a concussion. Well, not a large one anyway. The seizure passed and I was too wiped out to stand. I hurt everywhere. No, really, I mean everywhere. Muscles, I didn't know I had ached. I felt like I had run a hundred miles across a burning desert while a hairy horseman thrashed me with barbed whips. It took everything I had to stay awake. Getting up and challenging people to round of fisticuffs was right out. The floating transport robbed and jerked from its side to side, probably the pilot having his own grand mole. It settled down, though, pretty quickly, so uh, I guess the armor helped protect them some. Spoil sports. A hatch opened and a very front of the smaller gun extended itself. The transport rotated and aimed the gun at me. I crawled. The effort was painful. I called it a Herculean, but that jerk got off easy with the demigod strength. I was just a measly mortal and I was dragging my useless body that seemed to weigh six tons. Inch by inch I dragged myself along. Like Chimera and the transport seemed still to be recovering as well as they didn't fire immediately. They just turned the ship and followed me. So I slowly crawled away from the fire, dragging myself along my belly. I reached out and gripped a tuft of grass, pulled, 
drag, reach out, grab a tuft of grass, pull some more, over and over until it happened. My hand struck something that was not grass. It was the body of a fallen chimera. I smiled. I pulled myself a bit closer to reach out to my side. When the rifle overloaded, I seen a... Yes, there it was. I had brought the rock down on its head three times before they shot me. I thought it might hurt. I was pleasantly surprised to find that it didn't. It felt like I was being restrained by a giant hand, but not hurt. My suit crackled with St. Elmo's fire. I was glowing, I was paralyzed, and I was alive. That's why I started to fly. I lifted off the ground, still frozen in place with a rock in my hand, and hovered a foot above the ground. I heard an armored transport rumble to life. Oh, is this a tractor beam? How nifty. I hovered above the ground and the transport crashed through the burning forest. Soon we were away from the fire and I began to cool off. I was almost frigid after the next intense heat for so long. We bumped along a bit more when the grew darker and darker as we moved further away from the fire. Soon everything was black save for a few inches immediately around me that were illuminated by my glowing suit. Finally, the light appeared up ahead. We steered towards it. A moment later, I could make out the light that was coming from a lamp above a large steel door. In front of the door stood eight of thirty. Stubborn, willful, and destructive, the counselor said testily. And what has it gained you? The problem with tractor beams is that they really don't give you the ability to flip someone off. I was completely immobile and not in the particularly chatty mood. Honestly, he said with a tusk, and look at Lanceman stares at stars. His skull will take forever to heal. I sighed and strangely human sound and focused on someone standing behind me. Where are the others? he asked. They have not been apprehended yet, Counselor. The voice admitted from behind. They have proven to be surprisingly adept at evading detection. Eight of thirty snorted with contempt. We should have been better prepared. He said, we have long known the soldier species react with erratic behavior and violence when they feel threatened. There was not muff middle fingers in all the earth to deal with the situation. When threatened was entirely the time for erratic behavior and violence. Bring him along, 8 or 30 decided at last. We will combine him and use him as bait for the others to attempt a rescue attempt. You believe they'll attempt to rescue them, counselor? The soldier behind me asked. Yes, the counselor sneered. These creatures set fire to the entire forest just to create a diversion. This one detonated a rifle to incapacitate the soldiers inside the half tank and bashed an unconscious soldier in the head with a stone after setting him on fire. They forgot the lobotomy via boot stomping, but um, I wasn't in much of a position to correct the oversight, so I remained silent. What else would the creatures do? The counselor finished. Bring him inside and she shall decide what we'll do with him there. The soldier pushed me and turned the handle on the large steel door. There was a click and it swung inward on unseen hinges. I voted towards the opening. Eight or thirty stepped in front of me and blocked my way. You probably proving the entirety more trouble than you are worth. Eight or thirty said in what was probably meant to be a threatening tone of voice. I concentrated. I focused every bit of wool I had onto my hand. It took every last erg of my remaining energy, but uh, slowly I felt my finger flex. With a strain of effort, I forced them to open. The rock dropped. Eight of thirty screamed as it landed on his big toe. I smiled and decided that now was an excellent time to black out. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 93 Written by Semi-Loki Ever since Quok and his crew kidnapped me, it seems that I've spent an inordinate amount of time waking up in unfamiliar prison cells. It was hard to not take it personally, and I was starting to feel a bit paranoid about humanity's potential relationship with the universe. Still, if you had to wake up in a prison cell, the one the Chimera kept was not that bad. I woke up lying on top of something that could be reasonably called a bed, or at least a bunk. Mostly, it was a shelf that extended out of one of the walls and with a thin mattress on top of it. That said, the shelf was built into human dimensions. 
I didn't hang off the edge when I was eventually swung my legs off to the one side. They found the floor without problems. The mattress, while thin, was actually surprisingly comfortable. I had a blanket and a pillow I'd been set, but this was a prison, so I had to do without some luxuries. I sat up and took stock. I was still wearing my rod suit. Odds were good that that was because they couldn't figure out how to get the thing off of me. I didn't see any obvious signs of damage, but that didn't mean that they didn't try and cut or burn it off of me, only that it hadn't worked. So, I was still clothed, better still. The Ron suit made sure that I still had a full belly and an empty bladder, so I felt pretty good as well. The cell was a featureless cube approximately 10 feet by 10 feet. One wall was missing. I could see out into a hallway that, um, like the room, was featureless and white in color. I didn't see the force field closing off the room, but I could tell that it was there. If I could see the hairs on my arm that had been standing on end as I neared it. As it was, I felt a faint tingling in the air. It was enough that I didn't need a sign to warn me from the attempting to step outside the room. The smell of ozone and the thought of a few thousand volts leaping across my gonads was enough to keep me in my place for now. I didn't expect to wait long, anyway. Mere minutes after I sat up and stretched out, eight of thirty appeared in front of my cell. He stayed well away from the invisible wall. They told me two things. He didn't want to get shocked by it either, and they must have been monitoring me somehow. Both were good to know. About time you showed up, I declared. I thought I might have to call Amnesty Interstellar. Where are your compatriots? The counselor demanded. You know, I really hate it when people just completely ignore the nonsense that I am babbling. He could have at least done me the courtesy of looking momentarily perplexed. How rude. Well, I said after a moment's thought, I believe the New England Patriots are based out of Boston and don't know the compatriots. Sounds Russian. I'd guess Moscow, maybe Propet, the other humans and the beasts you were with. Eight of thirty demanded. No more of your feeble attempts to confuse us. Feeble, I said indignantly. I excel in confusion. I bet you can't even tell me why the porridge bird lays the egg in the middle of the air. This is your last warning, he said. Tell me what I wish to know, or I'll be forced to execute you. Go right ahead, I said with an indifferent shrug as I flopped down on the mattress. Just be quick about it. I can't tell you. You know where they are. No, I don't, I said. But if you ask me nicely, I can tell you where they will be. Where is that? You'll have to do better than that. I didn't see what he did. Not exactly. It seemed to be a flick of the wrist, but the next thing I knew, someone was trying to play flight of the bumblebee by strumming every nerve in my body. I spasmed and quaked on top of the mattress. He jerked his wrist again, and it stopped. Where will they be? He demanded. Tap dancing on your grave, I bit out. He flicked his wrist again. I flopped around like a fish again. He flicked his wrist, and I'd stopped. Tell me what I want to know, he said. Yes, I said, your penis is smaller than average. Flick, flop, smack, flick. I was sweating. I was hurting, but I was also angry. I rolled off the bed and landed on falls in front of the invisible wall. They are in the... I allowed my voice to trail off. The idiot actually bent down and stuck his head near the wall to try out what I was saying. Lessons learned. One, the Ron suit does not insulate against electricity as well as the heat and cold. Oh well, guess I can't have everything. Two, I had hoped that having electricity flow through my arm instead of my chest might give me a better chance of survival. That may have been the case, actually, but that didn't stop it from hurting like hell. As I reached across the field and snatched 8 to 30 by the ear, it felt like my arm had a power line for an IV. Everything went black almost for a moment before my arm crossed the field. 3. You know that expression, oldest trick in the book? The Chimera apparently never read that book. I woke up some time later, lying on the ground beneath my bunk. My back ached and I could feel bruises welled up under the suit. I think that shock caused my legs to spasm and hurl me backwards into the wall. That might explain why eight of thirty's corpse was sprawled out on the floor in front of me. Yes, corpse. His body wasn't regenerating.
when I kicked it back and I dragged his head and heart through the electrical barrier, and uh, apparently there are limits to even Chimera Keening. Interesting. We could heal him, a voice said. We decided not to. I looked upwards from the corpse and found that there was an old man sitting in a chair watching me. The chair was a simple armless thing made of yellow plastic. It straddled the opening of my cell, half in my cell and half in the hallway. The barrier must be down, I realized. I was so shocked by this revelation that it took me a moment to really grasp the idea that there was someone sitting in a chair. Unlike the fake chimera, this one looked old. Not just gray hair. He had wrinkles, sunken cheeks, and the effects of gravity could be seen played out at his place. I guessed that he was in his eighties at the very least. Only his eyes looked young. They were bright and vivid green in color, and seemed to shine as if lit from behind by an inner flame. He wore a loose-fitting robe with sleeves. It was the color of the desert sand. The hood was thrown back, and the black rope fastened it about a narrow waist. Weirder than his age was his facial features. They didn't follow the sharp lines I associated with the fey. This was a softer face, more rounded with heavier bones. In short, he looked human, I asked. He smiled. No, he said. Chimera, just from all the stock. I looked again. He was right. The skin color and texture were wrong, a bit too pale and, despite the wrinkles, too smooth. He was like a porcelain doll fashioned into the likeness of an old man. Still, it was close. If you dropped him in the middle of a crowd and he'd been right in, for some reason, I found this deeply unsettling. They were faster and stronger than regular humans, yet I still felt the frail old man was a bigger threat. Who are you? I asked. He chuckled. Chimera don't have names, he explained. Not as you think of them, anyway. We have titles, we have descriptions, but no names. Still, if you insist, you may call me the Game Master. Right, I said with a nod. Good thing I'm a level 14 paladin, then. Ah, he said as he favored me with a thin smile. One of your comments designed to confuse and frustrate, yes? He glanced down at eight of thirty's corpse. Highly effective tactic with some, he conceded. I climbed out from under my bunk and attempted to stand. I was still weak in the knees, but I did find the energy at least to sit up in my bed. You said you could have healed him, I prompted. Yes, he agreed, as he returned his gaze upon me. As I am sure you are aware, your metabolism constantly functions in a highly accelerated state. The heat produced is barely inside the safe zone. If it is pushed much higher, your cells will detonate. I shrugged. Standing in between extinction and the cold, I chimed in, and explosive radiating growth, so the warm blood flows through the large four-chambered heart, maintaining a very high metabolism rate they have. Again, he said with a smile, an attempt to confuse, I think, but from what I could understand of you gather, you follow me. The point is that your unique physiology, while highly resilient to possessing impressive healing capabilities, even in its native form, can only be accelerated to a small degree. Cells can only be replicated so fast. In order to overcome this limitation, we have embedded artificial enhancements, non-biological mechanisms that provide rapid cloning of nanostitching. Do you understand me so far? Your Robocop rears, I agreed. I'll take that as a yes, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand. The point is that if a member of our species has demonstrated poor judgment or otherwise displayed traits that are considered non-beneficial to the genome, we can remotely deactivate many of these enhancements. I blinked. You turn off their immortality if they make you angry, I asked. Recklessness, he explained, often solves our problems for us. If the individual shows wisdom and caution, then, in time, their facilities might be restored without them even knowing that there was in danger. Eugenics mixed with Sean Connery post-apocalyptic loincloth nightmare, I said. Gotta hand it to you, Chimera. You really have a way of concentrating all your bad ideas. He flashed a thin-lipped smile and stood up. Perhaps you would care to go for a walk he suggested. 
We could discuss what other bad ideas you believe that we're harboring. I was torn. The offer was a golden opportunity. The Ron wanted me to wander around so that they could spy on the base. I could practically hear them screaming for me to accept the offer. The problem was, my legs still felt like Jenny. Maybe later, I said slowly. I sort of like the view here, and uh, I'm late for my hair appointment that it'll be simply months before Yolanda can squeeze me in again. Such reluctance, he said as he pursed his lips. Then his face brightened and he looked for his comprehension passed over. Ah, he said, of course, I should have realized. Let me get you a restorative. I didn't like the sound of that and was about to suggest he shoved the restorative up the south side of the north-going chimera when he flicked his wrist at me. The move looked similar to 8 of 30 had used, but the effect had the exact opposite effect. All of my aches and pains vanished, as if they had been switched off. I felt strong, like a cocaine and Viagra speedball followed by a Mark McGuire steroid shake strong. I felt better than I had in months, rested, refreshed, alert, and hearty. I felt like I had grown six inches and was wearing a flannel and a glorious beard as I juggled chainsaws in a redwood forest. It was everything that Old Spice commercials promised, but without the lingering chemical burns to your armpits. What the hell was that? I asked as I leaped to my feet. I didn't really have much of a choice. Sitting down was no longer an option. If I didn't find somewhere to run a few laps, I might vibrate through the crust of the planet and pent up nervous energy. I stepped out of my cell and into the hallway. The game master followed. A restorative... The game master explained, We have implemented nanites in your body. My associate used them to induce pain. I have used them to block it and supply you with additional energy. You infected me with nanomachines, I squeaked. What the hell else are you doing in there? Mapping out your genome, of course, he said. Haven't you guessed? You surprised us. We want to find out how. By being mean, I said. Now get them out. He chuckled at that and started walking down the hallway. I was forced to follow. I did try and warn them that this might happen, he admitted. Just between you and I, my species can be rather arrogant lot. I didn't warn them, though, and they were emulators, not originators. If you take a wooden shard, carve it into a dagger, and paint it silver, it doesn't make it a blade. I don't know, I said. Let me stab you a few times with a wooden shard and let's find out. There! The man said with a nod. Exactly what I'm talking about. We can approximate so much of your behavior. But at our core, we are still not humans. We are and shall always be Chimera. Why would you want to be a human? I asked. Ah, there you got to the very heart of the matter, he said with a nod of approval. In truth, we don't. However, in addition to arrogance, we are also an envious lot. We saw what you possessed and we did envy you. Your speed, your aggression, your resilience. All of this. But more than anything, we envied your ability to make things happen. You are still wild things. If you are chained, you howl and claw at the chains looking like a weak link. You shatter all things that are fragile and delicate. You sow destruction in your wake. That is your sorrow, but also your greatest gift. From destruction comes beauty. You force us to repel and regrow. That is how we become stronger and better. Oh, bloody hell. Not this rhetoric. Every pocket revolutionary spouts the same nonsense. To build something better, you must tear down the old, even if you agree with it. A sensible person will make sure that he has one foot in a new boat before setting the old ship ablaze. Morons, however, can't wait for more new boat to arrive and then release sarin gas in the subway. Please, I said with a shake of my head. Spare me. I've heard it before. You know, sometimes destruction is just destruction. There is a difference between tearing down the old to controlled manner and salvaging the parts versus setting off a bomb. You can't learn from something that is lost forever. Maybe we have learned what we need to know, he said with a smile. Then you're a bigger idiot than I thought you were and wasting everyone's time. He laughed at that. His laugh sounded genuine, like I had said something I found truly amusing. Again, it was an oddly human behavior. 
In my admittedly limited interactions with both Fei and Chimera, neither of them seemed prone to laughter. Game Master, on the other hand, seemed to be in a state of perpetual amusement. We had been walking as we spoke. All the hallways emptied into a larger room where I saw hundreds of Chimera wandering around. Most of them looked like Fei. A handful, however, looked like something only semi-human. The Fei Chimera wore clothes and looked like uniforms, snug fitting pants and tunics. Some even wore jackets over their tunics. The uniforms were in a variety of colors, dark orange, sage green, and light blue. But the pants and the tunics were always matched colors. Jackets, on the other hand, were always dark blue in color with a gold fringe. Other than the game master, I saw no robed chimera. I mentioned the clothing only because the semi-humanoid chimera wore none at all. But that is not to say that they were naked. Their bodies were dark red in color so dark that it bordered on black, and were entirely encased in a chitin shell. The arms and legs looked almost human, but too many joints in the arms and legs were too narrow. The hands terminated in four-fingered hand, small vestigial wings flooded against their backs, while tight-fitting plates of chitin outlined the muscles along their chests and abdomen. The similarity to humans ended with their shoulders, however. On top of their shoulders sat a run face. These must be the Chimera who had eaten the Ron, I realized. They had started off as Fey, and then the two conflicting genomes had created this weird hybrid form. I felt instant revulsion upon seeing them. There was something wrong about this amalgam creature, something that had triggered some primal instinct. I wanted to flee. They were a contagion, something to be shunned and eradicated lest it spread to healthy populace. I tried to suppress these emotions and looked at the Game Master. You're supposed to dine with your captives, I said slowly, not upon them. His grin broadened. Ah, you definitely are well informed, he said approvingly. Some were worried about that. Eight of thirty where he was, well, you might think of him as a member of the experimental genome line. Most Chimera do not favor boldness. We did a test batch of boldness. Eight of thirty's aggressiveness served him well at the time. He even permitted him a place in the council. When we discovered what had landed on this planet, his voice was the loudest, and it was he who was the wheels in motion for how we made contact with you. I advised against it. His failure has been dealt with, as you well know. I met his gaze and frowned. You don't need to eat people to dig tunnels, I said. Why are you doing this? He waved an arm to indicate the human-run hybrid chimera. Lesser chimera, he explained. Does it surprise you to find that our society is quite hierarchical? The apex chimera are permitted to choose their own form, but lesser chimera are instructed on what DNA they must incorporate and express. You didn't answer my question. No, I did not, he said, smile fading. Quite astute. His eyes remained locked with mine. He wanted me to guess. Great. So I dusted off the old thinking cap and tried to get an engine to turn over. Except no matter how I look at it, the answer kept coming up the same. The Ron were natural burrowers, true, so by adopting their brains, their bodies, Chimera, would come more elegant tunnels or have better understanding of three-dimensional space. But that's about it. Benefits end right there. Even the Ron were equipped with diamond-tipped drawbits nose. A machine would do the job better and faster than any animal. How? This was true of Earth-level tech. Even the Ron used artificial means to make their burrows now. So digging tunnels could not be the primary goal. It had to be a bonus. So what benefit is there to kidnapping and eating Ron babies other than to make the Ron angry? Answer? None at all. You're trying to start a conflux Ron war, I said, and you're trying to frame the conflux. He took a step back and favored me with a mocking bow. I agree to fellow game master, he said with a sarcastic tone. Except that you're wrong about one small detail. I am not trying. I have placed the blame squarely on the conflux. The Ron will blame the conflux and seek retribution. Now ancient enemies will be exterminated. Yeah, I said. Don't be so sure about that, blame master. The Ron aren't quite as dumb as you are. If this is the extent of your gaming ability, I think you may have just won the conflux as an ally. Great job, jerk. You just got a biggest kid in the block mad at you. 
That doesn't matter, the game master countered. The war is not the end game. I pondered that statement. It's a feint, I concluded. Something to distract the conflux and the run from the real attack. He held his hands out wide. Now you see why the third wave truly came to an end. He intoned his face with me, but he spoke like he was preaching to an unseen audience. The conflux believes that we were forced to retreat after they destroyed our weapon planets. He cried out in an invisible parish, fleeing from their might. They did not see that we were never retreating. The third wave never truly ended. For is it not said that the third wave was set is the strongest? This has all been an elaborate ruse. We found something better than weapons. We found that human brains are tasty, I interrupted. He faltered and seemed to lose his place. He either didn't get much practice with the whole even villain monologuing thing, or he wasn't used to jerks interrupting him. Unfortunately, I was not feeling particularly patient. You didn't just tinker with humans, I went on. You started dining on them. That much is pretty obvious. So I'm guessing our ability to think tactfully seeped into you somewhere along the line, and you realized that your strategy of big ships sitting in the sky while ground troops duked it out in the mud would never get you anywhere. So you came up with what? A plan that requires a hundred thousand years to implement? Did your cable company have you on hold this entire time? The game master's face finally lost its perpetual amused look. The smile lines on the face crinkled as his face twisted into a new expression. One of anger. You would do well to hold your tongue, he warned. Did you not pay attention to my colleague? Your conflux has already lost the war. The galaxy was destroyed fifty years ago. You keep saying that, but I don't think it has been, I countered. Why else would I be having this rather dull conversation? His smile returned. We are talking because I am offering you one last chance, he said. Your place was never with the conflux. They will never trust you or permit you to leave the quarantined world. Come back to the Chimera. Join us, else you shall meet the fate of the rest of the galaxy. With that, he spun around and gestured towards the corner of the room. Others have already seen the wisdom in accepting the gift we offer. He declared as if it was somehow supposed to explain everything. I looked in the direction he was pointing. The room itself had a small, unfinished look to it. Smooth, industrial walls that ended abruptly to show exposed stone. Tools cluttered the floor just outside the walkways, while piles of dust shoved its evidence of boot prints, where people had wandered off the patch towards the construction sites. The pile of rocks that the game master had indicated, I at first thought was just most cast-offs of whatever digging was taking place. It seemed to be nothing more than a small pile of red rocks, but uh, now that he drew my attention to it, I saw that it wasn't really a pile of stones at all. It was an irregular lump of red crystal. Also... It was glowing. Retrade attack, I guessed. He grinned once more. That smile was really getting on my nerves. I stepped closer to the lump crystal, and the game master followed me. This is what is jamming our senses on the planet. They saw the wisdom of joining us. The game master repeated, And soon you shall too. I really do- Ah, crap! My feet had become entangled with one another, and I was sent sprawling to the floor. My head would have bounced off the lump of crystal if I hadn't got my hand up in time and braced myself. As it was, my nose collided with the back of my glove. My nose exploded in a shower of red as I rolled away and came to a rest flat on my back, with tears streaming out of my eyes. Why? I stammered as I covered my bloody nose with my hand. Would you ever want to be a human? I opened my eyes, and I was not terribly surprised to find four Chimera guards standing over me, with their rifles trained upon me. My legs melt as if they were encased in ice. From the waist down, I was completely numb. The game master stepped closer and flicked his wrist. Feeling rushed back to my legs so quickly it burned. I did not give you permission to approach the device, he said. Next time, I said, voice thick when I felt my nose swell. A little warning first. I am growing wary of your words, he told me. I am giving you one last chance, your only chance of survival. Tell me what we wish to know. How did you arrive here? How did we find the others? And how did you discover us? 
Who told you our secrets? Not last this, and you may join us and survive the end of the galaxy. Refuse, and you die before everyone else. The choice is yours. I wiped my nose and lowered my hands from my face. I just figured out why you call yourself the Game Master, I said in an offhand way. It's meant to be ironic. You suck at them, right? He held his hand upwards as if prepared to twitch it. There you go, I said. The moment things don't go your way, you throw a tantrum and knock all the pieces off the board. Games are supposed to have an element of risk. If you are the only one allowed to have pieces and don't let other players do anything, that's not a game. You are too afraid to lose, so you cheat. His wrist didn't move, but his head did. He cocked his head to the one side and narrowed his gaze at me. Human, he said patiently. Your tactic of manipulation by annoyance has grown stale. Not a tactic, I said as I tried to rise to my feet. My legs were wobbly again, but I wasn't about to ask for another restorative. Not a tactic and not a trick, I said. A statement of fact. I'm calling your bluff. You said the galaxy has been destroyed and you've won, but so far all I've seen are lies. Honor in death had no honor. Eight in thirty acted alone. You are too afraid to play a game because you know you will lose. You're liars. I see no reason to fear you. You may kill me because I am right here and you outnumber me, but the rest, pure bluff. He lowered his hand. I sense a challenge, he said with a sly smile. I nodded. In fact, I said, plunging in with both feet with reckless abandon, I'm going to let you cheat and I'll still kick your rear. You name the game. You go ahead and pick the game I've never played before and I'll still kick your rear. You are a fool. And you are a coward, I said. What's the problem? Too much risk in even an unfair fight. You can only play if you're guaranteed a win. I would win no matter what. Then prove it. I said, what do you have to lose? The question is, what do I have to gain? He corrected me, what is your game? You're supposed to be the game master, I said. Maybe I just want to see if you're really that good. The creases in his face deepened. He knew that this was a trick, but I had issued a challenge publicly. The eyes of the gods flicked from me to the game master and back again. He could refuse, he could walk away. We both knew that he wouldn't. I gain nothing, he reminded me. Fine, I said. If you win, I surrender. I'll tell you everything I know, I'll join your side, and I'll do everything I can to talk my friends in and any other human you choose into joining your army or your buffet table. I will yield to your superior mind. However, when I win, you will let us go and the run you kidnapped. When you win he said. You really are that confident. I shrugged. I am the original, I declared. You are just a cheap knockoff. His frown disappeared when it was replaced with a smile. It was not a kindly smile. It was a smile that said that he had made a mistake and I would now pay for it with my life. Not good enough, he said. You are a prisoner. Your time cannot be wasted. Mine can. Therefore, I have some additional conditions you must meet. This will not be just a game. This will be an interrogation. I raised an eyebrow at him. He glanced to one side and nodded for one of the Chimera. The Chimera's lips twitched in a mocking grin. I really didn't like where this was going. Still, I needed to buy time. The Game Master was right. This was a ruse. I couldn't win a game against him, not exactly, but there were multiple ways to win a fight. The Chimera returned holding a small vial of black liquid. Drink this, and the game master said, and then we shall begin. I took the vial and looked at the liquids inside. It was thick and clung to the sides of the clear glass vial. It clumped as I swirled the vial. It looked like an engine grease. What is this? I asked while making no attempt to hide my revulsion. A nanite solution, he said. A special blend of nanites. Once you drink the nanomachines, we'll immediately migrate to your brain. My brain. I asked as I held the vial at arm's length. Yes, he said as he reached over and shoved the vial back towards me. The nanites will bind with your higher brain functions and suppress your ability to lie. You will feel compelled to answer any and all questions put upon you. 
I wanted to fling the thing away. You want me to inflict brain damage upon myself before competing against you? I asked then and shook my head. You really are a cheater. Do not be so melodramatic. The game master replied with a click of his tongue. Your human neurology will eventually destroy these nanites. This effects are temporary and the status is slight. Even still, yes, I require you to drink the solution. I need you to do it voluntarily. As the nanites enter your brain, you'll be tempted to resist, to fight. If you do so, the results will be unpleasant. Unpleasant for who? I asked. For both of us, he admitted, your ability for deception will not be impacted by other higher functions will be compromised. These effects will be far more permanent. So, do you agree? I shook the vial. You claim this is safe? I asked. If you do not resist and follow our instructions to the letter, he said. I thrust the vial at him. After you, I said with a smile. A question for a question. He wrinkled his nose at it and frowned. I shrugged. If you win, I join you, I said with a smirk. Then you would answer my questions anyway, right? So, if you are really confident that you'll win, you lose nothing. Only if you lose will this be a problem. Unless, of course, it really does impact your game-playing ability. He rolled his eyes and took a deep gulp. A look of disgust painted itself across his features as he swallowed it. He must taste as bad as it looked. No more stalling. He said as he pushed the vial at me, and no more rules, no more conditions. Do this or you forget your games. I took the vial from him. Bottoms up, I thought, as I swallowed. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 94. Written by Semi Loki. The good news that drinking the nanites didn't make me feel any different, other than the unpleasant aftertaste. It was like chugging a warm slurpy laced with turpentine. I lowered the vial and looked at the game master. He smiled and drank an identical-looking vial someone had provided him. What is your name? he asked me. What? I stammered. The nanites need to map your brain, he said. Quickly, your name. Jason Reese. Your mother's name? Olivia, I admitted. Sexual preference? Heterosexual, I said. But I feel a bit weird after watching Dolph Lundgren in Masters of the Universe. Pretty sure that's normal, though. The hell? I never told anyone that before. But, um, just for the record, it's normal, damn it. Tell me the last lie that you told your mother, the game master ordered me, that I'd pay her back the money that she loaned me. I couldn't help myself at this point. It wasn't that I couldn't lie, precisely. I just started talking before I could mentally filter my answers. The perfect truth serum. Wait, he took it too, didn't he? Do Chimera eat their own boogers? I asked. From time to time, he admitted. Eyes went wide. That's an, um, uh, he stammered. If you saw a three-foot-tall mound of pudding, would you rather eat it or have sex with it? I asked. What? He answered, but blurted out. It depends on how quickly I arrived. I might eat it, but only if I was certain that no one else had sex with it. Stop with these insane questions. Of course, I said. I would never want to publicly embarrass you by asking you if you like the idea of having several hot buttered toads poured down your robe. No! Well, maybe. Stop it! I smiled at him. He rubbed his temples and shot me an exasperated look. If you ask one more such question, he said, I will withdraw my offer. I will simply employ more traditional methods of information extraction. You mean torture? I replied. There was not a question. Yes, he agreed, and your nanites will guarantee your honesty. According to the research we've done on Earth, I babbled, torture really isn't effective in interrogations. You get a lot of false information as people tell you whatever they think that you want to hear, if you'll just stop. I am willing to take that risk, he snapped. Are you? Not really, no. I decided to not move on asking about granny porn fetishes. He must have taken the silence as an indication that I was going to cooperate after all, because he motioned for me to follow him as he walked down the corridor. I had not noticed before. The game we shall play, he told me as we walked, is called Mlock, and it's quite popular amongst our kind. I take it you've never played it before. You know I haven't, I said, but uh, it's not like it matters. I'll still beat you. He shot me a strange look. 
Strange, he said. I assumed your boasting was cease at this point. You should find it quite difficult to lie. Either you are exerting yourself in a pitiful attempt to undermine my confidence, or you truly believe that you have some sort of natural advantage. I shrugged. Are you any good at Mroc? I asked. I am the best player amongst all Chimera, he replied. He said that in a matter-of-fact post with absolutely no hint of pride. He may as well have been telling me that he keeps vanilla extract in his pantry. Good, I said. That helps. How can that help you? He asked. Because, I said, you have to make sure every move you make is perfect every time. All I have to do is wait for you to make a mistake. One time. The Nanites didn't center that one because it wasn't a lie. It was pure nonsense, like shouting out that colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Still, I saw the game master flinch as I said them. Either he had more doubts than he admitted to, or, more likely, he took some meaning from the words I never intended. It didn't matter, however. I wasn't trying to psych him out. I was trying to figure out how much leeway I had with the Nanites. Surprisingly, I had some... I wasn't so good at having a freewheeling lie mode enabled, but I was permitted some selective wording and creativity. This was important as the distinction between selective wording and with creativity and out-and-out -out lying is a fairly subtle one. This wasn't like the truth serum on Earth. That stuff is more like an anesthetic. It takes effort to lie. You have to know what is real and the construct of plausible alternative. A neat bit of fiction that fits the situation is a favorable way. If you think about it, lying is actually pretty hard. Yet, you can do it pretty quickly because, hey, that's part of what makes humans awesome. Ready access to bullcrap. Truth serums take the ability away by making it too difficult to think of a good lie. Except that it doesn't necessarily mean what is being said is the truth. There is still some debate on the effectiveness of the various truth serums and if there is being related to the truth or some sort of free association nonsense. What I'm getting at is that forcing someone to tell the truth when they didn't want to is a bit trickier than it sounds. On earth we dope them until they are barely conscious and what we may or may not get is be reliable. In space, they shove microscopic machines in your head and you spend a few minutes figuring out how close to lying you can get away with. Obviously, there are weaknesses to both methods. I just had to hope the game master hadn't figured out this one. We walked down the flight of stairs into a small windowless room. In the middle of the room was a circular table with a stool on either side. The table and the stools looked as if they were made from the same material as the floor. In fact, it looked like the floor had been stretched upwards and molded into a furniture. There was no break between the floor and the furniture. Just three poles with flat surfaces on top. On top of the table was what looked like a map of the Milky Way. I guess I got closer, I realized that I wasn't a map at all. It was a board for a game. It was circular in shape, and the two spiral arms were somewhat stylized and blocky looking. As I got closer, I could see that the spiral arms were actually made up of a series of blocks. In the center of the board was a large square representing the galactic core. The game master waved me to one of the stools. I sat down. He smiled at me as he took the opposite stool and retrieved two bags from inside the pockets of his robe. Why was I not surprised that he carried the pieces around with him? He tossed me a pouch. I opened the bag and looked inside. There were quite a few tiny pieces inside, mostly a bunch of small green pieces shaped like bullets. The next most common piece was a larger red piece with a triangular in shape. After that were six blue cubes that were larger. Lastly, there were four black spheres on a pedestal. The game master saw my puzzled look. In that pouch, he said, you'll find seventeen gunners, ten dreadnoughts, six heavy cruisers, and four strangers. Strangers, I asked. The others made sort of sense as they sounded like spaceships, and, uh, given the board's design, this was apparently some sort of mock space battle. But what the hell was a stranger? I shall get to that, he said. Please be patient. Malok is turn-based game. You will note that at the end of each of the borders are 16 places where you can place your pieces. I glanced down and noted that the arms of the galaxy flared out at the ends. One arm terminated at my side at the board and the other at his own. At the end of the arms were 16 squares for pieces, two rows of eight. 
as the row just beyond that was only six spaces wide, and the next row was only four, after that it narrowed down to three. There were three more rows that were three spaces wide, and then it narrowed down once more to a space only two wide. At the point of the arm curved towards the core of the middle, two rows of two by two followed by one space squares before it met the middle. The core, I now realized, was a three by three square of spaces. The object of the game, he said, is to seize the core. You must occupy all six spaces, or you must effectively lock your opponent in his arm of the galaxy so that he cannot capture the core. To capture a piece, you must jump over it and empty the space beyond it. That's getting ahead of ourselves. He pointed at my pouch again. You can make up your army in any combination of pieces you like, he said. You are permitted seventeen ships, sixteen on board pieces, and one reserve you keep hidden. You must pick your reserves before the game starts. Do you understand? I nodded and pointed at the sixteen squares closest to me. I put sixteen pieces here and hold one in my hand, I said. Half correct, he corrected me. You can put sixteen there, however, if you pick a stranger, you can put it anywhere on the board, including on my side. However, be warned, strangers are a two-edged sword. They cannot be captured, but they can be moved by either player, and they can be captured ships of either side. I stared at the four black pieces dubiously. Why would you ever want to use them? I asked. It adds an element of chance, he explained. Strangers make strategies difficult to implement. They can also be used to form temporary blockades. Well, it is true that the piece can be moved by either side, but you must sacrifice your turn to move it. So, to remove a blockade, you must allow your opponent a chance to further his advance on your own side. I looked at the black spheres again. And the other pieces? I asked. The gunners are the fastest he said. You can make them move two or three spaces at a time in any direction. The dreadnoughts are the next fastest, up to two spaces in any direction. All other pieces can only move one space at a time. Dreadnoughts and heavy cruisers can attack diagonally as well as straight on. Gunners can only attack forwards, backwards, and to the immediate sides. Dreadnoughts, on the other hand, can attack in any direction. The space immediately behind your opponent's piece does not have to be empty for you to capture it. If there is a space diagonally beyond it, they may be captured to piece as well. The heavy cruisers are the same except that they can capture a ship two spaces away or capture a ship that is immediately before them and has an opening two beyond. Is this clear so far? Gunners are up and down, left and right, I said. Dreadnoughts can jump to any three squares that are just behind the opponent. Heavy gunners can jump to those three spots or beyond if needed. Strangers can attack any adjacent piece, even your own. Correct, he said. As your first ship touches the core, you may bring out your first reserve, but not before. It starts at your end of the board and works its way forward. Traditionally, most people prefer to use a dreadnought or a gunner for that role. The gunner because it is fast, but the dreadnought because it has only piece that can jump over your own pieces. You will note that the opening to the core is only one square wide, a natural bottleneck that allows for a blockade. If a ship occupying that spot is on your own, you may jump over it. Why would you want to leave one of your own ships there? I asked. Doesn't that count as barricading yourself in if you're on side? Yes, he agreed. But if you notice, if a ship occupies the corner of the core, it cannot be jumped over. As long as it holds that position, it cannot be removed. If all four corners are occupied by the same side, then it is possible to capture the core, but only if all four corners are held by the same side. If even one corner is occupied by an opponent, there is no way to capture the core. However, as the least one ship is no longer in the arm bleeding the core, that means the complete barricade is also not possible. So what? A stalemate? I asked. This is not a game that can result in a draw, he corrected me. You may only win or lose. If you do not lock your opponent into his side before all corners are occupied, the game becomes a reversal. In a reversal game, it ends when the two ships reach the starting row of their own line. We then find out who has the most ships and they are declared the winner. 
Most games end in a reversal, truthfully, as it is hard to lock someone into their own side, harder still to seize all four corners early enough. Both possibilities require you to use speed of the gunners. Once the game is declared a reversal, you can actually wish to form a blockade for your own side, because if your opponent sends the ship into your side before the game ends, he may pick off your retreating pieces, and thus have a higher score. The dreadnoughts are especially powerful in forming blockades, as they can leap over the existing ships and use it to shore up weaknesses. Clear? Yes, I said. So, what's to stop someone using all gunners and keeping most of them back and sending three to the core for reversal? That is called the Fool's Gambit, he agreed. A popular strategy amongst novice players. There are two flaws with it. The first is that gunners are easiest ships to block. If I get to the core first, and two ships across the core to your side before you can seize the corners, then you get barricaded in and you lose. Remember, a gunner can only move in a straight line. They are also only able to capture a ship that is touching it. A partial blockade can be formed with the single ship if the capturing ship it puts the attacker in a bad position to get to the corners. The other problem with that is that my reverse piece might be a stranger. If I elect to put it directly in front of your piece, I can use it to whittle down your forces. You cannot capture the stranger, so once it is placed in your camp, you can only move it away. I frowned. But then you can also put a stranger at the beginning and keep them from ever getting two ships in during a reversal. I pointed out. Excellent, he said. That is known as hounding. The stranger keeps pushing that the retreating forces back out. To avoid hounding, one generally moves the opposing stranger further away from the rear during a normal play, so as to force the opponent to waste moves sending the stranger back. Also, I should mention that no player is permitted to play the same stranger twice in a row, so successful hounding can be difficult to accomplish, as your opponent simply has to force you to move it into a better position, and then rush past you for the turn that you cannot move it. The rules were starting to give me a headache. It was a bizarre mixture of chess checkers, Chinese checkers, and go. What arrangement of ships you picked at the beginning basically decided the game. How do you know who goes first? I asked. He picked up two of his own pieces. The colors of the pieces were different. His strangers were white, his gunners were blue, and his heavies were red. Well, that made it easier to keep the pieces straight. Two of the pieces he selected were a gunner and a dreadnought. He cupped his hands together and shook them, and then balled his fist together and held them out to me. Select a hand, he said. If you select a dreadnought, you go first. I tapped the right hand. It was the gunner. He smiled. Too bad, he said sweetly. Be smart about how you arrange your army. He returned his pieces to his pouch and studied the board for a moment before selecting two heavy gunners. Is there a rule against watching your opponent select? I asked. Higher level players often employ cards to hide their pieces until the game begins, he said. We'll call them blinders. However, since you're a novice, I thought I would allow you to chance to see my arrangement. Not necessary, I said. Go ahead and use them. As you wish, he said, and he tossed the two pieces back into his pouch and reached into his pockets, again to produce two large cards. At the bottom of the cards were a pair of feet that allowed us to put them in front of our pieces while we assembled our armies. I put the gunners in all six positions in the front row. After a moment's thought, I put two or more in the middle of my second row. Two either side of those I put a dreadnought. On the very ends I put two heavies. I looked at the, the game master and was smiling at me. Are you ready to begin? He asked. Yes, I agreed. Excellent, he said. And where are your friends? In the caves outside, I almost answered. I just barely caught myself. Outside, I said. In the woods, I think. I don't know the exact position. Nanites let it slide. That was close enough to the truth. He nodded and reached across the board to place two stranger pieces in the other side of my blinder. Then we may begin, he said. The rules made the game seem complicated. It was worse than that. As soon as the game began, the game master strangers began attacking my gunners. I could have moved the pieces, but I decided to make a break for the core. How did you find out so much about our kind? He asked me. 
I nearly had to bite my tongue to keep from bloating out at the dawn vengeance. A former ally of yours, I said instead. You left him behind and he resented it. Really, he said, and who might this be? It's my turn for a question, I pointed out. The nanites protested, but I felt the pressure of the back of my skull as the urge to spill my guts intensified. Oh, very well, the game master said with a bored voice. The pressure led up, and he had written the question, and I wasn't required to answer it. Why are you eating the Ron? I asked. Why not? He said with a shrug. You're supposed to answer my question, I pointed out. Am I? He said as he gave me a sharp look. Perhaps I need reminding. Why are you eating them? I repeated. He sighed. To infuriate the Ron, he replied impatiently. The Ron are already xenophobic, and they are forcibly protective of their offspring. We desire war, conflict, and strife. If nothing else, the Ron will retreat and become more insular. They will be far too preoccupied to notice the destruction of the galaxy until it is too late. You keep mentioning you destroyed the galaxy, but you don't mention how, I said. He wagged his finger at me. My turn, he said. I sighed. I'd gotten three gunners into his turn around, and they were now being funneled in towards the core. In comparison, the game master seemed less concerned with getting his chips out. He spent more of his time using these strangers to harass me. Since he was using two of them, he could spend a turn after turn cutting into my forces, his own ships barely reaching the turnaround. Why did you take the dire blade? He asked me. The hell? It was there for the taking, I admitted, with no attempt to censor myself. We were being held there until they figured out what to do with us. Since one of the options was to kill us, we thought that it was best not to let them make that decision. How were you able to steal the ship? he asked. Technically speaking, it was my turn to ask a question, but I let it slide. A drop of my blood touched the genetic sensor, I said. It recognized the DNA signature as a human and thought that the crew had returned. He sighed. Honestly, he commented, centuries of planning nearly undone because we forgot to apply a filter. Unbelievable. You need Dyer, I asked. We will all the ships we planted in the complex territory, he admitted. Do you think that they will be left behind due to neglect? Wait, this is all about the Dyer. You mean all of this is because we stole the ship you needed for your master plan, I asked. He moved a piece on the board. I looked down and saw that he had somehow slipped the dreadnought around the turnaround. I hadn't used any stranger pieces, so his entire force was still intact. I, on the other hand, was down to six gunners and a single dreadnought. The destruction of the galaxy will be incomplete, he explained. Without every ship, we do not have the adequate overlappings of effects. What effects? I asked. My turn, he reminded me. I waved at him to speak. He nodded his thanks. What have you done to our ship? he asked. I don't know where it is, I said. True, the nanites allowed it. How did you destroy the galaxy? I asked. He smiled and did not like that smile. It was being over 40,000 years since the end of the last invasion, he said. What do you imagine those ships have been doing since that time? Sitting, I asked. Collecting, he corrected me. A fraction of a percent of the stellar output of the star that they are orbiting, collecting compound and concentrated, too small to drain to be noticed, an infinitesimal dimming of star's light, a few thousand years short of life, a trivial amount, but with time it adds up to such and much energy, energy enough to punch a small hole. A small hole, I asked. He smiled. Fifty years ago we activated the ships, he said. There were so many of them. They activated their metaspace drives and then discharged their weapons inside metaspace all at once. Do you understand? No, I admitted, and that counts as one of your questions. He grimaced. A tear, he said. They have opened a tear in the membrane between this universe and metaspace. Our reality has been bleeding into metaspace. Metaspace, however, in addition to allowing faster travel, has some other, um, alternative physics. Unfortunately for our galaxy, the resting energy state of metaspace is lower and more stable than our own. I believe you call it collapsing in the false vacuum. I didn't want to know what that meant, but it didn't sound good. 
What does that mean? I asked. Ordinarily, he said, a bubble of destruction spreads out in all directions at the speed of light leading to the eradication of the entire universe. However, in this case, the result is a bit more tempered. The membrane of reality will heal. The leak is slowed and the wave of destruction, well, peters out as local physics assert themselves. The lower energy state is not on the side of the membrane after all. According to our calculations, the bubbles tends to reach maximum radius almost a thousand light years before the tear is fully repaired and the wave is forced back. Do you see now? We have moved our ships to key points throughout the galaxy to open these rifts. The rifts that will wipe out the galaxy save for <clears throat> a small part of beyond the reach. My gunner ship had just reached the space before the core. So, you're going to wipe out everything but Chimera space? I asked. That's how you got fair traders to help you. Once you deployed your weapons, you've got only safe space in town for them to go to. Precisely, he agreed. Your ship, the Diablade, was scheduled to move to the Galactic Core and rid us of these pesky Galactic Council and the so-called teachers in one fell stroke. Then you botched it up by stealing it ten years before it was scheduled to begin its journey. This was never about humans, I thought. Oh crap, Dyer was heading for the galactic core. That's where the overseer was. Crap, crap, crap. You look panicked, the game master commented. Did you realize the futility of your strategy? The nanites in my head treated it like an interrogation question. No, I said, I'm still gonna win. He rolled his eyes. This is growing tiresome, he said. You have too few ships to seize the core. The best you can hope for is a reversal, in which as case I have more ships and can continue to attack yours. You have already lost. No, I said, as I moved my first gunner into the core. I have not. Who are the teachers and what do they have to do with anything? Them, he snorted. I believe you call them the Abjugators, though neither title is entirely correct. They have been with us since the dawn of time. Ethereal creatures not made of matter. A being of pure information, or oh, so they claim. Did you know that they led us to believe that they could evolve ourselves into super sentient? We based our entire civilization around the belief that we could become the supreme being. We altered ourselves and took the best of every civilization we encountered. Then, one day, we found out that the teachers were hiding one of these fabled super sentients captive. Captive on the very laboratory where we experimented on your kind. Do you know what we found when we met this creature? A joke. A weak and broken thing that cowered in the darkness of its cell. He shook his head and seemed to lose interest in the game. So weak, he said, and so wrong. It was star-spawned and had been crafting terrestrial creatures to our genome. The teachers deliberately misled us. They took us down the wrong path. He laughed. Still, he said, the universe is not without its ironies. They asked us to focus on your kind, and so we did. Do you know what we found? Sex appeal and margaritas, I guessed. He shifted his attention back to the game and moved the heavy gunner to turn around. No, he said, we found the potential for a more powerful psychic globe than any we had come across before. That was crude and unfinished, but we could use it. The teachers were beings of pure information, and for the past few thousand years, we've been polluting that information. You've meddled with the genome of the abjugators too, I asked. His grin broadened. Indeed, he said. Subtle changes for the moment. We have been using them to, well, direct the actions here within the conflux. However, once the membrane tears reach the critical state of conflux, the Ron and the, all the others will be left with no choice but to surrender to us or face annihilation. All save for the teachers. They die. I reached for the board and paused. Then why did the abjugators threaten us? I asked. What? The game master sputtered. If you control them, why did they threaten me and demand that I allow them to spy on Earth and the sphere? I asked, why was a ship allowed to enter the quarantine and bring us out? Why not just leave humans alone to perish? He looked blank. I don't understand what you mean, he said with a blink. 
We believed all humans were exterminated. The quarantine was irrelevant as we no longer required Earth for our plans. When radio signals were detected from your sector, we did our best to suppress these reports, to keep the Comflux unaware of your possible survival. But your signals continued to arrive in greater and greater strengths. Your progress was too fast, so we planted a suggestion that the church go investigate. We wanted to monitor your progress to find out if you would become a threat before the plan could come to fruition, or if you may be willing to serve your former masters. What happened was unexpected. The abjugators, I mused, they threatened me, but that didn't come from you. They even pointed me in the direction of the sphere. You've been to the sphere, he asked. Obviously, I said, your control over the abjugators isn't as strong as you claim. They're fighting you, aren't they? They weren't trying to punish humanity. They were trying to eliminate your psychic food stock. You do not know what you're talking about, he snapped. We control all. We have already won. He then pointed at the board. As is true of this game, he said, you have already lost. No, I said. I still haven't played my reserve piece. It is irrelevant, he said. I smiled at him and reached to my wrist and my left sleeve. Like I said, the material stretches a bit. I pulled the Ron suit away and dug out the item I hid there. As I already told you, I said as I slapped it down on the center of the board. I won before we started playing. He looked down at the piece inside. You're still confused, human, he said in his stride. Only stranger pieces can be put at the center of the stage. The dreadnought belongs at... Uh... His eyes widened as he looked again. That's not a dreadnought, he exclaimed. I let go of the blood red crystal that allowed it to fall on its side there in the center of the board. Falling on top of the sensor jammer hadn't been exactly a plan A, but what with the blood and the howling of pain it was pretty easy to palm a tiny shard of crystal stack. No, he shouted as he surged to his feet. No, he wheeled around, but uh, the walls behind him glowed bright white for just a second and they melted away. A line of Ron stepped into the room and their arms extended in our direction. No! He shouted again. I saw him extend his wrist and prepare to flick it. I grabbed the crystal shot and once more and leapt over the table. The game master heard me coming and spun around again. He flicked his wrist. The world went red as every nerve lit up with pain. But it didn't matter. I was already airborne and inertia didn't rest. Just before I blacked out, I saw the look of shock on his face as my body collided with his. Distantly, I felt the dampness of my wrist that was hot with blood wash over from where the shard penetrated his stomach. Then, I knew nothing more. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 95 Written by Semi Loki Gleep, is he awake? Gah! How can he be awake? It was dark here, yeah? almost pleasant, like I was floating in a pool filled with chicken noodle soup. Warm, comforting, a bit salty, but what can you expect from that cheap canned stuff your mother buys? Sure, you may be sick, but she has to work, and if you can't eat the damned canned soup, then there's a lots of people in Africa who would give their right arm for that soup. No, you can't mail it to them. What the hell is wrong with you? You think this is a joke? Now eat the damn soup and get better because she needs you to go back to school. Because she doesn't have enough vacation time to take off work just because you're vomiting up a bucket of phlegm every hour. Eat the soup. Bleep, perhaps we should poke him with a stick again. Gah, that'll help. Bleep, I don't believe it hurts. Something sharp stabbed me in my side. I tried my best to ignore it. My feet had gotten tangled up in the noodle, and I was too busy to extricate myself to worry about phantom pains. Gleep! He did not move! Gleep! Perhaps he is dead! Gah! His chest is moving! Gah! How could he breathe if he was dead? Gleep! I do not know human anatomy! Gleep! Maybe such things are common! Gah! We should try poking him with the stick again. More sharp pains in my side. That was starting to get annoying. Unfortunately, I had more pressing concerns. There was a giant spoon lifting me out of the water. Up and up I went. The broth rushed off me, leaving the feeling cold and exposed. Up I flew with the giant spoon. 
I sat upwards and screamed, Don't you! The deaths backpedaled away from me. They dropped the branch on the floor and retreated. Wait, had they been poking me with that? What's going on? I asked. Sleep, Voltaire answered. The Ron are still investigating the space. Gah, Voltaire added. We were asked to watch over you. Gleep, your body was damaged in a desperate move by the Chimera. Gah, the Ron repaired you as much as they could, but said that you still needed to rest to recover completely. Gleep, we do not understand the mechanics, but the Ron assured us that you have no lasting damage. Gah, why must we not chew? My eyes had been twitching from one parasitic mouth to the other through the exchange, and now I felt like I'd been watching a tennis match on fast forward. I closed my eyes. Never mind, I said. It was just a dream. How long have I been asleep? Gah! We do not know human time units. Gleep, you have been asleep for half a local day? Half a day? I tried to get to my feet. My legs didn't want to cooperate. Was something wrong with them? I looked down at them and saw the familiar black sheen of the Ron suit. I wiggled my ankles, not paralyzed, but just stuff. I tried again. Pins and needles crashed over me. My legs weren't dead. Just asleep. I forced myself upright. I could not feel my legs and, at the same time, I felt an intense pain marking where they should be. It was like I was hovering in the air while everything from my hips down was forced to regrow. However, once the blood broke through and restored to a normal flow, the pain began to subside and I could concentrate on something other than falling over. Where are the others? I asked. Gleep! The other humans? Qualteth asked. Gah! Valteth interjected. They were recovered when the Ron landed. Gah! Your hunter seekers are outside guarding the facility. What about the Ron children? I asked. Many have perished, the Ron voice said from behind me. I turned around to see three Ron entering the room. We calculated you would make a full recovery within this time period. The lead Ron explained. We had come in to see if you were rousing. You apparently exceeded our expectations. We shall note that for future calculations. Forget that, I said dismissively. You said many Ron perished. What happened? Ron hesitated before answering. You were successful in disabling the scanner neutralizer. The Ron said, and we were able to do some deep scanning while you were distracting the Chimera. We are grateful to you for providing us the opportunity. I felt a butt coming along. However, the Ron added, which was close enough to a butt that I felt justified in my assessment. Apparently, your arrival triggered some prearranged extermination policy. When our scanners came online, we found that they were disposing of the hashlings. We counteracted what security measures we could and mobilized an attack force, but we could not possibly get you in time to save all of them. I closed my eyes. I couldn't understand the words. Not exactly, but I felt the crushing weight. I'm... Sorry, I said. Do not apologize, the Ron said. It was not your fault, and even if you had known, there was very little you could have done. Given the circumstances at hand, your course of action was a practical one. Did you manage to save some of them, though? I asked. Again, the Ron hesitated. Yes, it agreed for a moment. The exact number is uncertain. We have frozen some of the more badly damaged members and salvaged corpses that may be yet revived. We are optimistically hope to recover 40% of the total stolen from us. 40%? I cast. Is that all? The corpses that are not eaten by the Chimera were plunged into hydrofluoric acid. The Ron explained. The Chimera appeared to have wanted to make certain the Ron would not be available for the upcoming conflict. I had thought other words and heavy upon me. These seemed to generate their own gravitational field. Did you get to the part about the Chimera ripping holes in metaspace? I stammered. They're trying to destroy the galaxy. We did receive that part of the conversation, the Ron verified. However, that is a concern that is not as immediately pressing as the loss of our numbers. We must first dedicate resources to ensure our species' survival over the next two generations before addressing matters that will take centuries to become problematic. I didn't like it, but it was hard to argue with that logic. So, um, the Conflux is going to have to address the Chimera on their own. Yes, the Ron agreed. However, the Conflux will not have to deal with the war on two fronts. 
We believe that that was an ideal scenario for the Chimera. The end result is much the same. There cannot be a Ron Conflux alliance. I sighed. Where are my friends? I asked the Ron. They are down below assisting with rescuing operations. The hatchlings who are avalatory have largely been removed, though we are still encountering some hidden caches. There is also the possibility of some off planet that have been sold as slave population. We are still mining computers to determine if this is true. As for the rest, we are attempting a genetic salvage where possible. Genetic salvage? I asked before it hit me what he was implying. I translated for him. You're harvesting the corpses, I said. In part, the run agreed. There is a strong possibility some life functions may remain in some of the remaining candidates, although that possibility grows more remote with each passing moment. Right, I said, lead the way. I'll help in any way I can. I thought I had been braced for what I might find. I knew about the Chimera. I knew what they were capable of. I thought I was prepared for what I might see. It was worse than that. The corridor the Ron led me down terminated into a large cavern. There were bright lights in abundance, but the floor seemed to be washed in dark shadows. It took me a moment to realize I wasn't looking at shadows. I was looking at the chitin of Fallen Ron. Thousands of shells littered the floor. Most of them were inert. A few twitched. That wasn't the worst, though. What was worse was that I saw along the walls. Eight-foot-tall cylinders lined the walls. They made me think of glass coffins. They were about the right size for a coffin, except that the things inside were not dead. The first one I saw contained a run hatching, like all the others. It was suspended in the middle of the cylinder with bubbles churning up and below through the clear liquid that surrounded it. It made me think of an aerator in a fish tank, except the run in the middle was not floating. He was impaled on spikes, and he also had two heads. One head was a normal run head, and it was a grayish cast to it, shriveled and diseased looking. The second one was healthier looking, but it was, uh, well, something else. It looked almost canine with its elephantine nose, but it was a bright orange in color. The eyes on the elephant dog were wide and roved around the room in terror. The cylinder next to that one was another Ron Hatchling. This one had one head with its guts had been ripped free of its body and was stretched out like a tapestry and affixed to the sides of the container. Every blood vessel, every organ, and every nerve had been spread out like an enormous grisly spider web. I didn't want to look at the third container. I did anyway. I immediately wished that I hadn't. There were two hatchlings in there. I won't mention what had been done to them, save that it demonstrated both genetic skill of the Chimera, as well as the unbelievable savagery. Put your helmet on, someone said in my ear. I was on the floor, my head between my knees and hyperventilating. Wait, I said, not really a question, just acknowledging what I was there. Put your helmet on, the voice repeated. Female. Jack? I looked over and saw a female silhouette standing next to me. She was covered in all in black from head to foot. The helmet? The helmet? Quickly, I nodded my head. The helmet popped up and slid into place over my head. The results were, well, disappointing. I wanted it all to go away, to become a robot, cold and logical. But that's not what the helmet did. It didn't shut off feelings at all. It did not become a stone-cold killer. I just became myself with somewhat reduced ability to relate to other people. I felt disgust. The scene was absolutely revolting. I felt anger. The scene of pure brutality for the sake of being brutal. I felt overwhelmed. What was different, however, was the tiny voice that was screaming that I needed to run to every cylinder with a sledgehammer and break them open right now. Still, I didn't realize that at the time. All I knew was after I put on my helmet, things were still terrible, but I could deal with it a little better. I didn't notice a significant change in my thoughts, so I gave credit to the suit's oxygen supply, cutting off the smell that had been turning my stomach. Perhaps it did. But the most important thing was that I was now able to prioritize problems. What had been done to the hatchlings in those cylinders was terrible. I was aware of that, but I was also actually aware that I could not help them. The Ron, with all their advanced technology, may not be able to help them. Not really. 
I could help elsewhere, so that is what I decided to do. I stood up. Where do you need me? I asked. Where I was needed was on the floor, manning a mop. I wish it was a euphemism, but no, I was literally handed a mop. We were one floor up from the room where the vats of hydrofluoric acid had been used to dissolve the hatchlings. Most of the ones in the room had been disposed of in different ways, many before I had arrived on the planet judging by the rate of decomposition. Some of the carcasses showed evidence of being gnawed on, some the teeth marks looked human, many did not. Others still had scorch marks or chemical burns on them, others could not tell exactly what caused their death, only that it had been messy. Many of them actually looked like something had detonated inside of them. Which is why I was handling a mop. I was literally sopping up the remains of corpses and dumping them into a collector. If the genetic material could be salvaged, they would try and reclone the hatchling. If it was not, then it could be reused on biomass to rebuild the others. As I worked the mop between the bodies and collected parts that had liquefied, Lee used a shovel to dump more solid chunks. Yes, this is a very low-tech operation. The Ron had dedicated their more sophisticated tools for a different level and was salvaging a process required a, well, more refined touch. Something too delicate for non-mechanical extraction. They didn't go into details as to what that meant and, uh, believe me, I didn't feel any motivation to ask. I pushed them up and tried to focus on the job at hand. Shide walked into view a few moments later. He had a push broom. Don't look. Don't look. Jack crawled by on her hands and knees with a sponge. This was so gross. I mopped the floor. Lee shoveled. Shied swept. Jack sponged. We worked in silence for an hour that way. Lee broke the silence at first. We were working side by side, him shoveling rather a messy bit of loose chitin. I was sopping up the parts that slipped over the sides. I will throttle every last one of them with my bare hands, Lee mumbled, his voice low, just barely within the edge of hearing. Too quick, I mumbled back. How about we nail their tongues to the back of a semi and drive over six miles on a gravel road? Nice visual. He agreed and shot a sideways look at me. Are you alright? When we got here, you were unconscious. The Ron said the Chimera had done something to your insides. Nanites, I confirmed. They juiced me up good. I think they might have killed me at the end there. He looked at me again. See, you got over it, he noted. Let's talk, Shide hissed as he swept past us. More Kavodge! Lee picked up a shovel and then lowered it again. He stared at me. I'm not entirely sure what that means, he confessed. What is more Kavodge involved? Chimera corpses, Jack translated as she went past. Oh, then here, here, Lee said amicably and resumed shoveling. An hour later, we all decided to take a break. We stepped out of the room and away from the sight and smell of the place and lowered our helmets. Just like that, the feelings came rushing back. What were we doing? We were taking a mop and a broom to children and the only allies we had found out here in the black. What were we doing? What was the point? Humans, the Ron voice said from behind us. We turned to see the quintet of Ron walking down the ramp that led to our level. One of them was carrying a strange-looking black box. I was tired, but I forced myself to stand anyway. I don't know if the Ron understood the idea of standing to show respect, but it didn't matter. I understood it. They had lost so many of their children. They had been disrespected enough. We have questions about your ability to interrogate. The lead one stated, Humans have displayed the ability to detect deception. We wish to know more about the mechanisms in use for this. I was certain I had explained this before. How? They had worked it out part of the, with the fair traders, but I wasn't going to argue. It's just a trick of looking at what people do with their bodies, I said. When people, humans or otherwise, feel strongly about something, their bodies react usually without them realizing it. We just study these movements and make educated guesses to their meanings. We understand, the Ron said. And there is no psychic connection in use. I shook my head. None that I can find. I agreed. It seems to be a cruder version of reading thoughts, one that involves a lot of guesswork and putting yourself in others' positions. Understood, the Ron said. 
We had hoped that you would be a potential asset in the upcoming interrogations. Evidence suggests that you will have to reduce effectiveness. I shrugged. Like I may look human, I agreed, but they aren't human. Their body language may be different and give mixed results. This is not the difficulty we foresee. The run informed me as they held out a box to me. In front of me, the box that opened to reveal a jar. Inside the jar was a liquid similar to the cylinders below. Similarly, there was something floating in the middle of the jar, impaled in a complex arrangement of rods and wires, except the thing inside the jar was much smaller than the bodies in the room below. In fact, if I remembered my biology lessons correctly, the lumber grey probably only weighed about three and a half pounds. You removed their brains, I stammered. There is some resistance to being captured and interrogated, the Ron replied evenly. We have made certain arrangements to facilitate a more conducive discussion. The box closed and the Ron withdrew it. The subject in question attempted to use psychic manipulation on us, the Ron explained. We were forced to remove the lobe responsible for such communications. The sensors indicate the subject has been experiencing quite a bit of distress since that time. You lobotomized him? A lobectomy, the Ron corrected me. If we are concerned about the subject's well-being, you may rest assured that, though aware, the subject's experience absolutely no pain. Furthermore, we have made sure that the subject is fully aware of what all has done to him by recording the removal of his brain and subsequent lobectomy. Sights and other sensations are being relayed through appropriate sensory areas, or on a continuous loop so that the subject can fully understand all that took place. I just stared at him. Thank you for your willingness to assist us, the Ron said in its characteristically flat voice. We shall let you know when the subject's willing to communicate. If you have any questions you would like to ask, we shall certainly make him available for you before making the irrevocable decisions. With that, all five of them about faced and marched out. Kavodge, Shide whispered from somewhere behind me. Remind me to never kavodge with them. It was a sentiment that we could all agree with. The next time the run approached us, we were back to work in the room of discarded corpses. Lee and I were both shoveling this time, and Jack and Shide were tending the brooms. It wasn't that the liquid was a mess was common now, but now the solid pieces were getting small enough that they were clattering the semi-solids and making it difficult to mop. The trio of Ron entered the room and paused at the entrance. You may cease your efforts, the Ron announced. A collection crew is on its way. I lowered the shovel and tried to stretch out some kinks on my spine. I thought they were busy on, um, other levels, I said. They were, the Ron agreed. However, one crew has completed its task ahead of schedule and has agreed to work in this room. I looked at Lee. He shrugged. We lowered our tools and trudged our way over towards the exit on weary legs. Do you still think you can salvage 40% of the generation? I asked. Current estimates are 37.8%, the Ron answered. However, we cannot exhaust all possibilities of recovering any slave labor. Bleak and bleaker. I was done asking questions, though, so I let Lee take over for me. So what happens now? Lee asked. We collect what material we can and return to the Ron Empire. The Ron explained. The slavers used the fair trader's device to bypass the barricade around the Empire's frontier. We have since located a cloaking mechanism and are constructing appropriate countermeasures. Barricade? I asked. Automated weaponry and sensors, the Ron explained. Only Ron may enter Ron's space. No, he said. He suddenly looked old. Older than I remembered ever seeing him. Older than he looked on Earth when he was half-dead alcoholic living on the streets. He was done talking. Jack stirred to life. I think he means what happens to us, Jack supplied. Folks, Ron shifted his stance and looked squarely in Jack's direction. We do not understand the question, the Ron admitted. What are you going to do with us? Jack asked. Are we prisoners still, or what? The Ron fell silent. Apologies, it said at last. From the information we gathered from your companions, we were under the impression that you were originally bound for overseer. We were, I agreed, until the ship got, um, damaged. Yes, the Ron agreed. The damage has been addressed. After retrieving the Gore companions from the ice world, we will leave you in close proximity to Overseer. After that, we must return to the Empire. I looked at the others. The damage has been addressed, I asked. You fixed cock ship? It's here. Correct, the Ron agreed. We collected the ship at the time we collected you. The two beings on board have been in stasis during this time. 
Quok and Sulthus were still there. I hadn't even given them a second thought since this began, probably because they were major tools. So, you are suggesting dropping us off near Overseer with those two and hope that they don't ask any questions about where we've all been? I asked. Their memories can be altered, Ron suggested. We can have them believe that they escaped the space station without incident and have been traveling towards the destination this entire time. Okay, that could possibly work. I looked at my friends. They shrugged. We need to pick up the others, I said. Yes, the Ron agreed. We wish to ask more questions of the computer that is there. The slaver locations, I asked. Yes, but we also wish to know more about the weaponry used, the Ron explained. We need data in order to address the metaspace leak situation. I perked up that comment. You mean you're going to do something about that after all? I asked. Not immediately, the Ron corrected me. We do not have the current research on how metaspace leak would function. For the moment, our highest priority is to ensure our population does not drop to unrecoverable levels. However, we may as well begin data collection now for when we devote appropriate resources. This may still be several years in the future. I felt my fledging sense of hope fade slightly. Only slightly. There hadn't been much there to begin with. I sighed and sat back down. Do you even know if the leaks can be repaired? I asked. Insufficient data, the Ron admitted. One can only presume that it is possible until proven to be otherwise. However, at this time, we have no idea how this might be done. It may take many centuries before we can find an answer. I nodded glumly. I don't think we have sentries, I said. Maybe the Chimera are right. They've already won all of this. I swept my arm to indicate the captured base and a pile of maimed corpses still littering the floor. It's all pointless, I finished. To my surprise, it was shy to spoke up. The Kavaj it is, he said. They can be stopped. I looked up at him and shrugged. I guess you're right, I said. The game master did say that they eventually closed on their own, but that doesn't help us right now. That's not what I kavodging mean, he snapped. He leaned closer and held his five fingers. From what you told me, there are five kavodging groups running this galaxy, right? He said. He didn't wait for an answer. We thought the abjurators were the top kavodgers, he said. But it turns out that they're the kavodge dogs of the chimera for a while. He lowered one finger. Chimera aren't gonna help us, he said and lowered another. We know that the complex can't deal with it because of these kavodgers. He pointed at the Ron this time. Don't know what to do, and they're a the lot smarter than the confrogging conf flux. He lowered two more fingers, leaving only two remaining. The fair converging traders don't know what to do because they jumped a pig slop with the chimera. He said as he lowered the index finger, leaving his middle finger extended. Either that gesture is a lot older and more universal than I imagined, or someone's been teaching Shy to mix up his profanity. Either way, I was sure that it was deliberate. The Envoy. Lee said and caught on. They didn't join up with the Chimera. That must mean that they didn't think that they needed the Chimera's help. The Ron fell silent. Silence stretched on for a long time. This is a possibility, the Ron admitted. However, contacting the Envoy may prove challenging. The Envoy are not strictly a unified body. Many hands within the Envoy tend to be nomadic and are wary of outsiders. Are there any groups they might be able to contact? Jack asked. They must have an idea of where, as some of them might be found. Possible, the Ron said at last. There is a known outpost for the envoy on the far side of the Ron Empire. It might be our most likely candidate for approach, as it is one of the few semi-permanent settlements the envoy employ. I sprang right back up to my feet. Great, I said. Just get a far ship and... Uh... There is an issue, the Ron interrupted. The system in question is in disputed space. Disputed how? I asked. Disputed between the Ron and the Envoy. The Ron replied. The encounters we have had with the Envoy have not been friendly. I groaned and dropped my pack down on the ground. There's another possibility, the Ron said. If the delegates who approached were not Ron and the Envoy might be more open to discussion. What are you suggesting? Lee asked for us. Humans go in your place. Humans and Conflux representatives, the Ron clarified. You are on your way to Overseer. You shall bring light to the wars taking place and the Conflux can elect their own representatives to make the case. Lee snorted. So we just tell them that the Chimera have taken a fork to the fabric of reality and they'll believe us. He snorted. 
We'll be lucky if we walk out of there alive. It will be challenging, the rod admitted, but you must convince them the envoy are more likely to be swayed by the pleas of many than from a single species. And why should the conflux listen to us? I asked. The ron fell silent for a few seconds, then the shells opened and they extended their hands. Before I could so much as flinch, they held their palms out towards me and felt something happen. A pressure in my chest, perhaps. There was one moment and then gone the next. They repositioned their hands to point at my friends as well. Judging from their reactions, they felt something as well. The conflux have been attempting to engage in diplomatic relations with the ron for many years, the ron replied. This should give you some measure of influence within the governing body. With that, Ron turned away and walked. Wait, I called out. What did you just do? The Ron paused and the leader looked over us. We have already told you that the barricade does not permit non-Ron Empire citizens to pass. The Ron explained. Yes, I acknowledged with a snow nod. The inability to send representatives safely into Ron-controlled space has hindered the conflict of snow negotiations. The Ron continued. We see no reason to go to them and they cannot come to us. Offer to bring a group of ambassadors across the border and we will convince them. I was taken back. At the same time, I was impressed at this powerful bartering chip that they had laid before us. So we tell them that you've given us permission to cross your border and... I said with a smile. Incorrect, the Ron interrupted. Permission is no longer required. You are members of the Ron Empire. The decision of whom you are allowed to cross the border now belongs to you as it does to any member of the Ron. I took a long moment for those words to sink in. The Ron resumed marching up the ramp and out of the corridor. Wait, I repeated. What do you mean we are now Ron? A rare courtesy granted to outsiders. The Ron called back. So far extended to four individuals. Two more should be added when we return to the ice planet. Have the Conflux do a bioscan of you to confirm it, but you are now full members of the Rom Empire. As such, entitled to all and such protections each citizen is granted. If a Conflux attempt to execute you, they will be considered an act of war. I found myself kneeling on the floor, too shocked to know how to answer. The ship will be departing soon, the Ron added just before it left. If you have any belongings you wish to collect, you are advised to do so now. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 96 Written by Sebi Loki The trip back to the frozen world where we left the Professor and Heather was fairly uneventful. We slept in our little cabin room and we rode our cats around the interior of the ship while we were awake. We couldn't take the Wampus Cats with us as much as I tried to tell myself that it was possible. We really couldn't. The Ron could tinker with the memories of the Sultus and Quack, yes. But coming up with a reasonable reason why we were each sporting a horse-sized cat was going to be a tough sell. The Ron had to take the cats with him. There was no other way. I found myself sitting down with Panda one day trying to explain just that to him. We have to leave you, I told the Wumpus Cat as I scratched him behind one of his fan-shaped ears. It's nothing personal. I'd take you with us if we could, but I just can't. Why do you talk to the Hunter Seeker? A voice came from behind me. I turned around and found a trio of Ron had entered the corridor behind me. I had been running banded in circuits around the ship. I wanted some privacy to talk to him. Lesson learned. There is no such thing as privacy on the Ron ship. He's my friend, I said testily. I wanted him to understand why I had to leave him behind. The hunter's seeker abilities to pass languages limited, the Ron continued. Your words will not be understood. That doesn't mean I shouldn't tell him, I protested as I stroked the cat behind his ears. Besides, just because he doesn't understand the words doesn't mean that he doesn't understand the meaning. You believe the hunter seeker can derive content without context? The Ron asked. I was starting to get annoyed. Was it too much to ask if I could have a private moment with my giant mutant cat without anyone treating me like I'm insane? Then I calmed down. If they were a species completely without guile, there was the Ron. There was no implied questioning in my sanity. That would require the ability to implicate. The Ron didn't seem to understand layered communication. Not fully. What was spoken was precisely what was meant. They wanted to know why I was talking to the cat. 
Unlike a human, they didn't take the next step and assume that they knew the answer. So rather than get annoyed, I found myself really thinking about the question. No, I said at last. Not that the content of my words, the content of the emotions behind the words. The words are for me. To help me focus what I'm feeling, he needs to pick up on that part. Please, elaborate. I half expected that one. Okay, I said. Humans um, communicate with more than just words. I understood, but one agreed. I hadn't meant for that to be a stepping place, but I was just organizing my thoughts. The response caught me off guard. You do? I asked suspiciously. Humans are adept at comprehending communication that goes beyond verbal means. The Ron explained. It is therefore quite likely humans use, use this communication tactic amongst their own to relay information. Exactly, I said as I enthusiastic nod. The words relay specific information, but we use other cues to let others know, well, subtleties, how we feel, what things we like, or how we want you to feel. We do this by moving our bodies and changing our tone of voice. Things like that. You believe the hunter-seeker can decipher the non-verbal language? The Ron asked. They're part human, aren't they? I asked defensively. The Ron fell silent. They are, the Ron said at last. Thank you. We have been trying to understand your degrees of control over the hunter-seeker. How they seem to respond to commands before you even have time to issue them. It is clear that the hunter-seekers have developed some degree of your skill with non-verbal communications, and that you are issuing orders in a manner we cannot understand. This clarifies much. It does? I asked. Yes, the Ron agreed. You speak to the hunter-seekers when speech is unnecessary. Yet at times when speech would be most crucial, you often work without it. You are training the hunter-seekers to respond to you in these idle moments. You are talking to the hunter-seeker now because when you part ways, the biological will still respond to your desires, even though they may not be in alignment with its own. We comprehend and respect your wisdom by communicating with the hunter-seekers. I see, I said. So you're taking notes so that you know what to do with them while we're gone. We have no use for the hunter-seekers, the Ron pointed out. My heart thundered in my chest, but it sensed my panic, and I felt him tense up under my hand. What does that mean? I stammered. The hunter-seekers are of no use to us, the Ron explained. Therefore, they will not be active once you leave the ship. You're just going to kill them, I exclaimed. The Ron fell silent. Is that your desire? It asked at last. No, we like them and we want them to be alive, I shouted. Maybe one day we can get them again and when this is over... Then how can we destroy them? The Ron asked their apparent genuine puzzlement. Ron still desired their continued existence. My height settled down in the most sedate pace. I'm Ron, I said. It wasn't a question, it was a reminder. Yes, the Ron agreed. As such, you are privileged to all available resources we have. The Hunter Seekers is not desired by us, but is desired by you. We cannot delete this resource as long as your need for it exists. So if I ask for a ship, you'll just give me one, I asked. That is not a reasonable request in and of itself, the Ron said. If you had a justifiable need for the ship and one was not in use, then it is possible. Huh, how about that? Then if you aren't going to kill them, I asked, what are you going to do with the Womp, with the Hunter Seekers? We will place them in stasis, the Ron explained. They will be revived when you return and they will not be aware of your absence. That made me feel a little better except, um... So, I said after a moment's thought, you're just going to, what, freeze them, keep them in a cooler until we get back. Space on the ship is limited, the Ron replied. They will be stored in a more compact form. That's, uh, what I thought. How compact, I asked. The Ron fell silent as they had to think about it. If we copy the mind state onto a digital medium, there is very little reason to keep more than a blueprint, the Ron admitted. We can rebuild the rest as needed. That uh, was what I was afraid of. Can you at least preserve the brains, I pleaded. I mean, uh, like with the Chimera, but less, well, tortury? The Ron thought for a moment. This is important to you, the Ron asked. I nodded, and like always, realized too late that this would be meaningless. 
I want to know that this is the real bandit, I explained, not just a clone that acts like him, not a copy, the original cat I befriended. The Ron fell silent for a long moment. Human Jason, they said at last, we would like to point out that you yourself have been... Can you do it? I interrupted. Keep their brains intact, I mean. Of course, the Ron agreed, preserving a small biological sample of that size indefinitely is trivial. We have more than adequate resources and space on the ship to provide this. If this is your wish, then we will comply. Thanks, I said a bit grudgingly. I stroked Bandit's shaggy head again. He still felt like he was always tense. Could I get some privacy? I asked. I'm still saying goodbye. I realize he may not realize I'll be gone, but I'll know. Of course, the Ron agreed at once, and with that marched down the side tunnel that I would have sworn had not been there just two seconds earlier. Aliens, what could you do? Ron's suits made it unnecessary to eat or hit the toilet. Other than sleeping, we didn't have to do a lot for the trip back to the ice world, so we hung out with our cats and told stories to one another. I tried to explain the rules of Malok to the others and... Uh, in return, Shai tried to teach me a game of the sphere called Old Man Bones. The game, as he explained it, typically required a special eight-sided die called a bone. The players would toss the dice at whatever number came up, would either drink that many cups of bitter ale, or could elect to take that many punches to the face. According to Shai, he preferred the drink or of Old Man Bones was something called Old Holwick Dark Repentance, and, if Shai could be believed... If the diet showed a high enough number in it, it could be a tough call which choice would be more painful. When a player could no longer walk in a straight line, it was declared the walled man. I'm actually not sure if this was an official game or something Shide invented as an excuse to get roaring drunk. Didn't matter either. There was no alcohol on the run ship and, uh, even if there was, the suit would probably just detox us. Our only option was to punch each other in the face and I wasn't up for that. So, like I said, we talked and told stories. What happened after we split up during that forest fire? I asked Lee. He shrugged. Not much to tell, really, he confessed. Things got really confusing went with the fire and the smoke. I heard a drone approaching and the next thing I know, the runner talking to me over my comm and giving me directions to some caves. Same here, Jack said. One of the chimera almost caught me, but I changed his mind. Changed his mind? I asked. Kicked him in the jewels and shoved him in the fire, she explained. I started running away from him after that, and then the Ron started giving me directions. Good thing too, because when he came out of the fire, he didn't sound happy. Why was I not surprised to hear the Chimera could survive being set on fire? It just fit with my luck, I guess. Kavaj me, Shite sneered. You all make a clean break and here I get Kavajing taken hostage. I looked at him. You were captured, I asked. Not by these Kavajas, he said. I had to leap Gaha, a piece of Kavaj following me around. I was about ready to surrender when I heard the Kavajing run. Lee picked up the story again. We all met in the inside of the cave, and I guess, he said. It was mostly hidden in the roots of one of those giant trees. I had to squeeze between the roots just to get inside. Once it was pitch black inside, not even the light of the forest fire got in. I had to crawl on my belly to get deeper inside. I had only gotten about a dozen feet inside when I heard someone following. I probably would have crapped my pants if the suit allowed it. Luckily, it was Jack. He wasn't as quiet as he makes it sound, Jack remarked. I could hear him swearing all the way outside. I shook my head in disbelief. You two had to crawl on your beddies to hide in a cave, I asked. Can't imagine how you managed to put the cats in there. The room fell silent. You did have your cats with you, right? I asked. Shai cleared his throat. <clears throat> well, he said, they were certainly with me. I followed one of them into the entrance of the cave. Very roomy cave, in fact. I had to duck a bit to get through the opening, but the cats walked right in. It was a bit of a squeeze with all eight of us in there, but we managed. Eight? I asked, and I started doing my math. Walk cat, Shai, and the tets. Even if you counted the tets as two people... It was coming up one short. But why count them twice if you were talking about how the tight squeeze was? I looked over at Jack and Lee and saw the sheepish expression mirrored on both their faces. The um, cave uh, had two openings, um, didn't it? I asked. 
That other opening was hidden, Lee protested. You had to crawl through roots to find the one you did, I counted. How far apart were these openings? I looked at Shide in response. Okavoj, he said. I don't know your distance units. How would I know? I looked at him. All right, he confessed as he looked away. I saw Jack's feet sticking out from the opening when I walked by. Happy. I closed my eyes so I didn't have to look at their faces. It was safer that way. Jack might punch me if I started laughing too loudly. So, uh, what did you do then? I asked. We waited, Lee said. When the Ron said it was safe to come out, we found half a dozen of their air cars parked out front. We walked inside and found you sprawled on the floor with the Ron shooting you with one of those heating ones. He told us that you would need to rest up to be fully recovered, so we hid the janitor's closet. You know the rest. This time, I couldn't help but snort in laughter. I opened my eyes, expecting to see glares aimed at me. Fortunately, everyone seemed to be a bit puzzled. Just thinking, I admitted, we got kidnapped by the Ron because they thought that we were invaluable at locating the missing generation, and that was our biggest contribution, sweeping and mopping. Lee grinned at that. Jack's smile was more fleeting, but it was there. Shide naturally had to ruin the moment. The Kavaji are you kavaging about? He asked me, eyes wide as saucers. I'm going to have a kavaging nightmares about that when I'm in my eighties. I sighed. Shied, I asked, does this fear not have the concept of gallows humor? Shide cocked his head to one side and narrowed his eyes to slips. Is that when you laugh when someone is being unable to tie a convoging knot? He asked. I once heard about a guy who was hanged with a slipknot and... No, 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 I interrupted, before he went off on his tangents. Like where you laugh at something grim, like death, because it's better than screaming and clawing at your eyes. He sat bolt upright and smiled. No, he said with a knowing look. Now I get it. You mean like a vodge and crypt riddles? Yeah, I love those. Hey, Jason, how do you know when a tree ride has been in your kitchen? What's a tree ride? I asked. Because your brother is missing and the pickles are meaty, he declared and let out a mighty whooping laugh. We all stared at him. He sobered up after a moment and shot us an annoyed look. Oh, come the Kavaj on, he said. You know, tree whites. They do little raiding parties on the neighborhood oasis and then pickle the bodies of those they kill before returning them to their families. You have to have something like that back in your world. I thought about it. Estate lawyers, maybe? I suggested and shook my head. Never mind. The important thing is don't tell us any more of those crypt riddles. Don't think we'll get the context. Just one more, he pleaded. This is a convincing great one. I surrendered at the inevitable. Fine, I said, ask. But it's worse than finding your mother-in-law and her two sisters' corpse in your convincing garbage can. Finding your mother-in-law's corpse in three garbage cans, I guessed. Finding her still alive, he corrected me. You are Kavaj at this game. Right, I said and decided to change topics. The Ron have agreed to take the cats for us. We can collect them after we deal with the galactic leaders at Overseer, assuming we live through it. Do we have to give them care and feeding instructions? Lee asked. I've covered the basics with them, I said quickly. No need to compound their troubles by alerting them that what the Ron had in store for the companions. Not a lie, we were thought just holding some key information. Strategically, of course. Jack lifted an eyebrow and studied my face carefully. Damn, that girl had a suspicious mind. I had no confidence in my ability to maintain a poker face, so I looked to one side and pretended to examine Pandit. That said, I declared, I think it's only fair we make these last few moments count. Lee leapt to his feet. You mean, he asked. A smile crept on his lips. His eyes blazed in fires of anticipation. He knew it, and he felt it in the air. I nodded. Yeah, I agreed. It's time. We had a race. Shai was on his feet now. Come on, yes, he shouted. What's the prize? What was the prize? Honor, glory, bragging rights. Skipping a turn on the barrel when Shai got really lonely. I guess, Shai suggested. In your dreams, Jack protested immediately. Not you, he said. Whoever comes to last has to keep the Kavojin cat. And that was better than a barrel idea. But uh, not much. Agreed, he said. You better like the taste of friskies, Jason. You're about to tongue your cat. Wait, I said. 
Doesn't matter, Jake said with a shrug. It's not like I'm coming in last for sure. Hey, I protested. Again, more her foul on deaf ears. Once around the ship, the shite said, the one who gets back to this room last is the loser. I think, I said, let's go. Jack interrupted me as she nodded to the others. If we hurry, we'll have a good street when Jason gives bad at a lip lock. You know, I said, will that mean the band will get us some beard? Chai asked. Hang on, I shouted. They ignored me. They were too busy running for their cats. I realized that I was trapped. If I stood there squawking, I was in serious danger of a level of intimacy with a wampus cat that I never intended. So rather than argue, I vaulted onto my saddle and took off running. Racing the cats was better than the first time we'd let them run wild. Then it was hunting. Fun, yes, but for the most part we were cooperative effort. This time they were competing with each other and showing one another up. It was exhilarating. The tunnel walls burred past as the wind snapped at me. It was like riding a giant magic carpal with bulging muscles. I loved it. It was also sad because, really... This would be the last time. I tried not to feel too depressed as we rounded each bend and worked our way back towards our room. Each second brought us much closer to the ending. I didn't want it to end. I wanted to force the sands and the hourglass to breeze. To draw this moment out for eternity. This last moment of freedom. True freedom. To be one with the wind. Part of me never left that moment. Even now, when I close my eyes, I could still feel it. Still taste the musk of bandit scent. I could still feel the rhythm of his feet clawing for traction on the false stone floor, propelling him greater and greater speeds. I'm still there. Just a fragment, a mere shadow of a splinter of myself, trapped in an endless loop of memory. But yes, that small part of my being is still there. Even today, when I feel like storms of misery batter at me and threaten to sweep me out to sea and leave me there stranded and lost, I can pull that tether of a memory and draw that memory closer like a life preserver. It reminds me that all of this is just temporary. Only the things we choose to make permanent will endure. I am glad I picked that moment. I needed it. But still, it was just a moment and, uh, in the end... All too fleeting. I found myself nearly flung off Bandit's back as he came back to stop where we had begun just a few moments before. I didn't have to kiss the cat, by the way, and sadly Spot didn't gain a symbiote. But uh, when all was said and done, I think we all came out of the experience winners. All except Spot, that is, who suddenly seemed far more interested in licking his own rear end as if trying to wash the taste out of his mouth. He asked me to never mention that part again, by the way. <laughs> Whoops. Anyway, not much happened for the next three days. Then, without warning, a trio of Ron entered the room, carrying a very familiar-looking box. We request that you follow us back to the room with the Dawn Vengeance, the Ron said. Our guests have supplied us with some new information, and we need your assistance in querying the synthetic intelligence. The lead Ron tapped the box with the chimera brain as if it needed help in deciphering who they meant by guest. So much for happy memories, I thought. We found him behind them and they led us back towards the hangar doors. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 97, written by Semi Loki. The blaster call there was brief as the air car landed right in front of the opening of the cavern. The warm air blowing out of the tunnel was enough to mitigate the most extreme cold. Still, I noticed the Ron moved a bit sluggishly until they stepped into the cabin itself where it was warmer. They had told me that they really couldn't tolerate temperatures much lower than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I guess that we were near that threshold of that. The Ron led the way and through the opening they had cut into the base itself. In moments we were riding that weird platform elevator thing down to where the Dawn Vengeance was stored. The platform had almost touched the ground when I found myself staggering from the impact of another body slamming into mine. You're back! Heather squealed as she did her best to break my spine with her bear hug. Not that I was complaining. She let go of me and flung herself at Lee next. I like to pretend that she picked me first because I was the extra special to her, but uh, really, it was probably because I just happened to be standing closest to her. 
She enthusiastically hugged everyone, even shied. I expected his hands to wander to places that warranted a slapping, but uh, to everyone's surprise, he was on his best behavior. Then I remembered what he said about having nightmares about that room where we cleaned up the remnants of the Ron children. Maybe it wasn't surprising after all. Sometimes I think the most terrifying part about death isn't the unknown or the finality of it. The scary part is that we have to do it alone. There is no one to guide us through or hold our hands. It is something that we have to do by ourselves. There is no going back and we have no idea how prepared we really are. It's a part of what makes a religion so appealing. Not just the fact that it gives us hope that we will know what waits with us on the other side, but the idea that there will be someone who loves us and who cares for us and is waiting. In the meantime, while we were still alive, we take what comforts we can find. We all had been through something completely awful. So awful it feels like I should have some sort of permanent stain. Something that advertises to the world just how unclean I really am inside and out. Once more it should stain. No one should be able to go through all that and come out the other side. There should be some towel for Heather, something to let her know that we are no longer the same people. Either there was no Mark or Heather didn't care. She just didn't really need to ask if anything had happened to us. Right now she didn't care how the mission went, what we saw or how we might be scarred. All she cared about was that her friends were back and she wanted us to know that she was happy to see us again. Maybe even someone like Shide could appreciate how wonderful that really was and how much we needed that. I can feel your nipples, Shide declared with a stage whisper. Or uh, maybe Shide was just trying a new jerk tactic. There was that option too. Heather slapped him on the shoulder playfully. Oh, hello there, Mr. Green-Eyed Monster. What did you say your name was? Jenny C? Hey, what an unusual name. Well, why don't you take a seat in the back of my skull and seethe for a bit? That sounds like fun. I glanced away from them and found Professor standing in front of me with a knowing look on her face. Suddenly, I felt childish. Why the hell was I feeling jealousy towards Shide of all people? Okay, rhetorical question. I was jealous because he was doing the alpha male posturing type of flirting with Heather and, uh, to my horror, it seemed to be working. I've always hated guys who could pull that off. I can't. No one would believe me if I tried. If there was some sort of method that did work for me, I might not be so bitter about it. But let's face it, even after all they've been through together, Heather still seemed to look at me like a goofball that she knew in high school. Granted, she was probably right, but I had depths beyond that. Sort of. Yeah, kind of. Okay, so was a work in progress. I smiled at the professor, sheepishly I'm afraid, and held my arms out to the side. She stepped into my embrace and squeezed. I felt almost maternal when she did that. I wanted her to pat my head and tell me that I was still a good boy despite the fact that I secretly wanted to murder Shide. What's Lee doing? She whispered in my ear while hugging me. I glanced to the side. Talking to Jack and the Ron, I said, I think he's... I was cut short by her hands, quickly slid down my back and squeezed my buttocks quickly. I was too shocked to say anything. Sorry, she said with a wry grin. Wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't at least do that once. With that, she walked off and held out her arms for Lee. If you ever feel burning sense of jealousy, I am not sure that I would recommend the tactic of having an extremely youth-looking grandmother grope you as your distraction. I mean, it works. Damn, it works. For the rest of the day, I struggled with conflicting feelings. On the one hand, I think I was meant as a joke. She could see the anger and jealousy that Shide's flirting, and she wanted me to think about something else. Fine, I'm not going to argue with the tactic of a well-placed joke as a way of bleed of tension, but I don't think that was the only thing. Look, laugh all you want, but I felt a bit bitter after that, not just because she stopped me from thinking jealous thoughts. The professor is, well, very an attractive woman. Even if she was in jest, she expressed a bit of interest in me then. It wasn't an interest in pursuing it. I mean, Lee and her were really tight and I've never gotten between that. I cared too much for both of them to do that. But even if I wasn't going to chase after her, it was nice to feel desired. It gave me a bit of an ego boost and, uh, son of a bitch. It's easy to forget the professor has made studying people her entire life. She didn't just read charts and graphs about people either. She went out and looked at humanity as a whole. She had more experience with the high and low points than the human mind was capable of than the rest of us put together, and 
As a result, she had a pretty good idea of how it worked. It was also easy to forget that she spent most of her time being an educator. I was flattered by a bit of attention and boosted my ego. It had been a long, long time since anyone really paid attention to me, even though it wasn't the attention from the person I wanted. It still felt nice. Nicely played, Professor. Nicely played. I looked at Heather again. Really looked at her. She was talking to Lee and Jack now. Shide was still talking to her and still saying crude things. Heather would glance his way and when he did, she would smile a laugh. But then her attention would be drawn back to what the others were saying. The professor was sneaky. I can also see why she was Heather's favorite professor. As I stared at them, it was as if Heather felt my gaze. She glanced back at me and smiled. It was a warmer smile than she had been gifted to Shide, and it felt more natural. I waved and smiled back at her. Sulk mode off. Jealousy forgotten. I was ready to go back to saving the universe once more. That's right, I found myself inspired by Granny Grope. Shut the hell up and stop laughing. Anyway, I finally found myself stepping off the platform. Everyone else was busy, so I approached the Dawn Vengeance. Hello, Dawn Vengeance, I greeted in Chromeric. Greetings, Captain, he replied in run. I froze mid-step. The hell? Isn't it great? Heather said from behind me. I turned to find her behind me beaming at the computer. Her chest seemed puffed up with pride that could just keep me staring at her breast skin. I wrenched my gaze away and met her eyes once more. How? I asked. We talked to him, she explained. We asked why it only spoke Chimeric. Why couldn't it speak any other language? Can you guess what it told us? Now that she'd asked a question, for me, I could take a wild guess. The Chimera put an inhibitor on him, I said. She nodded and a grin broadened. It is a security measure to keep the ship from being taken over by enemies, she said. They have to speak the correct language. But, uh, but Diane lets us take her over when we could only speak English, I protested. Yeah, well, she shrugged, Diane wasn't exactly playing with the rules, we think. Or maybe the genetic sensors trumped the language barrier. We are not sure, but the camera definitely told this one not to learn any new languages. So he's been sitting around waiting for someone to talk to him in the only approved language. We asked if he could remove the inhibitor, and he said that he could, but only with the approval of a senior officer. And you're a senior officer, I said. She was practically bouncing on her heels with excitement now. You would not believe how fast he can learn a language once he's permitted to sample it and work with it, she said. We had to serve as translators for the first few hours or so, but after that he started outperforming us. Now the Ron can talk to him better than they can talk to us. I frowned. That doesn't make sense, I said. We have the symbiote providing on the fry translation. How much better can it get? The Dawn Vention seemed to treat this as a query for anyone who was listening, so he answered for her. He even answered in English just to show off a bit. I spun to face him as he spoke. The Ron are capable of high-speed communications in frequencies beyond the range of human hearing. The computer explained. They are actually significantly higher than the range that most sentient species can perceive, so it is not limited to a human-only weakness. As such, the Ron tend to speak in a slower and lower-pitched language when communicating with others. I, however, am able to process their rapid communications more readily. Heather tapped me on the shoulder, so I turned around to face her once more. That's why the runaways seem to be hesitating before they answer, she said, still smiling. They aren't thinking about it, they're discussing their answer. I grin now. You mean we've been hanging out with the parallel processors? I asked. Her grin faltered. They're what? she asked. Ah, never mind. I wanted to wave it away, but the Dawn Vengeance spoke up again. His assessment is not entirely incorrect. The computer explained, a parallel processor would be many processors are available working simultaneously. A large problem then could be divided up into smaller problems that each unit can then work on as a whole. Oh, she said, then yes, that's about what they do. That's why they never approach us as individuals on their own. They aren't right, but with someone else in the room, their IQs go way up. I looked at the dawn vengeance. A worrying thought struck me. We had now just given her on a very, very fast processor that would work seamlessly with their own method of distributed thinking. What have we just done? Welcome back, you and Jason, the Ron from behind me said. I turned around and found that I was facing a Ron. The other Ron were busy elsewhere in the room. This one was alone. Uh-oh. 
Hello, I said to the Ron. Were you one of the Ron we left here, or were you on the ship with us? I stayed here, the Ron confirmed. The answer was rapid and absolutely no signs of hesitation. Oh dear. So you're talking to the Dawn Vengeance right now, I guess. Yes, the Ron said immediately. The Dawn Vengeance asked me to come over and demonstrate the integration for you. You don't pause between responses now, I pointed out. Overall latency has been reduced as the John Vengeance is capable of passing data in far excess of organic limitations. The Ron explained, The synthetic intelligence matrix can anticipate your question and begin formulating an appropriate response before you finish speaking. My mother did the same thing, I agreed, but her responses were seldom appropriate. That statement has been identified as humor according to the Dawn Vengeance. He's in a minority of thinking that apparently, I replied, and then shifted gears. Why did the Dawn Vengeance call you over? According to behavior profiles, you were demonstrating signs of anxiety upon the revelation of synthetic intelligence's integration with our communication structure. The Ron explained, I've been asked to help you address the apprehensions you may have. I sighed. Fine, I said. How do you know the Dawn Vengeance is informing your opinions for you? You all share the same mental workload. Now you have an outsider influencing that and providing a very hard-to-ignore voice. We had concerns with such as well, the Ron agreed. The concept of synthetic intelligence that could function as a Ron or a Ron collective has been brought up before, but we have never successfully integrated such a matrix. So what's the difference now? This time the Ron did hesitate. We believe, the Ron admitted, that the differences are due to the machinery not being designed by Ron. Any device constructed by the Ron would be built on Ron expectations and preconceived notions in place. This machine was designed by outsiders using methods that we would not have considered. The Matrix is slow by our standards, but powerful in ways ours are not. We have been in discussion with the Dawn Vengeance in regards to how to improve upon its design. You still didn't answer my question, I pointed out. And making the Dawn Vengeance even smarter doesn't sway my concerns. How do you know he's not influencing you? The Dawn Vengeance does not participate continuously, the Ron explained. We have created a schedule of active participant versus privacy. In privacy mode, the Dawn Vengeance is unaware of communications taking place until the mode ends. In addition to scheduled periods of privacy, we also ask for privacy on demand and set a period of time. During such periods of time, we do a self-check to see if the census is unchanged without the synthetic intelligence's input. The pauses, I said. They're back. You've put the Dawn Vengeance in privacy mode. Yes. The Ron admitted after only a moment's pause. I'm in discussion with the other Ron in the room. As multiple conversations are taking place at once, this is much more taxing than before when the Dawn Vengeance could assist. I nodded. How long will the Dawn Vengeance be in privacy mode? I asked. This pause was much longer. The request did not originate from this conversation. The Ron concluded at last. You and Jack has relayed information about the Metaspace weapon. We wish to perform our own analysis of the information before including the Dawn Vengeance. I was about to ask something else when the Ron added, This conversation is proving too taxing as the Metaspace discussion requires full attention. Apologies for the termination of this conversation. With that, the Ron turned around and shuffled back towards the companions. Well, you'd at least apologize before working away. They were learning human manners, it seemed. Nah. Some of them, kind of, but uh, as far as I could tell, the Ron was still leading the scoreboard in the not wanting to shoot humans on sight category, which did a lot of to encourage me to be more forgiving of the social graces in other areas. I looked at the Dawn Vengeance once more. Can you hear me? I asked in Chimeric. No response. Well, say what you will about the Battle Moon computers. They knew how to follow orders. I walked back to the center of the room where the other humans were standing. So you guys told the Ron about the Metaspace leaks, I asked. Heather had wandered off while I was talking to the Ron and now she drifted back. The what? She asked. We didn't have to, he said. The Ron who came with us told them. That's surprising, I said. They seemed to indicate that it wasn't a high priority with them before. I don't think it is, Lee replied. I think that they're just worried about it. They aren't going to do anything about it for right now, but they are going to worry. Worry about what? Heather said. Oh, nothing, I said with a shrug. The Chimera just destroyed the galaxy about 50 years ago, so what have you two been up to? That's how I discovered the Ron suits really didn't offer a whole lot of protection in the general area. Rolling around on the floor groaning only caught snippets of conversation going on over my head. 
after we explained the dawn vengeance that the rules of hiding its intelligence only applied when it was a battleship, the professor was saying. Then after that, things got easier. I think it took someone saying it for the poor thing to realize that it had been decommissioned had its perks. So, it stopped pretending to be dumber than it was, Jack asked. Not just that, the professor said. We got access to the data and we weren't able to get before. A lot of it still ended up being classified and off-limits, but without the possibility of enemy combatants, the computer seemed to be able to divulge more. It divulged a bit more after it defected to the run, Heather added. It did what? And he asked, defected! Heather exclaimed. I groaned and rolled over on my hands, cupping my balls. I stopped paying attention again. The pain began to fade after a while, and I decided to listen once more. Gaha! I tuned everything out again. Gleep! You are unwell. Damn it. The last one was directed at me. I looked up and saw Paul and felt death looming over me. I'll be fine, I said. I'm just hoping the puberty goes a bit faster this time around. What do you want? The Teths paused. Ah, we are leaving, Paul Teth admitted. Gleep, Paul Teth added. We have no place aboard the run. Ah, and we do not wish to go to Overseer. Gleep, but we believe our warrants are still outstanding there. Huh? I stammered. Gah! Valtez said, plunging in. The Ron will drop us off at the nearby Mulipth colony. Gleep, Valtez added. We hope to get work as a nacelle artist. Gah! Though we may take our summers off because of the smell. The hell are you two talking about? I asked. Gleep, we're saying farewell, Valtez explained. Gah! And telling you that you're welcome to join our crew again if you like. Gleep, but not at your previous rank. Gah! Of course not. Gah! You have to work back up to Cabin Boy. What? They didn't answer. They spun around on the stubby legs and sauntered off in another direction. I felt like I was in the middle of a play where everyone else had gotten a copy of the script, except me. I stood up on shaky legs and limped in the direction of where Lee, Jack, and Shida gathered. Hey, guys! I croaked. What's shaking? They've got a treat for us, Jack informed me. What? Who? I asked. The professor and Heather. Lee explained. It turns out that even though we don't need to eat most of the time, when we're in these suits, if we want to, those two have been playing with the matter converter and getting the Dawn Vengeance to help out with reconfiguring it. They said that they've got the close approximation of flour, butter, eggs, and milk. And syrup, Jack added with a nod. They're making some cavage called waffles. Chide said as he jerked his head in the direction of the corner of the room. The professor and Heather were standing next to a box that I hadn't noticed before. On the top of the box was something that looked a lot like a cordless waffle iron. Steam was rising out of the sides. Waffles! Jack corrected. What? The Kavanj ever? Shide said as he rolled his eyes. Apparently they are something good from your world. You mean, while we were dodging gunfire and forest fires, I said... I'm mopping up entrails of those two who were just sitting back trying to make waffles. Yeah, he said. Guess we should have rethought our duty roster. My aching balls. But uh, now that they mention it, I could smell waffles. They smelled pretty good. Um, I said as I looked around. Are we standing over the sink and eating? The Ron half fabricating tables and chairs for us right now. B pointed out while gesturing to indicate a group of Ron standing nearby. The Ron pointed something at the floor and wandered off. As I watched, the stone floor seemed to melt in the spot where they had pointed the device. The floor erupted like it was a miniature volcano there. The plume of molten rock shot upwards, flattened out, and cooled into the shape of a table with a conical center column as a support. Smaller eruptions took place around the table to form the six stools. Okay, that was sort of neat. We walked over to the table and each took a stool. I felt strange to all go through me. I had recently sat in a very similar table and stool arrangement. Then I'd faced the game master. Was this deliberate? Probably, I decided. Not in the sense that the Ron wished to traumatize me. They probably just saw the arrangement and thought that it was a good idea. Ah, ah, to be utterly clueless about how emotions actually work. The professor and Heather came over bearing plates of overflowing with huge stacks of something that almost resembled waffles. They snapped them down at the center of the table. A moment later, they returned back with a stack of plates with silverware. Well, blackware. The plates and cutlery were made out of the same black polymer which Ron used to synthesize everything. The professor put a plate, a fork, and a knife in front of me. 
Heather immediately snapped a waffle down and then picked up a pitcher, black, naturally, and drizzled the amber liquid over them. The liquid was still slightly off in color and viscosity, but it was close. I cut off the slice and lifted it to my mouth. So, I said as I chewed on a forkful, for my modestly heroic plan, I think we should... Hey, these waffles are pretty good. What's in them? There's waffles in them, Heather said quickly. She was lying. I decided not to press the issue. You know, I said as I twirled the fork in the air. Instead of discussing heroic plans, maybe we should just sit here and eat silently. Which we did. We all sat down and chewed on a complete silence for approximately four and a half minutes. Shy, naturally, was the one to break the silence. Shy glanced up and looked at pure horror painted itself across his face. He pointed at something behind me. No, Mike Vaj, he screamed. The hideous mutant squid has escaped. I turned around and looked. Silthus was standing right behind me. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 98, written by Semi Loki. Do not be alarmed. It took me a few minutes to place the source of that command. I was too busy staring into the eyes of Silthus. The alien acolyte stood there, ramrod stiff and unmoving. Was he waiting on something? Do not be alarmed, the voice repeated. The specimen is cognitively inactive. It was only one species that I knew of spoke such a flat monotone. I blinked and looked over to see a trio of Ron approaching. What the hell does that mean? I asked. We retrieved the body but kept the mind switched off. The Ron explained, We have brought him here as we need your assistance. What sort of assistance? I asked suspiciously. We have previously held discussions with Professor Madakai about the concept of plausible fictions. The Ron explained patiently. According to her, it is important to include small details to enhance credibility. I looked over at the professor, and she shrugged. It's true, she agreed. I'm an anthropologist, remember? I figured while I had some downtime, I might be a good idea to talk to the Ron about their culture. And? I asked. They don't have any, she remarked. Well, at least not in the ways we think of it. No art, no traditions, no songs or stories. Everything has a well-grounded purpose, and it wasn't necessitated by biology. It's usually determined for pragmatic reasons. It's really fascinating. I held up a hand to her. Fascinating, I agreed. But what is this talking about this plausible fiction? Oh, she said and looked thoughtful. I had a hard time explaining the difference between a fiction and a lie. To the Ron, they had much the same thing. I tried to explain how one is meant to conceive while the other is meant to entertain. Honestly, until now I did not think that they really understood me. We comprehend, the lead Ron interjected. It is simply an unusual concept. Perhaps it is due to the fact that individual Ron have limited mental faculties, and it is only when we are in groups that we have higher cognitive abilities. Perhaps that is why we feel no desire to invent during idle periods. Ron, intelligence is great or as limited as needed for the task. Interesting idea. Was that all the fiction really were? A way to bleed off surplus intelligence during idle moments? Made about as much sense as anything else, I guess. That didn't answer my question. I remarked as I returned my focus to the professor. What is he talking about? No, oh, she said as she looked up at the ceiling to try to recall the conversation. I think I said something about how both lies and fiction rely on a small details to make them convincing. Correct, the one agreed. You used an example of a forged document and stated that a beverage stain would make it look more realistic, as if the document was more perfect than the other documents that would lead to questions of its authenticity. We do not understand the reference to this coffee beverage you spoke of, or why the ring is often evident on documents, but we do believe we understand the concept. Small and insignificant deviations from an ideal are to be expected. If there are no deviations, it creates distrust. The professor blinked in surprise. I suppose that's one way of saying it, she said with a nod. Yes, we expect small and insignificant setbacks. If everything goes perfectly, we tend to assume something is wrong that we don't immediately recognize. This was our understanding as well, the one replied. We have been supplying fictional journey for this one and the other creature as they transported you captives to overseer. However, from our contact with humans, we have deduced it is unlikely that you would complete such a lengthy voyage without making some escape attempt. Not that right, Lee muttered beside him. As such, we are constructing memories that include two escape attempts. 
The rod went on, one of which was easily foiled, but the other was a more challenging. I frowned. You're trying to give these memories added realism by giving them fake memories of a prison breaks, I asked. It is consistent with our understanding of humans, the Ron repeated. When you are in a situation that is no longer to your advantage, you will attempt to escape it or convert it to your advantage. As long as the failure is survivable, you appear to be willing to risk it as long as you can learn more for future attempts. The damn bug just summed up more about human nature in a few sentences the entire shelf of psychology textbooks might dream to accomplish. He was right. We would never be model prisoners, not just the ones that in this room either, humans in general. Survivability of risk was a big factor. If the worst you could expect was to be right back where we started, we'd try all sorts of crazy stuff. Hell, I think it pretty much describes how we advanced as a society. The alternative wasn't worse, so we tried something stupid to see what would happen next. If I knew that the worst that could happen would be the Captain Quark and would toss me back in a cell, I'd try anything, because you never knew. Maybe his species could be easily hypnotized by watching the swaying motions of a naked Glutamus Maximus as it bobbed up and down in the tune of staying alive. Sure, the odds were slim, but uh, I had time on my hands. Suddenly, a lot of what I heard about what goes on inside a prison makes a lot more sense. Okay, I said, what do you need for our mass? Do you want to know what we might try? We've inferred that this is irrelevant as Quark and Sulthus are no more familiar with what tactics you might employ than we are, the Ron said. As long as it is plausible signs of being human in origin, they will find it credible. As you have employed violence in the past as a method of overcoming these beings, we believe that it is reasonable to presume that you might resort to such tactics again. Therefore, we believe Quark will reach similar conclusions. With you so far, I agreed with a nod, we'll do something that involves lots of noise and pummeling, so why is the twerp here? I pointed to Sulthus' statue. We believe the injury attained during the escaped attempt would enhance plausibility, the Ron explained. We could replicate an injury to this one's person, but we are not entirely familiar with the methods the humans employed attacking. We thought if one of you was willing to actually injure Sulthus, we would only create a scenario to match the wounds rather than create a wound to match a scenario. Lee leapt to his feet. Jason, he said quickly, I haven't asked you for much since we started this, but I'm asking you now. Please, let me have this honor. You'll kill him, I pointed out. Only a little, he pleaded. The Ron can just patch him up again. Lee, I said as I reached over and gently punched him on the shoulder. If I ever need to figure out how close to the brink of death I can push someone, you will always be my first choice. The problem is that even if a fictional scenario, I can't imagine you letting Squid Boy here walk away. He looked as if he was about to argue to the point when I saw that he was taking to my meaning. Oh, he said, so non-lethal injury from me would raise too many questions. I nodded. Same goes for me, I pointed out. I've actually killed Quack before, in fact. If there is severe enough that they have to use a surgery pod just to survive, then they'll be all healed up and this would be pointless. They need an injury that is bad enough to leave a mark, but not bad enough that he needs to be taken off duty. Lee sat down and looked disappointed. We need, I continued, someone they can expect to act more restrained. Shai looked up. Is this your cavorging way of saying I can't knock his cavorger off and say it? He said, Chide, I'm honestly surprised that you know the meaning of the word restraint, I replied. Of course I do, he said when shot me an indignant look. It's everything I cavodging try and avoid. Right, I said with looked over at Jack. Jack, I began. I'm too out, she said. I was actually about to ask her to do it when I realized that she was probably right. I didn't tend to think of Jack as being violent, personally. She still looked like a child and, well, she was always nice to me. To all of us, loyal to a fault, if we asked her to jump off a cliff and tell us how tall it was, I think she'd hear the steady stream of numbers before the final splat. No questioning it. She just did what was needed. However, when dealing with anyone else, she displayed more than a touch of aptitude for violence. In fact, she probably rivaled Lee in that department. It was a tough call as to which one was more dangerous. In terms of skill and experience, Lee had all of us beat several times over. He had forgotten more ways to shatter bones than the rest of us knew to put together. Jack, on the other hand, had an innate cunning that gave her a certain edge. She was good at figuring out ways of coming at a problem from unusual angles. 
No, I couldn't use her. We'd have to create a structural damage to the ship as well as fabricate injuries. I looked at the professor. She raised an eyebrow. Aren't you being a touch sexist now? She asked me. I gave her a wide-eyed stare. We've eliminated all the males, I protested. How can I be? Dwack! I glanced back at the sound of the impact. Sulthus lay spread eagle. All squid on the floor, his tentacles splayed out around him like petals on a sunflower. A gash had appeared on his face just below the left eye. A weird bluish fluid seeped out, which I assumed was an allergist for blood. But maybe the sinus cavity had been ruptured and it was just snot. Who knows? Standing over him was Heather, shaking her hand as if trying to coax life back into it. She shot me a severe look. What? She asked. They wouldn't expect it from me. With that, she stormed off. She was still shaking her hand all the way out. Um, I stammered. That's not right, he said. I think the professor added as she stood up. I should go after her. The professor didn't give us time to argue. She was already moving and leaving the four of us just sitting there in stunned silence. Kavodge, Shai spoke up, not sure if I should be turned on by that or not. I looked at him and back to the run. Is that enough or do you want me to kick him a bit in the ribs while he's down? Baldarians do not have ribs, the Ron replied, but this injury should be adequate. We thank you. The Ron did something. I don't know what, but the fallen alien stood up stiffly. His movements were weirdly mechanical. After getting his feet, uh, tentacles, the Ron turned about and walked away. The Baldarian's tentacles snapped on the floor as he followed along. I think, I said, breakfast is officially adjourned. No one argued. Jack stood up and trotted off in the direction of the Dawn Vengeance. Shide wandered off a moment later. I had no clue where he was going. I looked at Lee. Guess we have kitchen detail, I remarked. Hmm, he replied, and sounded distracted. I shrugged and picked up the plates. Cleanup turned out to be a cinch. There was no tap or washing machine. There wasn't even a garbage can, but the hot plate was a receptacle on the surface of the counter. I dumped everything, plates, silverware included, into that hole. Anything that could be recycled was reprocessed. Everything that couldn't be recycled had better damn well find a way to be recycled because it was happening either way. Neat, efficient, and labor-saving. I liked it. I should patent this idea when we get back to Earth. Lee carried over an armful of plates and dumped them into the hole as well. Hey, Jason, he said as I turned around to pick up the rest. You've known Heather for a long while, right? I looked back at him. A while, I agreed. What of it? Does she have brothers? He asked. Or maybe she ever had no what you call a tomboy. No to both of them, I said. What about martial arts classes? Again, no. Maybe she took them and never told you, he asked. Like self-defense course. Possible, I agreed. We haven't spoken much in these past few years, but I doubt it. Heather just doesn't strike me as the type. Lee nodded and seemed to be lost in thought. I saw him glance the way Heather had gone. Maybe it's nothing, he mumbled half to himself. Lee, I asked. He stood there, his head in and smiled at me. It's just thinking, Jason, he said, which is out of character enough as it is, I agreed. Spill it. He didn't even rise to the bait of the insult I just handed him. It's just that, uh, he said after shooting another quick glance at Heather. Did you see her throw that punch? No, I confessed. I was looking elsewhere. What of it? She threw it properly, he said. I looked at him. I don't get you, I admitted. He rolled his eyes. Okay, he said, you've seen it a hundred times in the movies. Act like you're going to punch me in the head. I looked at him. Seriously, I asked, you'll break my arm. Don't actually do it, he said, just show me your form. I was suddenly very self-conscious, but I decided to humor him. I drew back my hand and, and aimed at his head. That will hurt me a lot, he said as I presumed the position, but I think those broken fingers of yours will hurt a lot more. Looking at my hand, they didn't seem broken. Hold still, he said as he reached out for my hand. I half expected him to show me some submission hold. No, he just adjusted the angle of my fist. Better, he said. That keeps you from hitting someone's skull with the flat of your fingers. Now you are hurt with your knuckles, which are a lot tougher. It'll hurt you a lot less and your fingers will be okay. I yanked my hand from free from his. I punched someone before, I pointed out. Sure, he agreed. In armor. Want to guess what the armor did for you? I also fought a haploid without armor, I protested. He sighed. Yes, but breaking a rock over someone's head hurts a lot less than punching them no matter the technique, he said. I was clearly not going to win this argument. 
What's your point? I asked Elias. He shrugged. No point, he said. Just odd, considering how averse she is to violence. Except when you've made an awful joke, that is. She threw that punch like she'd done it a thousand times before. She shifted her weight in the right way and locked her shoulder. It's like she was a Golden Gloves boxer or something. Maybe she just got lucky. She hurt her hand, I pointed out. Hitting someone in the head does that, he continued. Even for professionals. Do you think boxing gloves are to protect someone's head? I don't know if Silthus has a skull like we do, or what he has, but if he keeps his brains in his head like we do, then it's reasonable to assume that his body has some sort of protection for it. I frowned. I wasn't convinced, but I had to admit that it was a little odd. Well, I said, maybe she watches a lot of boxing matches, or, um, even I don't buy that one. You're right. It had to be a coincidence. Had to be, he agreed. Then why did it sit oddly with me? Maybe I should ask Heather if she knew any boxers. Maybe she used to date one. That probably wasn't true either. Coincidence. It just had to be a coincidence. A million to one shot that she did everything right, just right. Well, I said after a moment's thought, since you are handing out free advice about punching, do you want to work on my technique some more? He shrugged again. Sure, he said, but I'm only going to give you pointers. I won't teach you any moves. Why not? I asked suspiciously. Whenever you were training with the dire blade, he said, you weren't really given instructions, were you? The ship just came at you, and if you lived, good, and if not, you just went to surgery. I nodded. It was an accurate assessment. Well, he said as he stretched out his chin, without a formal fighting style, you just have to figure stuff out, and did what worked. You've got something going that works for you. If I teach you something else, it might conflict with the reflexes that you've already developing. I don't know. Or you'll start fighting my way rather than your way, and I don't think having two guys who do exactly the same thing is always a good idea. Am I making sense? Nope, I told him. Fine, he said. Then I'm not teaching you because you're slow learning and I don't want to have to keep kidding you to drive the lesson home. That works for me. For the next half an hour, we stood there with throwing my mock punches. Lee would then point out which bones I would break and other injuries I would sustain. By the end of that, I got pretty fed up. Is there a way to hit someone without hurting myself? I asked. Not really, he admitted. Your hands aren't meant for hitting things. They'll do it. They'll do a good job of it. But that's pretty low down on the list of priorities. That's why we invented weapons. Were you always the sarcastic or have you been a bad influence on you? He shrugged. It's a language you understand, he pointed out. Couldn't argue with that. After about 15 minutes of drilling, he pronounced himself satisfied that I had improved my technique and told me to keep practicing. He walked off and I was left alone shadow boxing next to the wall. 45 minutes of exertion and I still felt okay. When we started the trip, I think 5 minutes of exercise might have been pushing my limits. I'd been broken, healed, regrown and rebuilt. How much of me was still the me of the original? Had anything other than my memories ever touched earth? I punched the air some more. I didn't want to admit it, but Lee's words had started nagging a worry. I had been in fights. I had been killed a few times. Still, Lee showed me I had room for improvement. Heather had been an expert the first time. There was something there. It gnawed at me. I didn't like it, but was walking up to Heather and asking, So, uh, been beating the crap out of people lessons? I fainted with my left arm and threw out a right hook to my shadow's head. He got a fist up in time. No matter how good a boxer you are, it's hard to get a drop on your own shadow. I dropped my fists and wiped the sweat away from my brow with the back of my hand. I wouldn't be able to relax until I confronted Heather. Nee was right. She had been acting a bit off for a while now. I had ignored it and put it down to stress, but, uh, let's face it, something had been pretty askew with Heather. She's never been able to watch old Yella all the way to the end. Half of the pictures on her Facebook page, okay, yes, I saw sort of stalking her. Shut up. Were her hugging her friends. When the hell did she take up a hand-to-hand -hand combat? Plus, the whole bisexual thing still bugged me. Not that I have a problem with it, but still there had been no hint at it and I had not noticed. Since we had been on the strange trip, the professor had been naked a few times. During those times, I never noticed Heather's eyes being drawn to the professor's breasts. Those things were like gravity. You couldn't resist the pull. At least I couldn't. Shied and Lee seemed to be as helpless, but I never noticed Heather experiencing a similar problem. If her brain was wide for both directions, then how could I explain that? 
kryptonite sunglasses? Something was up and I was going to find out what. I went over looking for Heather. She wasn't in the room downstairs, so I rode the lift up. I mean, where else could she go? Once we were there at the top, however, there was a multiple places she could go. She still had a cat. If she got one of those tainted cloaks and she really had the entire planet to run around. So I just hopped where I got lucky. I got lucky. As I walked down the corridor, I heard voices. One of them sounded like Heather's. The other one... That one I didn't recognize. I followed the sound around the corner and down the hallway I never noticed before. Maybe it hadn't been there before and the Ron had just dug it since I left. Who knows? All I know was that the sound was coming from down there and I walked towards it. Gotta stop, Heather said. In time, the other voice remarked. We are very close. That was odd. Heather had been speaking in English. Of all of us, save for Shide, did that by force of habit, but the other voice was speaking in chimeric. They were in a room just off the hallway ahead of me. I crept up to it and peeked around the door frame. The room was small, not much more than an alcove or a walk-in closet perhaps. I saw Heather easily enough, but as for who she was talking to, I had no sign. A com, maybe. Why are you doing this? Heather asked. I was still looking for the comm when Heather surprised me by answering her own question, just not in her own voice. This is not your concern, she hissed. Your concern is getting me to overseer. Holy crap. Heather jerked a bolt upright and wheeled around to stare at me. Crap. I must have said that out loud. You said that out loud as well, Heather pointed out in a normal voice. I really suck at this. Hey, Heather, I said coolly as I forced my smile to my lips. Who's your friend? She licked her lips and seemed hesitant to answer. Then, all at once, her face changed. I didn't mean like some sort of faceless man sort of thing. It was still her face, just wrong. The muscles seemed to tense up all wrong places, causing her face to look more gaunt and angular than it had any business being. Her lips twisted into a sneer. Lastly, her eyes. They blazed with a cold fury. Jason, she hissed at me. I've been expecting you. She walked out of the alcove to face me. As she walked, I felt her hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. Her gait was wrong. Don't ask me to explain it other than it was just wrong. She moved like someone else. In fact, I'd seen someone who moved just like that before. The moron, I gasped. Macnon, she gasped. Macnon act like doctor. No, I said. I think I was right the first time. Aren't you supposed to be dead? His face snapped back into Heather's normal features. I'm sorry, Dacian, she said. I wanted to tell you before, but he... Her face slipped again. Silence, Terror Heather ordered. I will deal with this wretch. Yes, you kill my body. But when one is desperate, the mind is capable of remarkable things. Sahiji circled in front of me. Sahi flexed her fingers, readying herself to strike. Um, I said. Don't know what you're thinking about. It's probably a really bad idea. I should thank you, Akloroctor remarked. Oh, sure, I said. It was a pleasure killing you. Not for that, you fool, he glowered, for getting this one killed. She waved her hands as if to encompass her entire body. Your native defensive desire attacks are truly impressive. He went on. I was only able to embed myself into this one psychic germ, a mental suggestion, even when it was just only because her anxiety disorder made her defenses weaker. Still, a part of me did survive from her, then it grew. Uh-huh, I said as I circled away from where she had headed. I'm less interested in how you survived than I am in finding out how to make you not survive. When the Ron meddled with her brain, he added, and she lost inhibitions, I was able to break free from when I was encapsulated. By the time they repaired the damage, I was able to begin influencing her actions and alter her brain structure. Even then, I would have ultimately failed if you hadn't allowed her to be killed. When the Ron rebuilt her mind, I was able to influence the design that they thought that they were reconstructing. Damn it! The reconstruction. I should have thought of that when I first heard of the two-sided conversation. The Ron had so little data on humans. They were only guessing what was normal and what was not. You tricked the Ron into granting you more real estate, I said. Oh, you underestimate me, child, he said slowly. I've done more than that. 
I saw her body tense up just a moment before she struck. I was still tired from my earlier workout, but there was nothing wrong with my reflexes. Her fist flew towards my solar plexus. I leapt backwards and brought my left arm down in an arm chop. Her knuckles fell short and the target, and I battered them away without a problem. I brought up my own right hand and launched a counterattack and hesitated. What the hell was I doing? This was Heather. I just barely managed to dodge the next strike. She aimed it at my nose that time. I got the impression she wasn't planning on just breaking it either. I saw a flicker of frustration across the twisted character of Heather's face. Ak Le Rocter was used to a stronger and faster body. He seemed to regard my continued survival for even this brief fight to be a personal insult. I danced away from her. I had reach and strength on her, but I was also tired and she was fully rested. Worse, she had a centuries-old psychopath inhabiting her skull. Him, I wanted to clobber her, uh, not so much. I couldn't risk striking her, but I couldn't let this jerk tank crap all over her brainstem either. What the hell was I supposed to do? I fainted. She threw another punch and I narrowly avoided having to snap my ribcage. I took the blow to the shoulder instead. Pain flared up and my left arm went numb. I moved to fingers experimentally. They moved. I think that was a good sign. She jumped at me. I jumped away. She punched. I blocked. It was obvious that I wasn't going to fight back. The thing piloting her body could tell that. All they had to do was keep coming at me and wait for a lucky shot, and I was doomed. Judging by the way my breathing was growing ragged, and the stitch in my side that lucky shot was going to happen sooner rather than later. She threw a left hand a punch at my cheek. Like an idiot, I dodged to the side and lined myself up perfectly for her right fist. I should have let it land. There was no power behind that punch. This one, however, was different. She threw it practically before I moved. By the time I realized my mistake, it was too late. Her fist pulled up my vision. There was no corridor, no ice world, nothing. My entire universe compacted into four standard knuckles bearing down on me. There was nowhere I could run in time to avoid that. So, Heather did it for me. Her knee went out in front from under her and her punch missed its target. It grazed my cheek and it threw me to the side. My face was numb now that I was still standing. Heather's fist slammed into the wall behind us and with enough force that I heard a bone shatter. The pain broke his concentration. He wasn't used to it. His face exploded and Heather's returned in a brief moment. Jason! She growled at me through gritted teeth. If you've ever loved me, then you'll knock me the frick out right now. Her expression shifted again. This time it seemed to spasm from one extreme to the other. Soft, then hard, angular, then curved, back and forth as they wrestled for control. Heather's left arm seized her right wrist and held it tight. There was a battle going on beneath the surface and, uh, for a moment at least, she was paralyzed and was warred with control of her own body. Heather. I made up my mind. As you wish, I declared. They both looked up at me at the same moment. I think they were looking at my hands to see if they would punch her. I couldn't bring myself to do that. I was just wrong. So I kicked her instead. Her face went slack as her body slumped to the floor. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 99 Written by Sebi Loki All right, I admit it. I confess it. The image of Heather tied to it had uh, briefly crossed my mind more than a few occasions. Now that I was finally happening, I was finding the whole experience less, um, Fifty Shades of Grey and more, um, The Exorcist. Unhand me, you barbarians! She screamed as I wrestled her leg into a strap. She tried to kick me as I worked out, but uh, fortunately I had mass in my side. In a way, that meant I was luckier than Jack. She was wrestling with an arm while trying to avoid Heather's teeth. Sedative, I suggested in the top of my lungs, not for the first time. We are administering one, the Ron voice said from somewhere behind me. The invasion of mind is stimulating the gland that is secreting a powerful steroid, which we are having difficulty compensating for. Adrenal glands, I guessed. Right, as if I didn't have enough to worry about. A fane that was using cheat codes to try and get Heather to hulk out on us. If we didn't end this soon, she would either try to rip the table apart with her bare hands and claw rust, or she'd have a stroke. At that moment, I didn't think Akla Rockter cared much for the result played out as long as it irritated us. It was time to get smart. Too bad. I suck at that. 
Me, I shouted from him in the room. Do something. Knocking her out is a bad idea, he shouted back. Multiple concussions can cause lasting brain damage and just do it. Heather shouted in her own voice, please. I heard a meaty smack and Heather's body went limp. I bowed her leg quickly and looked up at her face. To my surprise, her eyes were open. She was awake, awake with a sickly green cast to her features. I looked at Lee. He was flexing his fingers as if trying to get the blood flowing into them once more. He caught me staring. He shrugged. You said the fate didn't seem to be used to pain, he said. I figured that may not be familiar with the feeling of being punched in the esophagus. You could have killed her, I protested. He looked down at her and frowned. Unlikely, he said. I missed the larynx. Anyway, I pulled my punch. She'll be fine once she catches her breath. Heather gasped. I'm sure there was an entire chapters and rules of etiquette where we were trampling on all over here. I mean, how do you not hit a woman when you're aiming for the parasitic monster invading her mind? Guilt later, results now. Sanditive, I shouted again. Heather's eyes rolled in my direction. Her brows knit in anger and the face struggled to control once more. Then her face relaxed and she collapsed limply on the table. We have determined the appropriate dosage, the Ron declared unnecessarily. Thanks, I muttered. We could implant the shut-up device, much like the ones we use for the hunter-seekers, the Ron offered. No thanks, I said as I stepped back in to admire our handiwork. Heather was trussed up like Frankenstein's monster before receiving the 8.3 gigawatts across the nipples. Carrying her body back to the others had been one of the most painful things I had ever done in my life. I mean that literally, by the way. It is hard to carry someone when they are trying to punch your kidneys at the same time. I hadn't knocked her out for long when I kicked her. Not that I was surprised by that. From what I understand, the idea of punching someone to knock them out over an hour or so is pretty much a Hollywood invention. In reality, knocking someone out for more than a few minutes with a punch is difficult to do. Good thing too, because any longer and it would be a sign of traumatic brain injury. Getting punched in the head is not some sort of magic sleep button. I knew that before I picked her up in a fireman's carry and started jogging back towards the lift. But I was not prepared for the extreme violence I was greeted with upon her regaining consciousness. I figured there would be a few moments of being groggy and disoriented. I hoped for a few minutes that she would have bad aim. Instead, she roused like a caged animal and began flailing. The Ron suit protected me from the nails. Not mine, hers. The gloves covered them, so the attack was mostly rubbery feeding raking my skin. She then tried to punch me in my spine. That hurt, but she was also really bad angle to get a lot of strength behind it. By the time I got into the lift, she changed tactics again and tried to elbow me in the back of the head. That really, really hurt. I nearly dropped her as the star swam before my eyes. So, by reflex, I nodded my head and put the helmet up. That turned out to be a mixed blessing. The psychopath helmet slid over my head and, uh, all at once I decided I was really tired of getting punched. As always, I wasn't aware of any change in my mental process. It just seemed natural that I might just decide that I had enough abuse. We were in a lift descending a shaft. At that moment, I was sure of a reason I had been tolerating for a certain amount of abuse before because I was worried she might escape. Since climbing the walls was out of the question, that concern was gone. So I grabbed her by the legs and shoved her upwards. She spewed over my back and fell face first onto the floor. She screamed as she fell. If I dropped the helmet, then I probably would have been horrified at what I did. I didn't really need the helmet, so I could have dropped it. But I didn't think about it, and I still felt like I was acting normally. I turned around to see Heather struggling to regain her feet. Well, that would be a problem. I kicked her back down onto the floor. She was flat on her belly and spread eagle. I straddled her spine and spinned her arms onto the floor with my knees, and then placed my hands on the sides of her skull, and in the calmest ways possible said, Stop moving, or I bounce your head on the floor until you stop moving. Your choice. To me, that was the worst moment, not because I had hurt Heather. I mean, yes, that was bad. I mean, definitely not advocating any action I took. I was desperate and Heather wasn't in control. When she was in control, she was even asked me to hit her, so in a way, I could almost convince myself that I was helping her. Almost. I was a poor soul for my conscience, and as I was pressed for time. But this, this I had no excuse for. 
I casually threatened to kill Heather, and, worst of all, it meant every single word of it. I was growing impatient with Aclaractor, and I was going to solve this problem one way or another. It all seemed so logical then. Crash her head and the fay was gone. It wasn't like Heather was in a place to object. It was no less than I had said that I would have had Summer or Tur pulled out variation of the same trick. But it was different. To me, it was different. I'd known Heather for most of my life. I hate myself for saying this, but Heather was different. It shouldn't have been so easy for me to make that a threat. No, not a threat, a sincere promise. I can tell myself it was because the helmet was up. But deep down, I know this isn't even true. The helmet turns off a small part of me, but the mind that created those thoughts was still me. It was me. I'd always been me. The helmet just made me take those decisions easier to do. They were, at their core, still human, highly modified and insane humans, but humans all the same. He was just as adept at reading verbal and non-verbal cues as any human, and he must have caught something in my tone of voice because Aclarateur lost all interest in struggling until he hit the bottom. I used the suit to amplify my voice. I need help, I shouted. One of the fae has gotten into her head. Heather squirmed. I tightened my grip on her head. She relaxed. Stalemate. To their credit, my crew didn't ask me any more questions other than, What do you need? They peered out of the corners of the room, and we all grabbed a Heather and dragged her into the room, kicking and screaming. I think that's when the fae truly realized that he was caught. He, or she, thrashed as she screamed. Eventually, this brought the attention of the Ron who constructed the table with restraints for us on the spot. I need you to fix her, I told the Ron now that Heather was secure. I'd lowered my helmet somewhere along the line and now the realization of what I'd came coming back to me. I was pushed inside for a moment. Survive now, apologize later. We are uncertain of how to do that. The spokes Ron stood on one side. He held one of those magic healing ones in one unfolded arm. Six other Rons scurried about the room. Some held strange boxes that they used to scan Heather. Others just seemed to be running aimlessly. What do you mean by that? I stammered. That you rebuilt us after we died. How hard can it be to remove this infection? This is not an organic infection. The Ron pointed out. If we rebuild her brain and copy her mind state back upon the problem will persist. Her conscious mind has been corrupted and we do not have a copy of her uninfected mind. Can't you separate out the two of them? I asked. You said that you could alter memories. Can't you make her, well, forget this? We believe that that would be unwise. The Ron stated. We believe that before she was aware of the presence, she was unable to resist it. If we remove her awareness, it may no longer be impeded. I rubbed my temples in exasperation. Can you, I don't know, roll her mind back to an earlier version where she didn't have such a strong foothold, I asked. Yes, the Ron confirmed. That is easily accomplished. The presence will then grow once more and we will be at a state once more. The presence is thoroughly meshed in with her own mind. We cannot erase it without erasing her as well. I groaned in frustration and squatted down next to the table and looked upon Heather's sleeping form. Her face was her own once more. Damn this, damn this all. You mean there is nothing we can do? I asked without looking up. Consulting, the Rung replied. Consulting? With who? I asked and stood up again. The Dawn Vengeance, the Ron replied. The synthetic intelligence has a much more detailed record of human anatomy and mental functions than we possess. I frowned. Those records have to be thousands of years old by now, I pointed out. The records are dated in their evidence of evolutionary drift, the Ron agreed. However, much of the information is still within normal tolerances. Your brain anatomy has changed only slightly during the time period. We are comparing her brain scans across millions of similar scans from your species. Why? I asked. So you can lobotomize the pay part of a brain. The Ron fell silent for a moment. I had gotten so used to the rapid communication style when Dawn Vengeance was active that the now normal pauses now seemed eerie. Removal of the lobe would cause additional problems that would deem unacceptable. It concluded, Furthermore, we do not believe the presence would be completely isolated in a compromised area. Did you ever get the feeling that we were missing a bit part of conversation? What compromised area? I sputtered. The Ron was silent. You suggested destruction of a lobe. Ron reminded me. We thought you were aware of what the scans revealed. What are you talking about? I was shouted. I've never... 
Then it hit me. I'd asked it if they were going to lobotomize her. I'd used the term without thinking about it. It was an English word filled with lots of dark connotations. If you say it with any other English speaker, and they instantly think of sharp needles, tiny hammers, and ruthless doctors. They think of dimly lit hospital wards filled with walking corpses, alive only in the strictest biological terms. It was easy to forget that the term actually was a medical term. Before the gruesome nature became popularized in film and horror stories, it was a fairly common medical term. At one time, it was a procedure that many thought was great promise. This wasn't something crudely done with a high explosives and a railroad spikes like Phineas Gage. It was a small surgical strike meant to target only the area of the brain thought to be the source of the problem. Did it work? Meh. It sometimes helped, sometimes it didn't. This was still the pioneering days of medicine and there was a lot of cowboy medical practices. So there might have been a more than a little fudging of the medical data to make it seem like a more promising than it really was. After all, no sense in abandoning a promising branch of research just because it resulted in a few zombies. At least, that's what they say in Raccoon City. But I digress. My point is that a mind of zombies were actually the exception. Most people may have had a change in their personality, but they were still living and thinking creatures afterwards. Maybe that's the part of the reason it took so long to abandon the idea of fixing people with a spike to the brain. I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures, right? Got to protect the Kennedy name. For a long time, lobotomy seemed to be a legitimate answer to medical health problems of the world. Back when it was still a medical term, lobotomy, to slice a lobe. A lobe. I felt my eyes widen. Show me! I ordered. If the Ron thought it was being rude or presumptuous, they didn't react. I don't think they really comprehended the idea of the rudeness. Barking an order just meant I was really in a hurry, which in reality I was. An image of a translucent brain appeared in the air just above Heather's chest. It rotated about its axis until a certain part of it was right in front of my nose. It lit up like I highlighted a very familiar area. Son of a... I muttered. That's the region the Chimera altered, the professor interrupted. Where we were developing telepathy before, they altered it. I nodded in agreement. We all recalled the demonstration that Volson had put on for us so long ago as she showed us the legacy of the Chimera experimentation on humans. Isn't that the region now hooked up backwards or something? He asked. I seem to remember it hooked it up all wrong and we use it the some wrong way or something. The structure varies slightly from your own. The Ron interrupted. The second brain appeared beside the first and rotated to take up an identical pose as the first one. This is your brain, human Lee, the Ron added. There are minute differences between the structures of your brains versus the one of the human Heather. There are minute anatomical differences in all your brains from one another, so we thought this was a normal structural variation. However, in our sampling of over 60,000 human brain scans of the Dawn Vengeance's records, we find no other samples that match this particular variation. Honestly, I really didn't see a difference between the two highlighted areas, but it was obvious that Ron noted something. That was good enough for me. So she has some sort of birth defect, I asked. We do not believe so, the Ron answered her. Akhlerakta, Jack suggested. He was somehow able to alter her brain. We believe so, the Ron agreed. We believe he influenced growth of the new neural pathways over time. We were not entirely certain how he accomplished this, but uh, we believe that we know what his ultimate goal was. A third brain appeared and popped up on the other side of Heather's hologramic brain. This one rotated to show the same side of the telepathic lobe was once more highlighted. This one did look a different from Heather and Lee slightly. This is the brain of one of the prototype telepathic species humans engineered by the Chimera. The Ron explained, we believe he was attempting to replicate the connection and create a telepathic link from the human Heather. Why? I stammered. Humans are immune to telepathy. We believe the goal was to use the telepathic link while in overseer, the Ron said, perhaps to sound a warning, perhaps just to influence assassins to remove his previous killers. We are not certain as to the process is not yet complete. The alterations have not allowed him to use telepathic communications as of yet. They have, however, weakened the human Heather's defenses against telepathy, as the presence is essentially a telepathic imprint. We believe that is why he has been able to gain greater influence over her. Unfortunately, this has resulted in further entangling of their minds. What if he put those lobes back the way it was? I asked. 
That would hinder the progress, the rod agreed, but the damage is already done. The imprint presence has influenced her. Cutting off the access to the lobe would delay it, but we believe the presence will likely try to repair the neural pathways. To isolate the phenomenon, we would have to roll back the human heather to her earliest recorded mindset, repair the lobe to human normal, and then repeat the process in a short period of time once the imprint of mind starts influencing her once more. The human heather would be forced to repeat the same time period over and over again. She would recall nothing that transpired after her first awakening on the ship, and would only be allowed to build new memories for a short while before forgetting once more. That sounded horrible, but I wasn't ready to give up yet. There has to be a way, I insisted. She's been in her head a lot longer than at that thing. Why can't we just figure out which parts of don't belong? Again, the old anatomy is her own, the Ron said. It's in mind state that has been compromised. Then just kavodging fix it, Chide spoke. We do not have the skill to selectively target parts with mindset, the Ron explained. We are not familiar enough with your mind and functions to accomplish this. Not you, Shide said with then. To my shock, he pointed at me. Him! Me? I squeaked. You think I can slice and dice a brain better than they can? No, you stupid Kavodja, he said. When we were back on that airship, you got yourself good Kavodged and this Aklavakter tried to crowbar your brain, right? Yes, I agreed, drawing out the sound. My symbiote temporarily screwed up my psychic defenses. Fine, he said. So have the Ron Beasties finish with the Kavaj phase started. Get you drunk and whatever attacks you will kill. Easy. I glared at him. That's probably the most asinine, I said. We believe the plan has merit, the Ron interrupted. And by asinine, I mean brilliant, I went on. Asininely brilliant plan ever. I turned to look back at the Ron and grinned. Please tell me more of how this would work, I begged. It may not, the Ron admitted. However, if it is possible for you to establish a telepathic link to the human, you may be able to help guide us with a good deal more precision than we normally would be able to employ. So I just get buzzed and you do the heavy lifting, I asked. Unfortunately, the Ron was silent again. Jason, the professor said softly, it doesn't work that way. What? I asked as I turned to face her. How would you know anything about this? I don't, she said. But I do know that if we were trying to extract what is Heather out of the mass that the Ron are going to need more than you just sitting there drinking daiquiris. But, I said, I don't know anything about telepathic extractions. None of us do, she said. Not even the Ron. This is new territory for us all. But you know Heather the best. You would be the best judge of what is and what isn't her. We need your expertise, because if just a little bit of him remains... Her voice trailed off. I really hate it when she's right. You know that. I mean, re really hate it. We believe this is the best course of action. The one said, at last, is to draw the imprinted mind out, force it to expose itself, and to attack. Your mind is normally shielded, and we believe that your defenses should be adequate to defend yourself from the imprint. Still, you must draw him out as much as possible. Once he has distinguished himself from the native mind, we can attempt to remove him. So you need me to be drunk, belligerent, and defenseless for this to work? I asked. Shine clapped me on the shoulder. Wouldn't you know it, he said. First cavaging job that is right up my alley, and I got passed over for it. Typical, huh? Half an hour later, I found myself strapped to a table almost identical to the one Heather was bound to. I was facing her so I could see that she was still out cold. I squirmed against my straps. They didn't hurt, but they did bring into mind bad memories about my original alien abduction. Guess I owe an apology to the guys in the tinfoil hats. I swear, if I make it back to Earth, I'm going to send the whole lot of them hemorrhoid pillows. Is it really necessary for me to be strapped down? I asked. Our information on Fay is limited, the run answered as it strode into view. But extrapolating data on the chimera brain we have harvested, we believe that you may be up against a formidable adversary. But this isn't a chimera or a fray brain, I pointed out. This is a heather brain. The goal is to make the fey behave more like a fey and differentiate himself, the Ron replied. To use the human heather's brain like his own. If our analysis is true once your defenses are lowered, he may attempt to seize control of your body as well. We feel it is prudent to negate this possibility. Good idea, Lee said on my behalf and stepped into view. Are you sure you want to do this? 
I wasn't sure I was asking me or the run. I decided it was intended for me, though, and answered. No, I said, but we have to do something to help Heather. She's one of us. Okay, Lee advised. Nice statement, but try saying it so it sounds a bit less like a cult. You must drink the Kool-Aid. He raised an eyebrow. Her survival depends on me being obnoxious, I reminded him. I'm sure that I'm, I'm supposed to find it encouraging or frightening. He said as he looked at the Ron. What do we have to get him good and intoxicated? We have developed a serum that should act as both a narcotic and as a mild hallucinogenic. The Ron explained. We believe that this should provide an enticing target. Great, Lee said. Load him up. Then felt something lowered into my head. I rolled my eyes upwards and saw it was some sort of helmet. I was worried sick about Heather, so hopefully it wasn't the thrill kill rampage type helmet. Um, I asked. We need to perform a deep scan of your brain as well as the human heathers to determine what is happening. The run explained. Remove scanners will not provide a high enough degree of accuracy. Right, I said. I knew that. I was just testing you, so um, get the happy juice ready. There is one last thing we must discuss before continuing, the Ron said. As you draw out the face, some reshaping of the mind state of the human is inevitable. So, what are you saying? I asked, feeling swell of panic. Even if we succeed, she'll never be the same. Yes, the Ron said. There will be some permanent changes. What are you talking about here? I asked. On a scale of from Heather to Hannibal Lecter, where are we going to wind up? The results cannot be predicted, the Ron admitted. It depends on how long the Fae has been influencing her and what occurs as it is being extracted. We believe she will, at her core, be much as you know her, but her mind may not fit back to her original anatomy when this is over. What are you saying? I asked. They mean, the professor said as she stepped forward and took my hand, they may not be able to reverse the procedure when this is over. Reverse the, I asked. Heather may still be telepathic, Jack said as she walked up on the other side. Fledgling telepathic, the Ron corrected. She will still be unskilled and untutored in her own new anatomy. However, her mind may still be dependent upon it as all the same. I closed my eyes and sighed. That's still better off than where we are, I said with my eyes still closed. Juice me up before I change my mind. Don't you freaking get it, a familiar voice said from my left ear. They've already doped you up. I opened my eyes. I was no longer in the caverns of the ice world, but I recognized the place all the same. The movie had scared the crap out of me when I was eight. I was lying on a table, unrestrained, but I now saw the lobby of the Overlook Hotel. Jack Nicholson was pacing on the floor in front of me. His hair was wild and his eyes wilder still. He spun around to face me and tapped on his own forehead violently. It breaks your concentration, he advised. Right, I said as I slipped off the table. Jack, I'm going to leave you here. Looks like you've got your own axe to grind. As for me... I've got something important to do. Well, John Wayne said with a drawl and stomped round the stairs in his trademark swagger. Sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And sometimes he's got to do what a woman's got to do. That one compliments RuPaul, who strode in wearing a long evening gown and a long red hooded cloak. She was carrying a basket covered with checkered handkerchief. I'm off to see Grandmother, she said as she waved her fingers at me. Toodles! I watched entirely too much TV, I concluded. Okay, time to get to business. I bent over and slapped my ass. Come on, Aki boy, I shouted. Come on, get it. Get some USDA choice rump roast for you. Come on, come on. Nothing. I stood up and frowned. Crap, I mumbled. I thought for sure that would work. I guess sucking down too many semen milkshakes turns you into a giant wussy after all. That's about the time the windows exploded. The lobby was showered in a torrent of broken glass. Gale force winds howled from the outside. The air was burning hot and freezing cold at the same time. Dark clouds rushed in through the ruined windows and flowed into the middle of the room. There the oncoming winds collided. The clouds coalesced and a raging storm and forming right in front of the lobby. The storm tilted to its side, a frothing cloud that was vaguely man-shaped in form. Lightning danced from its fingertips and it set the floorboards afire. It turned its head towards me and I saw a parody of a human face taking in the shape of the clouds. The hair was wispy streamers and the eyes glowed with electrical light. It opened its mouth too wide and snarled at me. Here's Johnny, I said with a smile. That's my line. 
Shut up, Jack. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 100, written by Simi Loki. I'm not sure when the hotel lobby disappeared. The wind was ripping and tearing at me, and somewhere along the line I realized my toes were digging into the sand. I spared a quick glance away from the developing storm and found that I was standing on a beach. Okay, makes sense. A hallucination is sort of like a dream, so uh, naturally they probably follow dream logic. As soon as I became aware that I was now on a beach, all of my other senses shifted to confirm it. The air now felt hot. Almost stifling, but the breeze was blowing from the storm in front of me. The light was much brighter. I could smell the semi-rotted scent of the ocean. I could even taste the salt spray in my mouth. That's not water. Some part of my mind warned me. That's blood. You've bitten your tongue. I ignored it. I was too busy focusing on the storm that was slowly building in strength before me. Part tornado, part fey, and all terrifying, it continued to grow darker and more violent with each passing second. The clouds frothed more, but, paradoxically perhaps, the humanoid shape within the mass seemed to grow more defined, almost like a shadow emerging from the storm cloud, except this shadow was also part of the storm. I shifted my weight and raised my fists. I'm not sure how I expected to punch a cloud, but I was preparing myself all the same. Blue jeans and a red t-shirt. My clothing caught me so much by surprise that I nearly forgot about the storm. It seemed so normal in comparison to the absurdity that a situation I now faced. I'd worn an outfit such as this a hundred times before and never spared it a second thought. Why would I? But now the familiar sensation of the cotton clinging to my body seemed both alien and, uh, at the same time, caused such stirrings of my homesickness that I practically wept. How long had it been since I wore Earth normal clothing? A year? Two? More? There was no way of knowing. It was impossible to keep track of time out here. I knew I'd been gone for a long time, though, but sometimes it still felt as if it was only yesterday I awoke strapped to a table on an alien ship. You are strapped on a table on an alien ship, a voice said in my mind. Now focus, or you're dead. A warning came just in time. The storm had finally gathered itself as much as it planned to and was now rushing towards me with a howl. When we collided, something unexpected happened. We fought, yes, but not in the manner that I'd braced myself for. The storm hit me like a swarm of enraged gnats. I felt millions of tiny bites across my body, but I suffered no great damage. At the same time, I did not seem that I inflicted much damage either. I felt like a depleted uranium shell passing through a fog. I was too dense and the fate was too diffuse for either of us to do much to one another. We passed through each other and doing very little except curse each other. Except it wasn't just cursing. It was like millions of voices whispering and shouting at the same time. I couldn't quite make out the words just yet, but that brief exposure was maddening. This is a telepathic battle. The voice in my head warned me. Those voices are him trying to latch on. I didn't bother acknowledging the voice. I spun and faced the next attack. The cloud rushed at me again. Again, millions of gnats bit me. I swung my fist brightly and the voices screamed. We passed through and once more, with the clarity that comes with dreaming, I suddenly realized I wouldn't have to put up with this. I could just shove the storm away. All I had to do was tell it to go and push. You can't, the voice warned me. If you kick him out now, you'll never be able to remove him from Heather's mind. Heather. I was here for Heather. Something clicked in place in my head. Well, not really clicked. More like oozed into place. Except that in of itself, there was a triggered realization. I realized that I wasn't thinking clearly. Everything felt hazy, but uh, when everything is hazy, nothing is hazy. I mean, I believed I was thinking normally, but uh, now that I was aware of it, I realized how sluggish it really was. I was stoned, I recalled. This run had drugged me, so what was the voice I was hearing? One of my friends shouting advice. Unlikely. It seemed too aware of what I was seeing and experiencing. In fact, it seemed to be a few steps ahead of me before it registered with me. So what? A part of my mind that was still sober... Was I now free-floating with my subconscious hearing whispers from my conscious mind? Did that even make sense? 
I didn't get much of a chance to reflect upon it as the storm was upon me once more and I was back to flailing against the striking nothing. The boy screamed to me again, a symphony of anger and greed. It hurt me, it terrified me, but I wanted to hear more of the music. I'm losing, I thought, but I need to hold on a little longer so the run can cut the jerk out. The storm rolled further down the beach, turned around in a wide arc, and rushed back at me once more. This isn't how you fight a telepath, my sober mind muse. You have to hit it where it thinks. This time, when we collided, I hit it with my mind. I don't mean I thought about punching it. It was probably what I had been doing before, if I want to be technical. I was strapped to an exam table and a freewheeling fantasy passed over me. I wasn't moving my arms or legs, just imaginary ones. I just loaded more into those imaginary fists. I pushed myself into those fists. My anger, all my hate, my love for Heather, my fear that I might lose her, all of it I pushed into my fists, and I was no longer a creature that lived in my head with my body dangling below. I was a fist that was a body exploding off the back of it. I could practically see out my fist. I know that makes no sense, but that is how it felt. I was the fist, not just emotions either. I shoved my sorry persistent self into there as well. By that, I mean a little part of the being that never quite gets past the idea that it's at the center of the universe. That it is the only part of you that is real and everyone else are just actors in your dream. Everyone feels that way privately and everyone denies it publicly. We try to hide it. We may spend a lifetime doing good deeds to hide from it. But that part is always there, whispering to us. Every time we feel an urge to be selfish, greedy, or narcissistic, that part of our mind is singing its siren song to us. How can there be pain if I do not feel it? I pushed that into my fist, that angry little voice screaming that the storm was not real. I... Only it was real, that only it is important. I put it all into my fist, focusing, and made it the most real thing in the dream. That is what I struck the storm with, and the impact was most definitely felt. The storm bounced off my fist and was sent staggering out to the ocean, the water churning beneath it and the fog-like feet steaming up a solid footing. It came to a stop a good thirty feet away from me. This was my head. I don't have to play by these rules. I hit it again. My arm stretched out over the waters and collided with its jaw. I felt only the faintest of stings. The storm fell over backwards and splashed into the water. It struggled to its feet, so I punched it again. And again. And again. The storm was knocked backwards each time. As it felt the cloud burst apart and collect itself again, I took a step closer to the shoreline and began pummeling it. My fists blew faster than the eye could see. They were just a blur of movement across the sky each strike causing little bits of the cloud to break off and float away. The storm grew smaller and smaller with each punch. I was gonna kill the bastard. Die, bastard, die! I pushed my anger into my foot. I grabbed the storm by its nebulous head and yanked it downwards as I kicked upwards. It struck my toe in a satisfying explosion of vapored mist. I grabbed the fallen storm and tossed it back upon the beach. The sand exploded where it struck. I didn't give it time to stand up. I leapt upon its chest. I felt the winds howling below me as I reached down and grasped its throat. I squeezed harder and harder. The winds tried to press my hands apart, but I threw much more into them. The sins now die, die, die. Stop it now. That's when I realized the tiny voice, as it was a little sober, insane part of my mind, had been whispering so much good advice was shouting at me. He'd been shouting for some time, in fact. I froze in place, my fingers stacked slightly as I shifted my hand back into my head, where it was supposed to be. The storm thing underneath me grinned savagely. Its cloudy features were no longer contorted with pain. Its own fist shot up and struck me in the jaw. Lightning flashed as it connected, and I was thrown off the creature. In my head, the shadowy voices were now clearer. They were shouting at me. Fool, give in. You won't win. You'll never win. You will lose. Surrender. You will be a strong once more. Hundreds of voices all shouting variations of the same idea. I was defeated. I needed to give up, and my only choice was to give in. Stupid. I had been so stupid. 
I was fighting a telepath. I was fighting him with metaphors. I had been literally battering him with my own mind. Yes, it hurt him, but he had centuries of defending himself against being exposed to the naked ego. He'd taken his licking and did what he could to weather the attacks, knowing that each blow I drew was weakening me faster than it was weakening him. I was trying to lure him out past his defenses. He lured me out instead. Stupid. I forced my own defenses back up. Don't ask me how I did this. It's something instinctive as breathing. I just knew the interior of my own skull. I knew how to close the bar all the windows and doors. But those same windows and doors were much weaker. Some were a little more than tissue paper painted to look like wood. The walls weren't in much better shape. I squandered much of my mental reserves in that foolish attack. Now he had his foot in the door to my mind and was trying to force his way in. Even though I knew I wasn't supposed to, I shoved. I told him to leave with that power that I denied myself earlier. Nothing happened. I was too weak and had spent too much energy. Stupid, stupid, stupid. The storm came at me, and I knelt into the sand and covered my face. This time, I was not attacked by gnats. This time, the storm felt like billions of shards of broken glass raking against my skin. The voices were still shouting, but this time, they were almost as seductive in tone. You can have it all. Join. No more loneliness. Heather will always be with you. Surrender. No more fighting. Just give in. You are tired. You are weak. This is the only way. I survived the attack. Barely. The storm passed over me and was further down the beach. I'd been so close to giving up that it frightened me. I knew that the storm thing was behind me now and readying itself for another attack. I was certain I wouldn't survive that one. So, I didn't even try. I ran instead. I launched myself to my feet and darted off along the shoreline beach. The sand was still wet here. It was packed up tightly with loose sand further up the beach. My feet would sink in this and I could move more swiftly. I heard a howl of rage behind me and the wind shifted direction. I could feel the winds blowing from behind me and tearing at my clothes. The storm thing was gaining on me. Fast. Too fast. It would catch me before I could clear another hundred feet of the beach. I knew it. I had to risk crossing the open beach and run into the forest beyond. The forest should offer some protection. Or provide more shrapnel to fling at you, the voice warned. No time to worry about that now. I leapt off the densely packed wet sand and into the loose sand of the beach. My feet sunk in and I knew I was doomed. I was running slower now, half the speed before. Yes, I didn't know. I just knew that the line of trees that seemed so near a moment before now may as well have been on the far side of the moon. For all the good that would do me, the storm would be upon me before I reached it. I was done for. I should give up. I ran anyway. The sand slipped beneath my feet. I was moments away from falling flat on my face. My legs ached from the unfamiliar stride I was employing. Or maybe because you're putting against the straps of the table. The loose sand shifted under me, shifted and shifted away. It came over my feet, up to my ankles. Further, I was sinking into it. Was this beach or was it a quicksand? I was now climbing upwards with much as I was running. Each time my foot found a new perch as I began to sink into a mountain of sand. The winds were right behind me. I felt the icy blades brushing my spine, the whispers of those voices reaching my ears. I could stop here and listen. I should stop here and listen. Just stop. Stop. My foot struck something solid and I accelerated once more. I had reached the tree line after all. I darted behind a palm tree and ran deeper into the interior. There was a roar behind me and I heard limbs snapping and a storm thing met the trees. I continued to run between them. The sand beneath me began to give away to densely packed earth. I was starting to pull ahead of the storm once more. I was running through the trees, exposed roots trying to snag me. I jumped them. Sharp stones trying to cut my feet. I sidestepped them. All the while behind me, I heard the thunder of the storm, the groan of tortured wood splintering, the cold wind still tugged at me. So I ran, I ran, and I ran until my feet struck sand once more. Frick, that wasn't a beach, it was an island. I had run fully across the interior of the island and come out back at the beach on the opposite side. 
I looked behind me in the forest and had offered the scant shelter just moments before, a pillar of dark clouds swirling above me in the tree lines as I started to hear the crashing sound of palm trees was yanked out by the roots and flung high into the air. The forest was being destroyed. I was too exposed out here on the beach and the forest would not offer me protection a second time. Armor up! The voice in my head fairly screamed at me. You've had a bit of time to recover. Your defenses should be stronger now. I pushed my defenses once more. They were thicker. Plywood instead of tissue paper, but I could tell that it wasn't enough. Too many gaps were still left open. Too many places to storm to get in. Worse, the voices just seemed to be getting louder. This is all in my head, I reminded myself. I retreated further into my head. The forest was just part of my mental defenses. He followed me further inside. The good news was that it meant that he exposed himself more. The bad news was that I wasn't sure I'd live long enough for them to exercise him. The storm thing emerged from the tree line. I took a step back, another, and then another. My foot struck water. I was trapped between it and the sea, and I had no idea how drowning worked in here. But I figured it didn't matter. The storm would catch me if I tried to run again. Damned if I would go down without a fight, though. I focused myself back into my fists. I didn't know how long I could last. A bunch? Two? A dozen? It didn't matter. In the end, I was too weak to defend myself, no matter what. I'm sorry, Heather, I whispered as I readied myself. The storm-looking thing took one step to the beach and then seemed to be brought up short. I suddenly realized why. The wind had shifted. The breeze was now coming in from the ocean. This was a warmer and gentler. Where it struck the storm thing, the clouds fluttered and dissipated. The evil face of the clouds grimaced and forced another step. The winds picked up now, and I realized that they had a voice as well. Not millions of voices, just a single one, and it was whispering a single word over and over. No, the voice cried. No, no, no. I didn't recognize that voice. From the shattered remnants of the forest, I saw dozens of golden birds take flight. They flew up into the sky and circled around. Suddenly, they were all aiming themselves in my direction. The storm thing howled and raged and charged. I forgot all about the birds then. The storm thing flung itself at me and I readied my fists once more. I lashed out with a wicked right hook aimed at my right jaw. I didn't know if blocking it would work, so I tried dodging. My movements felt glacially slow. I wouldn't be able to get out of this way in time. The storm thing's thrust struck a bird instead of me. The fist froze in midair where it struck the bird and then withdrew. For that brief moment, I had contact with the golden bird clearly. It wasn't a normal bird after all. I now saw... It looked like an origami bird made from a sheet of gold foil folded over and over. The bird never made a noise, but it did fall away as if it had been injured. Just before it struck the sand below, it seemed to recover and fluttered back upwards towards the sky. All of this I saw from the corner of my eye, as the phase storm thing was already throwing another punch in my direction. This one, too, was intercepted by an origami bird. No! The voice in the warm wind repeated, No. The voice was louder now, more distinct, more feminine. Storm Aclaracter surged towards me once more. I lowered my fists and withdrew my mind. I knew what was expected this time, and sure enough, two birds swooped in and struck him in the chest, pushing him back towards the tree line. Not sure where these birds were coming from, I used the break and the stalk shoring up my defenses. Inside my head, I put up a new layer of plywood. I poured it over the scrap lumber held in place by thumbtacks and chewing gum. In all the gaps, in all the walls, I shoved odd bits of cloth and loose paper, anything that I could find. The wind inside died down, and without eroding me constantly, I found myself gaining strength faster. I tore down the scrap wood and nailed up two by fours and mortared over them and nailed the shutters closed over my windows and dropped heavy iron bars into the latch. I bolted a steel security door behind the cheap hollow interior door that had been there before. I was gathering myself and getting stronger. All the while the birds kept swooping in. The face storm tried to move towards me, the three birds swooping in front of him. It tried to move back into the forest. Four birds appeared behind it. I tried to strike me. The bird intercepted. It tried to hit the bird directly. Two birds flew into its eyes and forcing it to duck. 
My private little room inside my head was secure once more, not quite strong as it had been, but I thought that it could take a little battering from the storm outside now. On some hunch I didn't understand, I decided to try and fix the forest. I pushed upwards from the ground. Again, I don't understand how. Half of this was my head and the other half was pure fantasy. Regardless, three new skinny palm trees sprouted from the ground to replace a dozen fat mature ones that had been mowed down. Not a huge one, but from these trees more origami birds flew. They swooped directly towards the face storm. They were now two dozen birds. I stepped closer to the storm. It lashed out at me. Bee stings instead of gnats brushing out stretch for arm. A storm was rewarded for its efforts by even more birds flying in from the forest. The storm snapped the origami birds. They dodged its blows when they could. They fell half stunned towards the sand when they couldn't. Each time they recovered from the blows slightly faster. Were the birds getting stronger or was the storm getting weaker? No! The woman's voice was shouting now. It filled the air around me and slammed into the storm. The storm recoiled from the blow and staggered back into the tree line. Tiny bits of green appeared before it as it retreated. Saplings, I realized. The forest was regenerating without help now. I followed the storm into the forest. More birds appeared. Ten. Then twenty. Then more. A flock of them swooped in from the sea behind me and circled the storm. The storm tried to push through them, but the birds circled tighter and tighter. Golden paper wingtips touched one another, the paper breaking touching paper trails. Where the birds touched the steam to fuse together, the fused birds would then grow stiff and continue to fly around the storm. The more and more birds joined this assemblage. Every place that there was a gap was filled with another bird. Each bird was like a golden irregular brick in a wall. No... Not a wall, a rectangular block. A golden sarcophagus was building itself around the storm, and still the storm retreated. We were back in the first beach again, and the storm was staggering under the weight of its golden cage, our birds surrounding it. There was only a few gaps now where I could still see the face. Its features were twisted still. No joy or anger. Fear. It was terrified of the golden box encircling it. No! A woman's voice shouted. I now recognized the voice. It was Heather. No! The voice was stronger now, and no longer seemed to be cast upon the wind itself. It was as if someone was in the room with me shouting. Room? I blinked. The beach scene faded away, and I found myself back in the underground room on the icy wall strapped to a table, my tongue throbbing as coppery taste of blood filled my mouth. Yes, I really had bitten my tongue. My wrists and ankles ached from what they had been tugging at the straps as well, but I was alive and waking up. Two things a few seconds ago I wouldn't have believed possible. No! Heather shouted again. A pressure in my head that I was only faintly aware of began to ease up. It felt like something was being pulled out of my head, something that was desperately clinging to dear life. No! Heather shouted once more. You can't take him from me! The world snapped into sharp focus as the pressure eased up entirely. I could now see Heather clearly again. She was strapped down on her own table, strapped down and thrashing as if she were in the midst of a seizure. I panicked when I saw her and spat blood off the side. Help her, I croaked. Whatever you do isn't working. We have not done anything, Veron protested. We were never able to isolate the fey mental signature. This is not our doing. Then what? I stammered. Heather's eyes snapped open. They blazed with a fire I'd never seen before. No, she snarled. Her face twisted and became more angular. You cannot. Aquilaractor's harsh voice hissed. You cannot do this. The face twisted again, back to Heather's normal face, with a strangely determined look I'd seldom seen in anyone. I said no. She said, I don't know if you try to take me, but you are not taking him. Her body lurched again against the straps. Her face spasmed. Aclaractors. Heathers. Back to Hefe. Back to her. She shook her head and closed her eyes, grunting as if she was lifting some immense weight. Her features shifted back to her normal ones and stayed there. Sweat beating her forehead, she continued to strain, her voice shifting back to Aclaractors, but he did not speak. Not in her words, he screamed in a mixture of agony and terror. 
I was now standing beside Heather, clenching her hand in my own. Wait, did someone unstrap me first? I looked down at my wrist, the loose strap dangling from it, from the free end swinging of the chunk of the table. Meh, I guess not. Going to pay for that loan later. Heather spasmed and then, just as quickly relaxed, she took a deep breath and her eyes fluttered open for just a moment. Her pupils were dilated. Her eyes rolled in my direction. Slowly, like the first rays of morning, a smile spread across her face. Heather's smile. There was no faking that. Her mind state is more comparable to the other humans, I heard the Ron say from somewhere behind me. It appears she managed to contain the imprint. Not contained, Heather said. Eaten. I couldn't let him. Her eyes glistened as wet drops appeared in the corner. I couldn't let him do that, she repeated. Not to you. Then her eyes slid shut. Heather's breathing slowed and her body relaxed. There and gone again. I suddenly found I no longer could control my knees. The ground came rushing up towards me. I barely had time to nod my head and deploy my helmet. Hopefully, it would protect my skull from the impact because there was no bracing for it. Everything went blank before I could hit the ground. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.